This is the start of media labeled number one of the video recorded deposition of Dr. Stanley Plotkin in the matter of Lori Matheson, formerly known as Lori Ann Schmidt, versus Michael Schmidt, filed in the state of Michigan, the Circuit Court for the County of Oakland Family Division. This deposition is being held at 5833 Lower York Road in New Hope, Pennsylvania on January 11th, 2018. My name is Tom Liebman and I'm the legal video specialist for TSG Reporting Incorporated, headquartered at 747 Third Avenue in New York City. The court reporter is Maureen Broderick in association with TSG Reporting. Counsel, please introduce yourselves for the record. Aaron Siri, co-counsel on behalf of plaintiff. Amy Ruby, on behalf of co-counsel on behalf of plaintiff. Laura Nusma, counsel for defendant Michael Schmidt. The court reporter would ask swear in the witness. Raise your right hand, please, sir. You swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Yes. Good morning, Dr. Plotkin. Can we just make a record that it's under this court? I would just like to clarify that this is being recorded by a video deposition on pursuant to MCR 2.315. Good morning. Can you please state your full name for the record? Stanley A. Plotkin. Okay. Dr. Plotkin, have you been deposed before? Oh, uh, a long time ago, many years ago. Okay, and what matter was that? Oh, that, that had to do with um, uh, an abortion done because of congenital rubella. What year approximately? In the 1960s. And what was your testimony about? My testimony was about the uh, abnormalities that occur in uh, infants of women born, uh, that, that is in infants of uh, women who have congenital, who have rubella during pregnancy and uh, whose uh, fetuses are frequently uh, affected with considerable congenital abnormalities. From rubella. From rubella. Did that involve a vaccine? I, at the time, I was uh, developing a vaccine against rubella, yes. Okay. Have you been deposed in any other case? Not that I can recall, no. Okay. Have you ever been an expert witness in any lawsuit other than this one? Uh, again, not for many years. Um, I believe I did a couple of those cases in the 60s, but I have avoided depositions since then. Okay. Why is that? Uh, because I consider that they uh, seldom bring out all the facts, but I'm willing to uh, help in this case. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go over a few rules with you for this deposition. Mm -hmm. um, the court reporter has placed you under oath. Same as a court of law, you're testifying under penalty of perjury. Mm -hmm. uh, the court reporter is making a record and will take down the questions that I ask and the answers that you provide. Mm -hmm. If you don't understand a question, let me know before answering. Okay. Um, uh, it, the court reporter can't take down nods. Uh, that's another rule. So if you, anytime yes. you want mm. vocalize, yeah. Um, please wait till I complete asking a given question, even if you think mm. you know the answer, so that we have a complete record, please. Um, as I, uh, don't speculate. Uh, if you don't know the answer, uh, then so state. But you, know, you should provide your best recollection, even if it's vague or partial, okay? Yes. Are you taking any, <clears throat> any medications or are under the influence of any substance that might affect your ability to testify today? I don't think so, no. Is that no? No. Okay. Um, did you discuss this deposition with anyone? Actually, no. I've had some conversations with uh, Laura and Niesma, but not about the substance of my testimony. Before today, did you have any discussions um, with anyone related to this deposition? 
No, actually, I know very little about the the, um, um, the issue here. Uh, I understand that that there's a disagreement between parents, uh, but that's all I really know. And you haven't discussed this lawsuit with anyone apart from opposing counsel? No. How did you first learn about this lawsuit? Um, it was from um, a, a, a lady by the name of Karen Ernst, who was the head of an organization called Voices for Vaccines, uh, which is a, a, a group of lay people uh, who are uh, uh, favorable to vaccination. And uh, she had heard from the father, I believe, who was looking for um, experts to testify on his behalf. Mm. So you discussed this lawsuit with her? Not really discuss the lawsuit. I would, she referred me to the father, um, and I sent an email saying that I would be willing to testify. Said, I have not talked to the father. I've never met the father. Mm -hmm. um, so I, um, everything is, has happened secondhand, so to speak. And it was Karen Ernst who, who asked you to be an expert in this case? She asked me if I would be willing, yes. And how many discussions have you had with her? No discussions. About uh, this case? About this case. I've uh, simply had an email exchange uh, asking me to, uh, to do it. Okay. Okay. I'm going to request a copy of that email chain. Okay, Dr. Falcon. Um, if I can find it, I'll be glad to send it to you. Thank you. Um, right. So before today, other than speaking with opposing counsel and an email communication with Karen Ernst, you have not um, discussed this lawsuit, this deposition, or the role that you'd be playing here today with anybody else. Is that right? Uh, I've had uh, a um, email exchange with um, uh, Paul Offit, uh, Dr. Paul Offit, uh, who is uh, actually a former student of mine. Mm -hmm. And who's Dr. Offit? Dr. Offit is um, a pediatrician at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Okay. And what did you discuss with Dr. Offit? I discussed with him the uh, issues uh, or the possible issues uh, about uh, refusal to vaccinate. Okay, and what was the substance of those discussions? The substance ba basically concerned what arguments are often used uh, to oppose vaccination. And what are those arguments? Um, the arguments generally are that um, uh, vaccines uh, can cause reactions uh, and uh, that the reactions are worse than the, the disease. And what did Dr. Offit have to say about that? Well, he pointed out, of course, and uh, he's the author of a chapter in my vaccines book, uh, that uh, the opposite is true, that the disease is worse than the reactions to the vaccines. Do you have peer-reviewed science to support that statement? Do I have what? Peer-reviewed science to support that yes, statement? Yes, of course. And would you be willing to provide that science? Well, the science is in the chapter in my textbook, um, but there are uh, innumerable references, uh, some of which I have, but um, uh, I can certainly provide you with a list of references in, in the chapter. Great. Um, have you reviewed any documents to prepare for this deposition? Uh, you know, I've looked at the, um, the web. Um, I don't usually do that, but um, I've looked at the web, some of the 
uh, anti-vaccination websites. And which, which of those sites did you look at? Oh, gosh. I, I can't give you the names. I've just sort of sc scanned through a number of them. Do you remember the names of any of them? Um, let's see. Plotkin, just to be clear, if you don't remember something, just say you don't remember and you can move on from there. Yeah, well, here's one called Vax Truth. Everything you ever needed to know about medical exemptions to vaccination but didn't know to ask. Um, there were a, a couple of others that I looked at, um, many of which were appalling. And why do you believe they're appalling? Uh, because they're ignorant of the facts, exaggerations, half-truths, um, uh, or even um, misconceptions. Vac truth. Um, does that website, is that a website that catalogs personal stories of families uh, who believe their child was injured by vaccines? You know, uh, I did not, um, uh, what shall I say, um, read these uh, word for word. Um, uh, I imagine that that's the case. Uh, but I, I couldn't tell you specifically about which website says what. Mm -hmm. But you found Vac Truth appalling? Yes. Okay. Um, other than reviewing the what you refer to as anti-vaxxer websites, um, did you review any other documents to prepare for this deposition? Yes, I looked at a, a number of um, vaccine safety studies, uh, which again, are referenced in the vaccine safety chapter. Mm -hmm. And apart from that, anything else? No. Okay. Have you been provided any documents related to this lawsuit? To whom? H have you, uh, Dr. Plotkin, been provided any documents relating to this lawsuit no, specifically? No, I have not. Okay. <clears throat> Have you reviewed any me medical records related to this case? Medical records? No. Okay. Have you done anything um, other than what we've already discussed to prepare for this deposition today? Um, no, basically no. Have you discussed the child at issue in this case? No. Okay. So you don't know anything specific about the child at issue in this case, correct? I do not. Okay. And you don't know anything about her medical history, correct? Correct. And you don't know anything about her family's medical history, correct? Correct. Have you been any, on any trips in the last year? Oh, many. Where to? Oh, gosh. Uh, um, several trips to Europe, to, to France, to Germany. Uh, um, um, let's see. Um, I've been to Asia in the last year. Uh, yes, I've been to Japan. Um, um, basically, I mean, of course, many trips in the United States. 
um, England. How many times? At least you, a dozen trips. At least a dozen. How many times were you in France in the last year? Oh gosh, twice I think. Okay. Germany. Once. England. Once. Okay. These were all separate trips. Yes. In which you got on a plane from the United yes. States, flew there, flew back. Okay. Um, Japan, how many times? Once. Okay. Uh, how many times to other countries outside of the oh, U.S.? Gosh. I probably had about a dozen trips dozen altogether. Trips. Okay. If I had known <clears throat> you, you were interested, I would have brought my calendar. Uh, how about trips in the United States that required you to get on a plane? How many of those would you say in the last year? Oh. Um, mainly to California, a lot of trips to Washington, Boston. California, Washington, same city in California each time or different? No, San Francisco, San Diego. Okay. What were the purpose of most of these trips? Attend meetings, scientific meetings. Were any of them related to companies developing vaccines? Oh, yes. Would you say most of them were? Um, most of them. Um, probably about half of them. Do you, have any, um, do you have any trips planned for 2018? Yes. Okay, where to? I'll be going to India next month. Uh, and, um, uh, however, I'm trying to cut down on foreign trips, so uh, at the moment, I'll be going to Germany in June, um, aside from that, I'll be going to France in May, um, I think that's all I can recall at the moment. Mm -hmm. What's your trip to France for? I'll be teaching in an advanced vaccinology course in Annecy. Where, I'm sorry? Annecy. What's that, I'm sorry? A-N-N-E-C-Y. -N -N it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a town in France. Okay. And, and who's sponsoring this course? Well, it's sponsored by the University of Geneva um, and the Gates Foundation. Anybody else? No, basically those are the uh, the funders. Okay. And your trip to Germany? What's that for, Doc? Um, I'll be going to visit a, a biotechnology company uh, that is trying to develop vaccines based on RNA. Okay. Do you have a in a position or affiliation with that company? I'm simply on their scientific board. Okay. And your trip to India, the purpose of that one? Uh, to discuss uh, vaccination against chikungunya um, uh, virus, which is uh, epidemic in India and in South America. And who are those discussions with? Well, uh, it's under the aegis of an organization called CEPI, which is a coalition to develop vaccines against epidemic diseases. Okay. So it's um, an organization that's received funding from um, various governments uh, uh, to, to meet the challenges of epidemic diseases like Ebola and chikungunya, mm -hmm. et cetera. This trip also include meeting with vaccine developers? Well, they will be present at the meeting. Uh, they will come and and, uh, and present the results of their efforts to develop a vaccine against chikungunya. Any trips planned in the United States for 2018? Oh, uh, I wish I had known to bring my calendar. Um, I have no trips 
uh, plan this month. Um, or actually uh, next month, but um, I w will be going to um, some NIH-sponsored meetings in March, as I recall, and there's a uh, vaccine conference in uh, Washington in April that I'll be going to. When you say Washington, do you mean Washington State or District of Columbia? Uh, District of Columbia. Um, in May, I'll be going back to France for the advanced vaccinology course. It's as much as I can remember at the moment. Okay. Uh, there might be others. You just don't have your calendar here today, right? Right. Okay. And the NIH meetings, where are those taking place? In Bethesda. Okay. How far is that from here? From from here? Yeah, do you drive there? Oh, no, no, I take the train to Washington and then the metro to Bethesda. Okay. How long does that trip take? The train is an hour and a half. The metro is maybe 20 minutes. <clears throat> What's the name of the plaintiff in this case? Well, from what was said before, the... Uh, plaintiff, I think, is not, someone named Schmidt. Uh, uh, I, 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 I've not followed, the, as I said before, I have not been involved in the legal details, so uh, I, I don't know the names except from what I've heard. What's the name of the defendant in this case? As I understand it, they're a married couple, but that's all I can tell you. So I presume that they're both named Schmidt. Okay. What's the name of their child? I do not know. Okay. How old is their child? I do not know. Okay. Do you know whether the child has received any vaccines? I do not know. Okay. Um, the, the name of the child is Faith, and I'll refer, I'll refer to the child as Faith during this deposition, okay? Mm -hmm. okay? Faith's father believes that Faith's mother was wrong to not have given Faith all CDC-recommended vaccines on time. Do you agree with the father? Yes. <clears throat> is it your understanding that the father wants Faith to receive all vaccines she has missed and continue to receive all CDC-recommended vaccines? That is my understanding, yes. Do you agree with the father that Faith should receive these vaccines? Uh, absent any contraindication, yes. Sitting here today, do you know whether Faith has any contraindications? I do not know. So sitting here today, you don't know whether Faith should or should not actually get these vaccines? In the absence of a contraindication, Faith should receive the vaccines. But you don't know whether she has a contraindication? I do not know the medical history of the child. What vaccines has Faith missed according to the CDC schedule that you believe she should get? <laughs> well, the CDC's schedule in includes diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, hepatitis B, haemophilus influenza, um, polio, uh, measles, mumps, rubella. Uh, I don't know how old she is, so I, I don't know, uh, you know where, where to stop but there are vaccines recommended um, in uh, pre-adolescence. Um, so she should receive those when she reaches the appropriate age. Okay. Uh, so um, just so I, I got, just so I make sure I understand, you believe she should get the hepatitis B vaccine? Yes. Rotavirus? Yes. DTaP? Yes. Hib? 
Yes. BC, PCV13? Yes. IPV? Yes. Um, the flu shot annually? Yes. IIV? We'll call it the flu shot. At the moment, yes. I'm sorry, at the moment? At the moment. What do you mean? Uh, I mean that there are two influenza vaccines, one of which uh, is recommended for this year. Uh, the other is uh, not recommended at the moment, but may be in the future. Okay. You think she should get the recommended one? Yes. And you think she should get the MMR, I believe you said? Yes, and varicella. And hepatitis A vaccine? I'm sorry? And the hep A vaccine? And the hep A vaccine, yes. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. How many doses of Hep B as a child rec do you recommend they receive? Three. How many doses of rotavirus do you recommend? Uh, two or three. And and you recommend Faith receive those, right? Yes. And you recommend that she receive the three sh doses of Hep B. Yes. And how many doses of DTaP do you recommend she receive? <clears throat> Uh, well, uh, currently at least three, uh, then a, a, a booster, and um, uh, eventually another booster. And how many doses of HIV do you recommend she receive? Uh, well, three are usually sufficient. Okay. And how many doses of PCV13? Uh, three. And how many doses of IPV or an act inactivated polio vaccine? Three. How many doses of the flu shot? Uh, well, one per year. And how many doses of MMR? Um, at least two, yes. How many doses of varicella? Uh, two. And hep A? Uh, two or three. Two is often sufficient. Okay, and those are the doses that you recommend the faith receive, correct? Yes. Okay. For each of those vaccines we just went through? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> And then there are the adolescent vaccines as well. And what are those? Um, well, meningococcus is often uh, recommended, uh, and also uh, human papillomavirus uh, vaccine, uh, to, uh, especially if she is a girl, uh, but it's also recommended for boys as well. And you recommend that Faith receive those as well, the meningococcus and HPV vaccine? Yes. Any others? Um, well, I could look up the vaccine schedule if you wish me to, but um, I am sure that I agree with all of the CDC recommendations. Okay. <clears throat> How about as uh, when she becomes an adult, would you recommend that she get all of the adult, the vaccines that are recommended by the CDC for adults? Well, certainly, yes. Um, what are the, um, can you please tell me the brand name and manufacturer for each of the Hep B vaccines? Well, I do not try to memorize brand names. Um, um, as I recall, uh, Engerix is the most commonly used hepatitis B vaccine. Uh, which is manufactured by GlaxoSmithKline. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a vaccine manufactured by Merck. I don't remember the trade name at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, I, I don't try to memorize trade names. Okay, so for the hepatitis B, there's a vaccine manufactured by GlaxoSmithKline. Can we refer to that either as Glaxo or GSK today? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Um, and there's one manufactured by Merck. Correct. Okay. Um, rotavirus, what are the brand names and companies that manufacture those? Well, actually, one of the rotavirus vaccines I developed, so I, I do know that the trade name is called Rotatech, and the other one is called Rotarix. Okay, and who manufactures those? I'm sorry? Who, who's, who sells those, manufactures uh, those? Merck manufactures Rotatech, and GSK manufactures Rotarix. Okay. How about DTaP? Who, what are the brand names and manufacturers for DTaP? Oh, boy. Um, uh, Sanofi Pasteur um, 
manufactures DTAP, and so does GSK. Um, I do not uh, remember the trade names. Mm -hmm. How about uh, the hepatitis B vaccine? Can you tell me who are what are the um, the brand names for those products and the manufacturer? For hepatitis B? For Hib. I'm sorry. I'm for Hib. I apologize. Did I say Hib? Uh, I meant Hib. Which stands for what, by the way, Dr. Plotkin? Haemophilus influenza type B. Thank you. Um, so, uh, uh, well, again, I, my recollection is that Sanofi and GSK, uh, yes, both um, manufacture HIB. Um, okay. Um, and what about uh, PCV13? What is the name of the product and the manufacturer of that vaccine? I don't remember the trade name, but Pfizer is the manufacturer. Okay. And what about the um, flu shot? Um, oh, well, there are multiple yes, manufacturers. there are multiple manufacturers of flu shot. Yeah. Let's, um, in terms of flu shots, um, um, Let's I strike that. We're going to come back to the flow shot and make it simpler. Um, well, let me ask you this, actually, about the flu shot. What uh, flu shots, are there any flu shots recommended for children under one year of age? Uh, no. Uh, six months usually is the okay. time, at, uh, the age at which influenza vaccines are recommended for children. Okay. And do you know who manufactures flu shots? Recommended for children for, under for one For children? Age. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember which of the manufacturers. Of, there are probably 10 different influenza vaccines, not all okay. of which have been tested in children. So um, there are relatively few f for children, all of them manufactured in uh, chick embryo. Um, but, but anyway, uh, I, I don't. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that the major manufacturers like uh, Sanofi and GSK um, um, certainly manufacture influenza vaccines. Uh, there's a an Australian manufacturer, CSL. But I mean, um, just for I'm sorry, Dr. Bob, just just for um, f by age group. Do you, let, let me make this simpler. Do you know? Do you have a recollection of which flu shots are recommended uh, for which age groups? You mean which manufacturers? Right. No, I don't, don't recollect. Okay. Um, in terms of the, um, in terms of the um, IPV, the um, inactivated polio vaccine, um, who manufacture, what is the uh, product name manufacturer for that? Uh, I don't remember the trade name, but Sanofi and GSK both uh, make um, yeah. IPV. Okay. And the uh, MMR vaccine, what is the product name and manufacturer for that one? Uh, Merck is the manufacturer. Um, GSK also makes one, but Merck is pretty much the American manufacturer for MMR. Okay. And um, for... <clears throat> And for varicella, the product name and the manufacturer? Uh, well, um, Merck again uh, manufactures varicella vaccine, and uh, GSK also does. And then for the hepatitis A vaccine, who's the, uh, what are the product names and manufacturers? Uh, hepatitis A, uh, GSK is the biggest manufacturer of hepatitis A. Okay. Is there any, got it? Okay. Um, and then,
How about the meningococcal vaccine? What's the product name and manufacturer for that one? Uh, meningococcal vaccines are manufactured um, the present time by Sanofi, by uh, GSK, by Pfizer. Um, those are the three. And how about the HPV vaccine manufacturer, the brand, uh, product name and manufacturer, please? Uh, Merck and uh, GSK uh, both manufacture uh, HPV vaccines. Um, <clears throat> so, every vaccine that you believe Faith should receive is produced by either Merck, Sanofi, GSK, or Pfizer, correct? Yeah, that's pretty much the case in, in this country at the present time. There are a limited number of vaccine manufacturers uh, because a vaccine manufacturer is difficult and costly. Would it be correct to call these four companies the big four vaccine manufacturers? Yes, that's correct. Um, uh, Johnson & Johnson is attempting to um, come into the uh, field, uh, but uh, they are not yet uh, one of the major manufacturers. Have you received any payments from Sanofi or any of its related or predecessor entities? Yes, certainly. Okay. In what years did you receive payments? Oh, jeez. Well, first of all, as you should know, uh, in the 1990s, I was um, medical and scientific director of Sanofi Pasteur. Uh, and um, so, obviously, I was paid by them. Um, and uh, since then, I've been uh, consulting for um, manufacturers, for biotechs, for governments, uh, for nonprofits, uh, and uh, essentially for anyone interested in vaccine development. And so I have been remunerated uh, uh, by companies, uh, not by nonprofits, obviously. Uh, and um, that is essentially what I do. Is there a year since 1990 that you've not received any kind of payment or remuneration from Sanofi? Uh, probably not, no. Okay. How much did you receive? What would you say is the approximate total amount of payments and remuneration you've received from Sanofi during your lifetime? Oh my God, I have no idea. Um, I'm sure it's a sizable amount of money, uh, but I, uh, uh, you'd have to ask my wife, who's essentially my uh, accountant. Mm -hmm. um, are, are you, is your wife the person that would have the records to know that amount? Yeah, she probably would. Okay. Would you say it's more or less than $100,000? Oh, I'm sure it's more than that. Would you say it's more or less than 500000 Probably, yes. I would, over the years, I imagine it is. How, would you say it's more or less than a million dollars? Well, again, uh, I'm not prepared to answer this question, but I am sure it's a considerable amount of money. And... Uh, um, over the years, it could well be more than a million. Uh, do you believe it could be a few million? <laughs> you know, Counselor, uh, I cannot give you a precise figure. It is a considerable amount of, of money. I do, do not doubt 
but I, I could not not give you a specific number because I've never looked at it. Okay, well, uh, I'm going to make a request for the documents to understand pre precisely how much you've received from Sanofi over the years. I mean, you guys can do any discovery requests that you want. That he doesn't have it with him today, he can't produce it right now. Your objection is noticed, Counselor. Thank you. Um, Has any entity in which you directly or indirectly have a greater than 1% ownership interest received any payment from Sanofi or any of its related or predecessor entities? Could you repeat that question? Sure. Is any entity, do you understand what I mean by the term entity, Dr. Plotkin? Are you talking about me personally or? Uh, when I say, uh, I'm asking if you understand what the term entity means. When I, in that question? No. Okay, great. Um, uh, so when, when I use the term entity, I mean, I mean it to include any business, sole proprietorship, company, LLC, LLP, limited liability company, uh, organization, and so forth. Is that clear what entity means? Yeah. Okay. So what I'm asking is any entity, so any business company that you've had uh, directly or indirectly, more than 1% ownership interest, okay? Has any company like that received money from Sanofi? Well, uh, again, I'm not sure I understand the, the, the question, but um, I uh, uh, am the principal of a company called Vax Consult, okay. which, uh, uh, which essentially was organized to make things easier from the tax point of view, and that entity, uh, if, if that's what you mean, has received payments uh, from um, companies for whom I consult. Uh, so it, it's a device, if you will, to make things simpler for the, the accountant. Okay, so um, who, who owns that console? I do. Well, my, my wife and I do. Okay. And what percent do you own? 100%. Okay. And um, is there any other company? And, and payments have been made to Vax Consult by Sanofi? Sure. Okay. And what's the total amount of payments that have been made to Vax Consult by Sanofi? Well, again, I do not have a, an exact number. I am sure that over the years, it's a considerable amount, but I c cannot tell you exactly how much. Mm -hmm. Is there any other company in which you have an ownership interest that's received money from Sanofi? No. Okay. You anticipate to continue to receive payments and, or any kind of other remuneration from Sanofi in the future? As long as my health holds out, yes. Okay. And what are those payments for? For advice, have you um, have you received any payments from Merck or any of its related or predecessor entities? Yes. Okay. And what year did you receive payments? All I can say is, since I uh, stopped working for Sanofi, which was in um, early two thousands. Um, I've consulted for um, uh, essentially uh, all of the uh, major manufacturers. And I do not know how much I received, um, but uh, I have certainly received payments from Merck, uh, from Glaxo, uh, from Pfizer, uh, and many other entities. Mm. So what was approximately the first year that you received payments from Merck? Uh, sometime in the 2000s. Would you say that you've received more than $100,000 in payments remuneration from Merck since then? I have no idea. But you would have records I, that would be able to determine that amount, correct? 
Yes, I doubt. I, actually, I doubt that it's a hundred thousand, but I, I don't. Re, uh, I don't recall. I, uh, as I said, my wife does the accounting, and I pay no attention to it. Do you anticipate receiving any payments for remuneration from Merck in the future? Sure. You said that you've received payments and uh, another remuneration from GSK in the past. Yes. Okay. When did those payments start? Again, I cannot give you a precise year, uh, but uh, as I've tried to say repeatedly, since um, 2000, I've been consulting for many different entities, including GSK and, uh, and the others. Mm -hmm. Do you expect to continue to receive payments from remuneration from GSK in the future? Yes. I'll ask you the same question about Pfizer. Um, you indicated that you have received payments from remuneration from Pfizer. Yes. Has, um, do you remember when you first received any payments from them or any remuneration? No, I don't recall what year that would be. Okay. And uh, do you have a sense of approximately how much you've received? No. Do you anticipate continuing to receive payments from remuneration from Pfizer? Very likely. Now, in, now, all of the payments that you've received from the big four vaccine manufacturers, as, as mm -hmm. we defined it, they were either made to you directly or through Vax. I'm sorry, what was Vax that? Vax Console. Or Vax Console? Yes. Okay. okay. Um, why, don't we, why don't we try this a little bit of a different way, since it appears your, your memory of over longer periods of time is not, um, is not as clear with regard to how much payment you remuneration you received from the big four. Um, can you tell me what is the total amount of payments and dollars you received in 2017, last year, from anyone or any entity involved in the development or sale of vaccines? Of what? From any entity mm -hmm. involved in the development or, development or sale of vaccines. Oh. Uh, my recollection is um, in the neighborhood of 200,000. Sorry about that, the microphone wire got stuck. Uh, let me just get this back on. Do you own any stock in Sanofi? No. Have you ever? No. Do you own any stock options in Sanofi? No. Have you ever? No. How about for Merck, Glax, or Pfizer? Do you own any stock stock in any of those companies? No. Any stock options? No. Okay. Has any educational or non-profit, not-for-profit institution in which you have been involved received funding from Sanofi? 
That's a very difficult question to answer. I, I don't inquire about uh, the um, finances of the organizations that I, that I work for or, or that I advise. Uh, so I've, I find that question very, very difficult to answer. I um, imagine that some of them do, but I have no knowledge of the matter. Uh, Voices for Vaccines, for example, receives no funding from any of the, the pharmaceutical companies, uh, and that, that is uh, uh, in, or in order to avoid any suggestion of a conflict of interest. And I think that's probably true for a number of the nonprofits I advise, but obviously it may not be true uh, for companies. So you're saying Voices for Vaccines doesn't receive any funding from pharmaceutical companies? None. <clears throat> What's your affiliation with that group? Well, I was one of those who um, suggested that a, an organization of lay people, as opposed to um, scientists, um, would be a good idea to oppose all of the nonsense that one sees on the web uh, from anti-vaccination organizations. So it was your idea to create Voices for Vaccines? It wasn't my sole idea. It was a suggestion uh, that I made at a certain point, uh, and uh, it turned out that there were um, lay people who were interested in uh, promoting vaccines. Um, since then, I've been on uh, their advisory board. Um, but other than that, I, I have no role in the organization. But you were, so from what I'm understanding, tell me if I'm, I'm correct, um, but it sounds like you were a driving force in suggesting its creation and um, at least initially yes. getting it set up. Is that yes. correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, going to hand you what has been marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 1. And Amy, is that coming to my email? Uh, it will be in just one moment. All right. I don't care. The March one? Yeah, that's fine. I'm going to hand you what's from March's plaintiff's exhibit one. Yeah, go ahead.
it's been sent, hopefully it will come through. I'm sure it will. Got it. Okay, great. Um, Dr. Plotkin, uh, do you recognize this as a printout from the Voices for Vaccines website? Well, that's what it says. I, I don't read the website that often, but yes. Okay. Um, and I see that uh, it's got you listed on the Scientific Advisory Board yes. on the third page, correct? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Um, now, you see at the very end on the last page, Dr. Plotkin, see at the very bottom it says, Voices for Vaccines is an administrative project of the Task Force for Global Health? Uh, yes. Okay. And it receives funding from that organization, correct? No. Okay. does not receive funding. It, the task force was asked to do the... Um, uh, what shall I say, the, uh, uh, the, the financial stuff required uh, for an organization like Voices for Vaccines, uh, but uh, it does not contribute financially mm -hmm. to Voices for Vaccines. I'm going to, Dr. Plug, I'm going to hand you what's been marked as Exhibit 2. This is a Form 90, 90 tax return for the Task Force for Global Health. Yeah, yeah. I'm just not going to ask him questions until he emailed it. So I've handed you what's been what has been marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 2. It is the uh, tax return for the 990 tax return for the Task Force for Global Health. Um, if you turn to the second page, do you see Section 4C? Yes. Where there's expenses of $3,757,924? Yes. Okay. Do you see that one of the groups receiving part of that funding was on the last line, Voices for Vaccines? Uh, I don't see where it says. The last sentence in 4C. Voices for Vaccines has expanded its educational outreach through new media and parenting networks, increasing its membership and its on the ground reach. So? If you go up to number four, Dr. Plotkin, can you read what? the items in that list are supposed to be describing? Uh, expenses, including grants, revenues, I'll, so? I'll read it to you, number four. It says, number four says, describe the organization's program service accomplishments for each of its three largest program services as measured by expenses. Yeah. Okay. Are you claiming that this document does not represent that Voices for Vaccines received funding from the Task Force for Global Health? As far as I am aware, that the Voices for Vaccines receives no funding from the task force. The task force, had, had, under Dr. Alan Henman, has agreed to do the financial um, whatever is required by the government to do the financial work for Voices for Vaccines. But as far as I'm aware, it receives no funding from the task force or uh, any other governmental or semi-governmental um, entity. So the task force does provide some support for Voices for Vaccines, correct? It does, He yes. already answered. He said he doesn't know. Your objection is noted. Thank you. The Task Force for Global Health 
Does the task force of global health receive funding from any of the big four pharmaceutical companies? I do know for a fact, but I doubt it. Uh, the task force, uh, I, I know uh, secondhand, but I uh, believe that uh, they receive funding from CDC, but uh, as far as I know, uh, not from uh, companies. Dr. Pollock, I'm going to hand you with Sir Marcus Plaintiff. Let's give it three. Yes, yeah, so. Okay. This is a fact. Oh, I see. Yes, where it says funders. Okay. Does this. Oh, well, I stand corrected. So uh, the task force then does receive funding from, uh, from companies. Um, however, uh, I don't see that it has any bearing on its work for Voices for Vaccines. Okay. D did you get the email? Where is that in the. Am I looking at the same exhibit you guys are? You should have received deposition exhibit three. And it's a page from the Lancet? No, number 80. No, that's the wrong one. Give me one second, sorry. All right. Can you search? Start task. Open that one. No. No. Um, just under the web page. Just search Doctor, that web page on the internet. Move your hand from your face when you testify. No, uh, council. Yes. It's uh, what it is is a um, it's a fact sheet from printed out from the task force for global health, and on the left side it just shows the donors. Dr. Plot okay. is already you know he's already. Uh, I'm just going to ask him to read the donors and that's it. Can I assume? All right. Okay, so. Um, does this show that the task force for global health received funding from GSK? Yes, it, it does. But I want to repeat that the Voices for Vaccines has studiously avoided receiving funding from uh, any company. And the fact that the task force is doing its finances was only a matter of convenience and a, uh, an offer from Dr. Hinman that they would do that and uh, because they have experience with, uh, with filing uh, tax returns, etc. And I do not believe, and I strongly do not believe, that any of the funding to the task force passes to Voices for Vaccines. Does the task force for global health receive funding from Merck? Yes. And from Pfizer? Apparently, yes. Okay. So the task force for global health receives funding for pharmaceutical companies and at the least, I'm understanding from you, provides some kind of administrative support services 
to the Voices for Vaccines, correct? Correct. And one of the founding voices to um, create that organization was yourself, correct? I was one of those who suggested it, yes. And, and, and you receive remuneration from pharmaceutical companies, correct? I do, yes. Okay. Does anybody out that works for Voices for Vaccines? Let's strike that. Okay. Okay, so going back to what we were discussing, I had asked you earlier, uh, has any educational or not-for-profit institution in which you have been involved received funding from Sanofi? Um, and um, you indicated that would be difficult to answer. Um, can you tell me, but you did indicate to me, I, I, uh, and correct me if I say anything that I don't want to misspeak, um, but you indicated there are um, some groups that don't receive any funding from pharmaceutical companies, correct? And you mentioned Voices correct. for Vaccines as the main yes. one. Okay. Is there any other institute, education or nonprofit institution in which you've been affiliated that you're aware of that does not and has not received funding from any of the, any f vaccine company? Well, I uh, certainly advise the Gates Foundation. Uh, I advise the National Institutes of Health. Um, um, I think those are the, the major institutions um, that are uh, not in the business of in the business of developing vaccines, um, and they 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 do not uh, receive funding from uh, from companies. Does the NIH hold any patents on any vaccine-related technology? I believe they do, yes. Do they receive royalties from those patents? I imagine they do, yes. Okay. To your knowledge, you're not aware of whether any of the other educational not-for-profit institutions outside of Voices for Vaccines, as you've said, Gates Foundation or NIH, that don't receive any money from any of the uh, pharmaceutical companies? I'm not sure I can answer that question categorically, but... Just based uh, they, on your knowledge. I mean, either you, you know, if you don't know, then... I, I, I'm sure there are organizations that are not funded by, um, by industry, but uh, whether... Um, uh, I'm trying to think of ones that I've uh, advised uh, over the years. Um, well, the Sabin Foundation, um, I'm not sure whether they receive funding from industry or not, but um, I, I, I don't uh, normally inquire uh, of the organizations that I advise uh, where their funding comes from. Have you ever worked on developing a vaccine that was eventually used by the public? Yes. Okay. Which ones? Uh, let's see. Uh, well, rubella, rotavirus, rabies, um, and uh, I've made contributions here and there to um, um, uh, anthrax, uh, cytomegalovirus, um, varicella. Um, that's all I can remember at the moment. Okay. Um, the uh, varicella vaccine, you're talking about the, the, a Varivax? Yeah. Okay. Um, when you say you contributed to it, how did you contribute to the development of varicella? Uh, essentially by um, showing how it could be used and um, demonstrating that it was safe and effective. Did you work directly with Merck on that? Um, uh, I don't 
don't recall whether it was directly with um, um, Merck or not. Um, I, certainly it was the vaccine produced by Merck. Um, but whether, I don't recall that they actually funded my uh, studies of varicella vaccine, but they were, they were the producers of the vaccine, certainly. Where were you working when you did this work? At Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, did Children's Hospital ever acquire any intellectual property rights in what was From developed? varicella, no. No. Okay. <clears throat> um, Have you developed or been part in any way in the development of any vaccine from which you have received any payment, revenue, or income related to the sale of that vaccine? Uh, yes, um, uh, although I, I should stipulate that uh, all of the patents on vaccines that I've developed have been taken out by the institutions for which I was working and that uh, they... Um, uh, gave me, uh, I, I stress that it was not a requirement, but they gave me part of the profits deriving from the, the patents. Okay, which, which are those? Sorry? Which vaccines are those? Uh, mainly rubella, rubella uh, rotavirus, and rabies. And the Ravella vaccine that you developed is currently used as part of the MMR vaccine? Correct. Okay. And this is one of the vaccines you believe Faith pediatrician should purchase and administer to her? Absolutely. Okay. What is the total amount of payments in any form you have directly or indirectly received from the sale of the Ravella vaccine? Oh. I cannot give you a figure. Um, uh, I would say that uh, I do not doubt, uh, but again, I'd have to ask my wife, I do not doubt that they were substantial amounts of money and similarly for uh, rotavirus and, and rabies. Okay. Was it in the millions um, of dollars for rubella, just rubella? I don't think so. Um, well, that's all I can say. I Do you, don't think so. Okay. Are you in the possession of documents that would illuminate how much you've received in payment from the sale of the rubella vaccine? Uh, probably. I hope they have been re retained. I don't uh, know, but I imagine. Okay. And, uh, and um, do you continue to receive any payments from the sale or royalties or any other remuneration for from the sale of the rubella vaccine? Currently, I don't think so. Okay. When did it cease? Oh, Jesus. Um, I, I couldn't tell you exactly. Um, sometime during this century, I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if I, if I had thought that this was going to be about my finances, I would have had my wife come along because I don't uh, follow these things and, uh, and certainly what I've done has not been based on what remuneration I could receive uh, from the work that I've done. So uh, if you want financial details, uh, I, I, w I will have to collect them in some other form. But um, how, would you, how do you think your wife would feel of you offering her up for a deposition? I don't think she would like it very much. <laughs> um, right. um, I, I was, it wasn't a serious question. Uh, okay. So, um, but I'll request those documents. Um, do you do, now, do you have... Um, you said that you're not sure whether it was in the millions of dollars that you've received from the sale of Rubello, correct? Correct. But it could have been? I doubt it, but it could have been. I, I don't think so. 
Who, who provided you those payments? Uh, the Wistar Institute. Okay. Did it come from any other source other than Wistar? Um, I don't think so because the Wistar holds the, the patent. Okay. Were you listed as one of the um, patent? One of the inventors? One of the inventors. I believe so, yes. But the uh, but Windstar was the assignee, is that right? Yes. And and so they received the, they're the ones who um, had the, gave the license to Merck. Um, yes, yes. And so Merck mm -hmm. would pay Winst Windstar, and then Windstar would remit some of that to you. Is that correct? Uh, that, that's correct. Um, I'm trying to recall whether Children's Hospital was involved. I don't think so. I, at that point, because that was many years ago. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and you indicated that you've also developed the rotavirus vaccine earlier. I believe you said it was Rotatech? Yes. Okay. That's, and I think you said earlier that's currently one of two rotavirus vaccines yes. currently on the market in the U.S.? Okay. Um, and you obtained a patent for Rotatech? Um, Wistar and Children's Hospital uh, developed patents. Okay. Who was listed as the inventor um, or, or co-inventors? Myself, uh, Paul Offit, and um, Fred Clark. Okay. And who were the assignees of the patent for Rotatech? the assignees you mean who use the well you know when you file the patent there's usually an inventor listed and then there's who you the patents assigned to um. well the patents were taken out by Wistar and Children's Hospital if that's what you mean uh. okay and and so th they were the ones who had the rights to the patent yes okay um, How much remuneration to date have you received from sales of Rotatech? Uh, I couldn't tell you exactly, but it's been a considerable amount. Okay. Has it been in the millions? Uh, I hesitate to say exactly. Uh, it could be, um, but I, I, I really do not know. You, you were entitled, so you indicated that uh, Children's Hospital Philadelphia, is that, is that sometimes referred to as CHOP? Yes. Okay. Um, CHOP was entitled to receive revenue from the sale of Rotatech? Yes. Okay. And what portion from the sale of Rotatech was CHOP entitled to? Well, as I understand it, 50%. And what percent of that 50 were you entitled to? I don't know. Okay. Do you know how much revenue CHOP received from the sale of Rotatech? I do not. Okay. Did it ever come a time where CHOP sold its interest in the Rotatech virus? I vaccine? believe. I believe so, yes. Do you remember how much approximately it was sold for? No. going to hand you what is being marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 4. This is a press release 
from Royalty Pharma. And the title of the press release is Royalty Pharma Acquires Royalty Interest in Rotatech from the Children's Hospital Foundation for $182 million. Ms. Newsma, you should have that in just one second. Okay. Looking at exhibit number four, does that refresh your recollection of how much CHOP sold its interest in Rotatech for in 2008? Uh, assuming it's correct, yes. It's does that sound about right? I have no idea, but presumably it's correct. Mm -hmm. Do you have any reason to doubt the authenticity of this press release? No. Do you have any reason to doubt that CHOP sold its Rotatech interest in 2008 for $182 million? I have no reason to doubt it. Okay. Did you receive a portion of those proceeds? I believe so, yes. And what was that amount? I could not tell you precisely. I really can't. I, I don't do these things for the money, and uh, although it's gratifying to uh, receive monetary awards, uh, I don't personally keep track of it. And again, if I had realized this was going to be the tone of this deposition, I would have asked my wife to, to come along. You, you, you're... You're here today opining that Faith should receive vaccines that are made by the big four pharmaceutical companies, correct? I am, yes. Okay. And you didn't anticipate that your financial dealings with those companies would be relevant to that issue? Uh, I guess, uh, n no, I did not perceive that that was relevant uh, to my opinion as to whether a child should receive vaccines. Vaccines have to be made by somebody and, of course, uh, in this world, they're made by pharmaceutical companies who make profits on vaccines. And the fact that they make profits on vaccines has, has no bearing on whether those vaccines are good for a child or not. So you think the fact that pharmaceutical companies make money on vaccines doesn't bias how they approach the promotion of their own products? I imagine it biases them in favor of vaccines, but so does um, uh, most of the scientific world. Are you saying most of the most scientific world is biased because of financial and No, I'm and saying that most of the scientific world believes that vaccines protect children against serious diseases. Do you have a peer-reviewed study that actually supports what you just said? Absolutely, yes. Okay, good. We'll, we'll, we'll make a demand for that, too. Um, well, you can certainly buy a copy of the vaccines textbook, which contains thousands of references mm -hmm. showing that vaccines work and are safe. Okay. Um, so, from the $182 million sale, to CHOP, that that CHOP made to Royalty Pharma, do you believe that you received more or less than a million dollars? I could, could have received more than a million dollars. I don't have an exact figure. Mm. All right, you're, you stated earlier that your co-inventor on this patent was Paul Offit. Yes. Okay. Were you entitled to similar remuneration as he was? Yes. Okay. Are you aware that he has stated publicly how much he's received from that sale? I'm not aware that he has. Okay. Uh, if I told you he said that he received approximately six million dollars, would, mm -hmm. would, 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 that, would that help you recall how much you received? Uh, not really, but I believe whatever Paul has said, I'm sure, is correct. Okay. Um, so, is $6 million a lot of money, in your opinion? Yes. Okay. If you received $6 million, do you think you'd remember? <laughs> Actually, Counselor, no. I, I, I'm, I hesitate to say this because it sounds as if mm -hmm. um, I'm uh, some sort of idiot. 
but I really do not follow what income I get. It is, I, I have no doubt that it was a lot of money, uh, but uh, I cannot give you an exact figure. I actually do not read my own tax returns. I say that in complete honesty. Uh -huh. How about the Wistar Institute? I believe you stated earlier they also were um, held to intellectual property on Rotatech, correct? Yes. Um, did there ever come a time, and, and you receive a portion of the proceeds that Winstar receives, correct? I, yes. And you continue to receive payments from Winstar for um, the sale of Rotatech? I don't think I've received anything in the last couple of years, but I have in the past. How much approximately have you received in the past? I don't remember. Okay. Um, do you recall Wistar selling a portion of its royalty interest to Rotatech? I believe they have. Okay. Do you remember approximately how much? No. Okay. Um. <clears throat> I'm going to hand you what's from Marcus Plaintiff's Exhibit 5. It's a PR Newswire article. Can you read the title, please? The Wistar Institute sells partial royalty interest in Merck's Rotatech. Tech. To the Paul Royalty Fund. Okay. Does that refresh your recollection of how much they sold their royalty interest? No. Okay. Ms. Newsma, did you receive Exhibit 5? I did. I believe it's Exhibit 5. I have, yep, just got it. Thank you. Can you please read the first sentence of the article, Dr. Falken? The Wistar Institute uh, today announced it has sold a portion of its anticipated worldwide royalty revenues from Rotatech to an affiliate of the Paul Royalty Fund for $45 million. Does that refresh your recollection of how much they received for selling a portion of their interest in Rotatech? <laughs> I know that they sold it. Um, uh, I don't have in my head how much they s sold it for, but I presume this is correct. Okay. The Winstar Institute is entitled to what percentage of the sales from the Rotatech? I do not know. Okay. And you, from this $45 million sale, any recollection of all of how much you received? No recollection. I'm sure I received some. Do you think it was sizable? I think it was probably sizable, yes. More than a few hundred thousand? I think so. I don't ha I have a figure in my head. You have documents that would indicate how much you received? I would imagine so, yes. I'll make a request for those as well. Okay. <clears throat> Are you familiar with the Immunization Action Coalition? Yes. Okay. What is your understanding of what this group does? Uh, they uh, promote vaccination through uh, education and um, um, uh, emails and uh, meetings. Okay. Would you say it's one of the main advocacy groups for vaccines in this country? Uh, I think it's an important one, yes. Does it receive funding from pharmaceutical companies? I believe, I think so. I'm not certain. I, I don't know exactly where their financing comes from, but I think, I think they very well may. Okay.
I'm going to hand you what's a Marcus Plaintiff's Exhibit 6. It's a printout from the Immunization Action Coalition webpage showing their funding for 2017. You can kindly take a look at that in the section that says, uh, that lists the pharma company donors. Mm -hmm. okay. Are any of the companies listed there uh, vaccine manuf manufacturer or trying to develop vaccines? Yes. Which ones? Uh, AstraZeneca, Glaxo, Merck, Pfizer, Sanofi, Securus. So all of them? Yes. Um, okay. Mr. Smot, can you confirm you received Exhibit 6? Haven't gotten it yet, but I should have it in just a second. Got it. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Do you know approximately what percent of Immunization Action Coalition's funding comes from those pharmaceutical companies? No idea. Um, can you name me a major medical group such as the American Academy of Pediatrics or similar that you know does not receive any funding from any pharmaceutical company? Well, inasmuch as I do not know what organizations receive what funding. I really can't answer that question. Okay. So sitting here today, you don't know of one? I don't know what funding, uh, for example, AAP receives from manufacturers, no. Okay. So sitting here today, you're not aware of any medical group that does not receive any support from pharmaceutical companies, correct? Um, I am not aware of the funding of medical organizations and uh, whether or not they receive funding from pharmaceutical companies. Okay. So just to, just to recap, um, I think it's, it would be correct to say that you've received uh, in total from the companies that develop or manufacture vaccines, payments or remuneration, at least uh, in the amount of a few million dollars, correct? I think it's correct to say that uh, since I left uh, Children's Hospital uh, in the 1990s, uh, I have received uh, considerable funding uh, for my work uh, in developing vaccines and in advising companies how to develop vaccines. Uh, and I have also given advice freely uh, to organizations that uh, could not pay me uh, because I believe that uh, vaccines are important to the health of children and adults. So the answer is yes? The answer is yes, but uh, I, I wish to say very clearly that none of the things that I have done have been done with the objective of, of uh, gaining money. Uh, it has been my fortune uh, that I have been rewarded financially for the work that I've done, but none of the things that I've done uh, have been done for financial gain. And I resent very much the line of questioning that suggests that what I believe and what I've done have been done for financial reasons. 
Nobody's suggesting that, Dr. Block, and I'm just asking you. Baloney, you're, you are suggesting that. Well, that's, you're suggesting that. Um, Dr. Plotkin, uh, so you, you indicated that a lot of the remuneration you re received is from the 1990s. Is, have you received any funding from the big four pharma companies or their predecessors before 1990s? Um, I would say probably not. Um, uh, you know, it's very hard to remember that far back, but certainly um, not any substantial funding. I may have uh, received uh, honoraria for attending meetings uh, and in those days. Uh, but certainly nothing, uh, nothing considerable. At that point, I was working uh, at the University of Pennsylvania in the Children's Hospital and the Wistar Institute, and was, of course, uh, paid by those entities. Could you read the last answer back for me, please? Answer, I would say probably not. You know, it's very hard to remember that far back, but certainly not any substantial funding. I may have received honorary for attending meetings in those days, but certainly nothing, nothing considerable. At that point, I was working at the University of Pennsylvania and the Children's Hospital and the Wistar Institute and was, of course, paid by those entities. Okay. Did you receive any funding from any pharmaceutical company to the, related to the development of vaccines? before 1990? Um, I don't recall receiving any funding for the development of uh, rubella vaccine um, before it was licensed and uh, then fund funding uh, passed through Wistar. Um, as far as rotavirus is concerned, uh, I did have uh, grants, not personal money, but uh, grants for uh, rotavirus development from, um, uh, from Sanofi. Um, and um, I had no funding uh, for rabies. Uh, that's as much as I can recall. Okay. But you indicated that you didn't get funding for the work on the rubella vaccine, right? I don't believe I had any funding until uh, it was eventually licensed uh, by um, Merck. And when was that? That was about 1970, early 70s. So from the early 70s, you were receiving funding, you're saying, from Merck related to Rubella? No, Wistar was receiving Wistar funding. from Merck. Yes. Got it. But before that, the Merck did not fund the development of rubella vaccine okay. until it was licensed. Miss uh, Newsmay, you should have Exhibit Seven. I'm going to hand you Dr. Plock and what's marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit Seven. Okay. Can you read the title of the article, please? Attenuation of RA273 rubella virus and WI38 human diploid cells. And who's the first listed author? I am. Okay. And what is the year of this publication? Uh, 1969. Um, right. And if you go to the... Um, 
uh, if you go to the summary, you know what, Dr. Plotkin, let me, uh, may I? Start? Oh, yes. Yes. And, and does it say there that Dr. Plotkin is a recipient of an award from Smith Klein? Is that a predecessor to GSK? Yes, it is. Okay. Yes. And French Inc., uh, Philadelphia, for research on rubella vaccine. Correct? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, unfortunately, that was not the vaccine that eventuated. Um, in other words, the RA273 was not the, really the product of any GSK funding. So does that refresh your recollection now of, of maybe what was an earlier time that you received from funding from pharmaceutical companies towards development related to a vaccine? Yes, I. Uh, okay. I did so, have yeah. uh, some funding from uh, GSK, yeah. but um, they okay. had their own uh, candidate rubella vaccine. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Plotkin, I'm going to hand you um, what is the Marcus Plaintiff's Exhibit 8. Um. Ms. Nusma, did you receive that Exhibit 8? I'm sure I will. If I take a second, it's Dr. Plotkin's um, curriculum vita. <clears throat> oh, I've got a copy of that already. Thank you. Um, this is your CV, correct, Dr. Plotkin? Yes. Uh, did you update the CV recently? Uh, I think it was updated last year, but I'm not sure exactly. It probably doesn't have every last publication. Uh, on the top, on the first page, in the top right corner, do you see the date? Uh, June 2017. Was that when it was last updated? Yes. Okay. If you go to the end, I saw that you went. It's uh, uh, there are some articles here that were published in 2017 in which you're an author. Yes. I think I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven articles. Correct. I guess. Okay, some of these were published within the last few months. Mm -hmm. I think some of them were published in December, November, correct? Yes. Okay, so this has been updated very recently, correct? Well, June 2017. Uh, the articles, if you go to Article 794, Rodriguez, Pinto. Yeah. Do you know what month of the year that was published? No. I told you it was published after June, that? No, I guess my secretary must have added it. Okay. When's the last time you reviewed this CV? <laughs> uh, probably in June 2017. Okay. Um, you provided this CV to the attorney for the defendant in this case? Yes. Quite a hefty CV, Dr. Blocking. Um, it's over 200 pages. <laughs> I see there's 794 articles in it, um, which you were the author, correct? Uh, yes. It's uh, a lot of articles. Um, see a lot of honors, including a who's who in America since 1978. 
Um, got a number of faculty appointments at uh, a number of universities I see here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Um, any of faculty appointments missing from this list? Um, I don't think so. Okay. I, I also see that there's, there's, uh, you have a professor emeritus position at uh, University of Pennsylvania in w Wistar. Do you teach any courses there? Yes. Do you continue to teach any courses? Yes. What do you teach there? Um, participate in the vaccine uh, course at the university and um, uh, essentially give advice to Wistar. And for the university, did you teach a course last semester? Yes. Have you been doing that every year? For Pretty the last much, few yes. years? What's mm -hmm. the name of the course? Vaccines. I, I don't remember the exact name, but it's oh. essentially a course in vaccines. How many days a week does the class meet? Oh, uh, t two days. Two days a week. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I see um, you have a number of hospital and administrative appointment, appointments, one, two, three, four. you have six of them, all right? It looks like they're, they're all at the Children's Hospital of Pen well, Philadelphia and then Department of Pediatrics. Uh, any of your hospital administrative appointments missing from this list, Dr. Plotkin? Uh, no, I don't, don't think so. Um, I do have an appointment at Johns Hopkins, um, but um, yeah. And what is that? I'm an adjunct professor. Since when? Gosh, uh, I think sometime in the 2000s. Okay. I see you have positions in industry listed, correct? Yes. I see two of them. I see one is from 1991 to 1997, the medical and scientific director at uh, Sanofi. Yes. Right. And 1997-2009, uh, 1997, executive advisor to the CEO of Sanofi, correct? Correct. Okay. But as discussed earlier, since 2009, you've also worked for Sanofi, correct? I have, yes. And you work for Merck? Yes. And Glaxo? Yes. And Pfizer? Yes. How come those aren't listed here, Dr. Plotkin? Well, I, they, they are uh, consultancies. They're not uh, uh, official appointments. I don't have, a, a, let's say, a title at, at Merck. I'm simply a consultant to them. And I, mm -hmm. uh, so it's not in my CV. Mm -hmm. So in pro providing this CV to your to defendant's counsel, you didn't think disclosing your affiliations with the very companies whose product you're saying Faith should be re received, who her pediatrician purchased and provide to her, was necessary to disclose? The CV... Uh, Strike the question. It, Let me ask you this. Yeah. Are you willing to update your CV to disclose all of the connections you have with the big four pharmaceutical companies? Yes, of course. The, the CV is uh, okay. It's created for not for the, the 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 for legal purposes. This is created uh, to inform people who want to know about my papers and uh, and my appointments at various universities. You provided this to defendants counsel, correct? Yes. To show your experience as relevant to being an expert witness in this case, correct? To show my experience as uh, in the field of vaccines, yes. What is Dynavax Technologies? Dynavax is a company that is uh, working on uh, adjuvantation of uh, vaccines uh, and has recently licensed a, a hepatitis B vaccine that is um, uh, more immunogenic than the current vaccines. Okay. This is a for-profit company. Yes. Right? And it's involved in the development of vaccines, right? Yes. 
You're on the board of directors of this company, correct? Correct. Okay. That affiliation is not disclosed on the CV, correct? It's not on the CV, okay. no. What is VBI vaccines? Variation bio. Okay, and what is that? Uh, that's a, a biotech developing vaccines. Okay. And this is a for-profit company as well, correct? Yes. And you are also on the board of directors of this company, right? Yes. And that affiliation is not disclosed in your CV, correct? It is not in my CV, no. Okay. What is MyMedics? Well, MyMedics is a biotech in, uh, in Europe. Um, they've actually... Uh, <laughs> I haven't done anyth anything for them in at least a year now. Uh, but I think I'm still officially on their board. You're chairman of their scientific advisory board, correct? As I said, I haven't done anything for them for at least a year. So I, if, if, if that is correct, that's mm. uh, uh, sort okay. of an old thing. Uh, but they're a for-profit company? Yes. And how long were you on their board? Uh, couple of years, I don't remember okay. exactly. But that affiliation is not on your CV, correct? No. Dynavax Technologies, what have you done for them? Dynavax, I've been on their board. Okay. You attend the board meetings? Uh, not recently, but yes, in the past. Have you advocated on their behalf? Yes. Have you done that in any government meetings, for yes. example? Yes, yes. To seek licensure of the vaccine? Yes, it was just licensed. Okay. And so you were advocating as a board member of a technology company to get licensure of a new vaccine, correct? Yes. We have five minutes left on the disc. Okay. Inovio Biomedical Corp. What's that? Uh, that's a biotech that's developing vaccines based on uh, DNA. And is this a for-profit company? Yes. And what is your affiliation with the company? I'm on their board. Okay. And was that affiliation disclosed in your CV? No. Okay. What's CureVax, a CureVac AG? It's also a biotech. Okay. Is it a for-profit company? Yes. Is it involved in the development of vaccines? Yes. <clears throat> What's your affiliation with that company? Uh, I'm on their board. Okay. Did you, is that affiliation disclosed in your CV? No. Okay. What is SYN, S-Y-N, vaccine? Um, actually, I'm not sure about that, uh, about that name, but um, uh, as I recall, it's a company trying to develop synthetic uh, vaccines. What's your affiliation with that company? Actually, I don't recall uh, that uh, I've certainly helped them, but I, I don't recall that I have a board position, I, 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 or you know, whether I'm officially on the board or not. I haven't had contact with them for some time. What is Geovax Labs? Uh, it's also a biotech. Okay. Is it a for-profit company? Yes. Is it involved in the development of vaccines? Yes. What's your affiliation with that company? I've been an advisor and um, I think I'm officially on their board. Um, they're trying to develop a vaccine against HIV. Was this affiliation disclosed in your CV? No, right? No, I, okay. I don't have my consultancies on my CV. You're on the board of these companies, correct? Yes. Okay. What is Glyco Vaccine AG? That's G L Y C O, then capital V A X Y N A G. Uh, it, it was a biotech in, in Europe. Okay. Is it a for profit company? It was. Okay. Was it involved in the development of vaccines? Yes. Were you on the board of this company as well? Yes. Okay. Did you, is that disclosed in your CV? No. What is uh, Adjuvance Technologies? That's A-D-J-U-V-A-N-C-E Technologies. It's a company trying to develop adjuvants for vaccines. Okay. 
Is it a for-profit company? Yes. Okay. You're on the board of this company as well, right? Yes. Okay. And that affiliation isn't disclosed in your CV either, right? No. What is Bionet Asia? Uh, a company developing a new pertussis vaccine. Okay. Is this is a for-profit company as well? Yes. Okay. And uh, you're on the board of this company as well? Yes. That affiliation also wasn't disclosed in your CV, correct? Correct. Okay. What's ABCOMBI, that's A-B-C-O-M-B-I, Biosciences? Um, I haven't heard from them in a long time, and actually I'm not even sure. Um, I mean, I had an interview with the founder once, whether he um, listed me as a board member, I, I don't know. I haven't heard from him in a long time. It's a for-profit company? I, I really have no idea. I assume it is, but I, I, I don't know. Okay. Um, and, um, and I should say that I'm, I'm spelling them out for the benefit of the court reporter. I assume mm -hmm. you know the spelling. I'm just doing mm -hmm. it for the benefit of the court reporter. Uh, what's uh, Hukipia Biotech? That's Oh, Hukipa. Oh, thank you. Yeah. H-O-O-K-I-P-I-A. Yeah, biotech. It's, it's a European uh, biotech. Okay, is it a for-profit company? Yes. All right. And it's involved in the development of vaccines? Yes, hopefully. And... You're also on the board of this company? Yes. Okay. And, and that affiliation also wasn't disclosed in your CV, right? No. Okay. Um, well, you mentioned um, one of the companies was in the process of developing a new, trying to develop a new pertussis vaccine. Which, which company was that? Bionet. Thank you. Um, why are they trying to develop a new pertussis vaccine? Because a problem with current... Uh, acellular vaccines is that although they are protective, the protection doesn't last as long as we would like. And Bionet uh, has developed a um, component of pertussis vaccine that should give long, longer lasting responses. And how long does the current immunity lasts from the, the current acellular pertussis vaccine? Well, uh, you know, it, it lasts for probably on the order of five years, but the efficacy diminishes after uh, two years or so. And the, the result is that uh, there have uh, been more pertussis in adolescence uh, than we would like. So when you say after five years, the immunity's gone in two years, the efficacy, do you mean after the, uh, how many dose, the, the four or five dose TDAP, DTAP series? Well, I, I, I should go into some detail. Um, the first, 30 the, the first three doses are given, it, yeah. You know what, I, I apologize. They, yeah. they, okay. they, it, it's about to run out, and yeah. uh, I don't want to give the video right. for a hard time. <laughs> this ends this one of the deposition of Dr. Stanley Plotkin. We are going off the record. The time is 10.32. I apologize for cutting off. This is the beginning of tape number two of the deposition of Dr. Stanley Plotkin. We are on the record. The time is 10.42. Okay. Thank you. Um, apologies for, again for cutting off your answer to the last question. The tape needed to be changed. Um, if you could kindly read back the last question to give Dr. Plock an opportunity to respond. five years immunity is gone in two years efficacy do you mean after dash the four or five dose DTAP series answer I should go into some detail the first dash well answer the first three doses are given dash you know what I apologize That's what I know. so uh, pertussis vaccine is given in three doses in the infancy 
and uh, is uh, quite protective during the uh, the childhood or infancy years. Then there's a booster dose given uh, before uh, school entry, and uh, that um, uh, results in protection, uh, pretty protection for two, three years, uh, but then be begins to uh, fade uh, when the child reaches uh, eight or nine years. Um, and a dose is recommended uh, in pre-adolescence. And there in particular, what's been found is that uh, with the um, so-called acellular vaccines, that um, after two or three years, that the efficacy diminishes uh, considerably. And uh, so there are efforts to uh, try to um, improve that uh, persistence of efficacy. And Bionet is one of the companies that is, is uh, in effect trying to develop a, a longer lasting uh, acellular uh, pertussis vaccine. Uh, there are other companies also uh, working to improve the vaccine for adolescents. So the last vaccine recommended for adolescents is around what age? Of Tdap or a diphtheria about, tetanus pertussis you know, containing vaccine? 13, 11, 11 uh, 13. 13. Okay. And did I understand correctly that a few years after that last dose, mm -hmm. um, the um, most folks who've gotten that vaccine are no longer immune to pertussis? Well, um, most folks is perhaps a bit of an exaggeration, but okay. it, it, it depends on, on the study. But certainly I would say that the high effectiveness that's seen uh, um, initially after the vaccine diminishes considerably by five years. And what do you mean by considerably? Well, so it falls somewhere between 30 to 50 percent uh, protection. Um, so it's not nearly as good as uh, after the, the uh, vaccine dose is given. Okay. So after the last vaccine dose in adolescents, uh, five years later, only 30 to 50 percent of people are receiving the CDC recommended childhood schedule are protected from pertussis. Yes. Okay. How about 10 years out? <laughs> Um, I'm not sure there are many studies that go that far out, but I would imagine that uh, the protection has diminished considerably by, the, by that time. So most adults aren't protected for pertussis? Not unless they've, um, uh, unless they've received a booster dose. But that being said, it becomes complicated because uh, if they are infected with um, the organism that causes pertussis, even if they are not uh, ill because of it, uh, they will get a natural booster. And so uh, they um, may not have symptomatic uh, pertussis. Uh, it, pertussis is um, not uncommon in, in adults. Uh, so it's but the epidemiology is not as well established as it is for children. Mm -hmm. But in terms of protection from vaccination from pertussis, most, ad most adults are not protected from the vaccination. You're saying they're, if, if they're protected, they're protected from exposure to the actual pertussis. Yeah. Uh, is it bacteria? Yes. But, you know, you have to bear in mind that pertussis as a disease is most important in the newborn and in children. And fortunately, we have very effective means of preventing pertussis in those highly susceptible individuals. Adults will, will have a cough disease, but they won't uh, die of uh, pertussis. Uh, so, uh, although we want to protect them as well, uh, the main point of pertussis vaccine is to protect the, uh, the newborn and the young uh, child. 
So is it is it only really dangerous in the first what few months of life or? Yes, um, uh, infants with pertussis may w frequently die of pertussis, and that's why um, immunization uh, in pregnancy is now practiced. In other words, to provide passive uh, immunity to the infant during the first months of life before the infant mm -hmm. is vaccinated. Uh -huh. Um, and if the mother had been exposed to pertussis bacteria itself and had immunity that way, that would also confer immunity to the baby? Yes, but um, uh, one can't depend on that. Whereas if you give a dose of vaccine during pregnancy, you can depend on the uh, antibodies passing to the infant. Does the um, the acellular pertussis vaccine prevent? Sorry, say it again. Does the acellular um, pertussis vaccine prevent the infection and transmission of pertussis in the in the, in the person vaccinated with acellular pertussis vaccine? Well, that's uh, a an area of active research. It appears that the acellular vaccines uh, don't. Um, uh, protect uh, the individual from carrying the organism as much as the uh, so-called whole cell pertussis vaccines uh, did. Uh, but those data are based largely on animal studies and we don't really have a lot of human data to tell us whether the, the, the animal results are uh, true in, in humans uh, or not. But there is a concern that uh, the acellular vaccines uh, may not uh, protect a, an individual from passing the organism to another individual, even if the vaccinated person doesn't get sick mm -hmm. himself or herself. What animals were used in those studies? Baboons. Why were baboons used? <laughs> Why were baboons used? Because they are susceptible to pertussis and obviously they're uh, close to humans. Um, would those experiments be ethical to do with, with people as opposed to baboons? That well, I'm not sure it would be ethical to infect someone with pertussis. Um, uh, <laughs> that would require a, an ethical committee to consider uh, what, how the experiment would be done. For example, uh, if someone were infected with pertussis and then given antibiotics uh, soon after administration of the organism, that could be ethical because the antibiotics would cure the individual uh, before, uh, before he or she becomes ill. Um, wouldn't but, that mess up the study, though? Sorry? Wouldn't that, but then wouldn't that mess up the study in terms of it, it, it would certainly influence the, the study, but it could allow us to determine whether an individual um, uh, who has been vaccinated with the acellular vaccine can pass the organism despite the vaccination to another uh, individual. Has that study been done? Uh, no, okay. it has not yet been done. In terms of the study that was done with baboons, that study... Yes. Could that study be done with humans? Do you think any IRB approval could ever be obtained to do that study with humans? To allow an individual to develop symptomatic pertussis? I don't think that would be approved. Okay. Uh, what was, um, so in terms of the baboon studies that were done, that's about as good those are about as good as you're going to get for those studies because you can't do the human studies, correct? In well, terms of evidence yeah. about the transmissibility and infection of pertussis from uh, yes, but after acellular pertussis vaccination. 
Yes, but I, I, I believe that um, uh, uh, workers are trying to determine whether vaccinated individuals are still uh, colonized by, uh, uh, by the pertussis organism. Uh, if they are colonized, then they probably could transmit uh, to others. I mean, there's a lot of work going on in, in this field, including developing a, an attenuated uh, Bordetella pertussis, uh, which could be given to boost immunity uh, and in particular to prevent uh, carriage. So, um, as I said, this is a, a very active area of investigation. Um, what was Merck's total revenue from vaccine sales in 2016? No idea. Think it was in the millions? I imagine so, but I certainly have no knowledge. You think it was in the billions? I don't do not know. Okay. Do you know what the uh, Do you know what the global sales of vaccines were approximately last year? Um, my vague recollection is something like 30 billion. 30 billion. And do you know what percent approximately Merck's share of that was? No. Uh, Sanofi's? No. Glaxo? No. Or Pfizer? No. Do you combined, what, do you have a sense of what percent those four represent in terms of that $30 billion in vaccine sales? Probably, I would guess, but it's purely a guess, 20 billion. 20 billion with a B? 20 billion. And, um, um, And um, the increase in the vaccine market uh, has been due to the fact that new vaccines give higher profits, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, are you familiar with the uh, New England, strike that. Um, if, if I told you In terms of the thirty billion dollars, and uh, you said approximately, um, what percent did you say approximately? You thought was from the big four vaccine makers. I said twenty. I really don't have an accurate idea, but oh, that's my guess. Twenty billion. Oh, billion. Okay, and and you said what percent of that was related from the four big, to the four big vaccine manufacturers? No, what I said was that I thought the overall income was 30, but that the big four probably account for uh, 20. Okay. Uh, but I, but that's, those are purely guesses. Okay. All right, well, then let's, then let's do this. Okay. When you say it's a guess, how off do you think you might be? <laughs> if it's a guess, how do I know how, how off I am? How did you I come am? up with the 20 billion? Because I vaguely recall having seen a paper uh, with uh, those numbers, but my memory may be incorrect. 
Are you familiar? Um, are you familiar with the New England Journal of Medicine? <laughs> yes, of course. What does an editor for this journal do? What does an editor for the journal do? Yeah. I presume that he edits articles that are submitted to the journal. And what does the editor in chief do? Well, selects articles to be published. Okay. And, and what is your opinion about this, the New England Journal of Medicine? It is an influential medical journal. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to read you a quote from a, a Dr. Edmund J. Safra, uh, a professor at Harvard Medical School and a former editor in chief at the New England Journal of Medicine. And I'm going to ask you a question about it. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yes. So the quote says uh, Conflicts of interest and biases exist in virtually every field of medicine particularly those that rely heavily on drugs or devices. It is no longer possible to believe much of the clinical research that is published or to rely on the judgment of trusted physicians or authoritative medical guidelines. I take no pleasure in this conclusion, which I reach slowly and reluctantly over my two decades as the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. Are you familiar with that quote? No. Okay. Uh, then let me read you a different quote, um, again by Dr. Angel, and in which she blames uh, the issue she, that I just quoted, the issues with truths in medical publishing on individuals that use the legitimacy of academia to push pharmaceutical company agendas. Uh, here's what she said about um, uh, those individuals. She says, quote, they serve as consultants of the same companies whose products they evaluate, join corporate advisory boards and speakers bureaus, enter into patent and royalty arrangements, agree to be the listed authors of articles ghostwritten by interested companies, promote drugs and devices at company sponsor symposia, and allow themselves to be plied with expensive gifts and trips to luxurious settings. Many also have equity interests in sponsoring companies. Are you familiar with that quote? Um, yes, I think I have read that. Mm -hmm. okay. You've consulted for the big four vaccine manufacturers, correct? Yes. All right. You're in the corporate advisory boards of numerous vaccine developers, correct? Yes. You've received royalties from the sale of one or more vaccines, correct? Yes. You're listed as an author. Uh, I can't so sorry. I missed the next question completely. Um, have, have you received, you have received royalties from the sale of one or more vaccines, correct? Yes. And he said yes. Um, you are listed as an author um, on at least one or more papers where individuals authoring the papers receive compensation from vaccine makers, correct? Uh, would you repeat that question? Sure. Have any of your co-authors on any of the, on the papers that you've published uh, received compensation from pharmaceutical companies? Presumably, yes. Yeah. And you've taken, I numerous trips over the last 30 years to various parts of the world. Yes. Work, okay. Um, I'm going to read you a list of acronyms, and for the record, could you please state what you understand each to be? This way we can have a, a commonality in terms of language. Uh, HHS? Uh, Health and Human Services. Okay. Um, CDC? I know these. I know that. <laughs> I know that you know these. This is just so that when I use the term CDC later, we have it defined. Centers for Disease Control. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, have you ever been involved with the CDC? Yes, of course. Okay. okay. Um, what's been your involvement? Well, actually, I was a um, epidemic intelligence service officer in the 1950s, and I have served on committees. Uh, I've um, um, uh, attended uh, numerous meetings at CDC. I've uh, uh, worked uh, or let's say collaborated frequently with people from CDC. Uh, CDC is the uh, world's most important uh, epidemiology organization. FDA? Um, I, I, yes, I've, I've actually done um, a consultation for uh, FDA um, and um, 
um, interacted with people on, on FDA, yes. And it stands for the Food and Drug uh, food Administration. Food and Drug Administration, yes. and, and the FDA is an agency within HHS, correct? Yes. And, and, and CDC is also an agency within HHS? Yes. Okay. Uh, NIH? Yes, of course. That's, National Institutes of Health. Right. And you've been involved with the NIH? Yes. And, and how have you been involved? Uh, served on committees, uh, uh, worked with people at NIH, uh, um, uh, scientific collaborations. NIH is an agency within HHS as well, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, HRSA? Not Hel sure. Health Resources Services Administration? Okay. All right. They were also an agency within HHS, yes. correct? Um, any involvement with HRSA? I don't think so. Okay. Uh, ACIP? Uh, well, yes, the uh, Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices. Um, I have uh, attended their meetings um, uh, since 1960s, probably. Have you ever served on the board at ACIP? Uh, on ACIP itself, no. Okay. Um, no. Have you ever served on any board related to ACIP? The ACIP? I've uh, worked, uh, I've participated in working groups uh, which they have organized on specific subjects. And what working groups were those? Uh, let's see, MUMPS. Um, um, uh, let's see, what else? Um, Mumps was the most recent one. Um, I can't recall for the moment, but anyway, two or three w working groups that they've organized from time to time. A yellow fever was one. Um, Ever work on a working group for a rotavirus? Actually, no. Um, and measles? Measles? No. Not measles, I'm sorry. Uh, rubella? Uh, no, not for ACIP, no. A, a different government agency? Uh, no, actually that was for WHO. Uh, oh, for the rubella? Yes. And for rotavirus, did you serve on a committee no. for any other government to lunch? No. I need to hear the whole question. I'm please. sorry. You're answering while he's still questioning, uh, and there's no question in the record. No. And uh, for rotavirus, did you serve in a... You could strike that. That's okay. Um, Oh, and WHO stands for? World Health Organization. Okay, thank you. Um, v um, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this acronym correct. You can correct me if I don't. Is it VERPAC? 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 Um, How does it normally pronounce? Uh, VERPAC. Um, Vaccines and Related Biologicals Advisory Committee. And that's V R B P A C. Yeah. Right. Okay. Any involvement with that committee? Um, I have testified, but not. I've not served on the committee. Okay. What did you testify there for? Uh, on the uh, at least the last time uh, concerned uh, the uh, Dynavax vaccine. Oh, the the for the company you're on the board for. Yes. And this was to try to seek approval of that vaccine? Yes. Okay. Which ended up getting approved? Yes. Okay. Um, the the um, NVAC? National Vaccine Advisory Committee. Okay. Uh, I've um, given talks to the committee. Okay. Uh, about what? <laughs> About vaccines. <laughs> uh, Fair enough. Uh, it's m anything in particular about vaccines or particular vaccines? No, actually, it was more or less general. Um, I was not uh, pushing any particular vaccine, but in relation to um, the administration and um, um, development of new vaccines. Ever give a presentation about the vaccine market? About the vaccine market? No. Okay. 
<clears throat> and um, so all of the agencies and committees we just listed, CDC, FDA, NIH, HRSA, ACIP, Verbac, and uh, uh, NVAC, they're all under HHS. I believe so, yes. Yeah. And what's the, uh, what is, uh, what about IOM? What does that stand for? The Institute of Medicine, okay. now the National Academy of Medicine. Okay, have you ever been involved with IOM? Well, I'm a member of the National Academy. Um, so, yes. Since when have you been a member? <sighs> oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, um, Ten years, but that's just a guess. Okay. What is the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act of 1986? Well, that's, um, in effect, it funds uh, the, um, uh, the organization that um, uh, uh, um, what shall I say, it receives um, requests from individuals who believe that they've been injured by vaccines and remunerates them if they decide that, uh, that th there was a possibility that the vaccine uh, did cause injury. Okay, so if somebody's injured by a vaccine, they sub this law provides that they submit a claim to Health and Human Services? Yes. And Health and Human Services then adjudicates? Yes. Uh, and, uh, and, and those claims are filed in something called the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program, correct? Yes. Administered in D.C.? Yes. Okay. So, yeah. Um, and um, the respondent in those cases is HHS, the Secretary yes. of HHS, and the Secretary of HHS in those cases is represented by the Department of Justice. Yes. To defend against claims that the vaccines cause injury, right? I would say that they uh, determine whether there is a reasonable possibility that the uh, vaccine caused injury. Um, they, mm -hmm. I would say, are relatively um, open and uh, will uh, give an award if there is a reasonable possibility. When when this was first organized, do you have a do you have mm -hmm. a study that supports what you just said, or any that type what? of that they are very that they're open to giving awards? Uh, do you have any governmental report or any any authoritative source? Uh, any kind of governmental report or similar that supports this, the assertion you just made? Uh, well, I don't know. I'd have to I uh, have to look look that up. Okay. But um, w w I, the principle was enunciated um, years ago by the uh, particularly by the American Academy of Pediatrics, and they their idea, which I now think was a good idea, uh, was that uh, rather than have an adversary situation, that uh, they would set up an organization whereby uh, if there was a reasonable possibility of injury, uh, that the, uh, they would offer remuneration as opposed to the situation where lawsuits were being filed uh, against uh, companies and uh, having an impact on whether the company was continuing, would continue to make the vaccine. Uh, at a certain point, there were relatively few companies making vaccines. And so this is an idea which over the years I have um, realized was a good idea. Uh, because it, it removed the, um, what shall I say, the, um, the oppositional 
uh, part of, of the story and, and made it possible uh, for um, people who thought that they had been injured to be re remunerated, uh, whether or not that was biologically the case. Mm. So is it your testimony that the national that the vaccine injury compensation program is not an adversarial system? Uh, it's an adversarial system in that uh, people have to have some reasonable um, uh, information base uh, to say that a child, let's say, has uh, been uh, injured, whether uh, it's because of the vaccine or whether it's a chance occurrence. Uh, fortunately, does not have to be adjudicated under this kind of system. That's only if it's a table injury, correct? Yes. But if it's a not a table injury, then the petitioner would need yes to show that it was the mm -hmm. vaccine that caused the injury. Yes. Okay. Um, so. Right, so this is, I'm going to refer to this as the 1986 Act. This is the Act that gave vaccine mm -hmm. manufacturers immunity from liability. Yes. And you have to, yeah, okay. for injuries caused by vaccines. Mm -hmm. Yes. What is a bacteria? It's a microorganism which... Uh, has certain uh, properties. It has a cell wall and uh, it has um, uh, DNA within um, uh, uh, within the organism uh, and it uh, can, depending on what bacteria it is, it can uh, multiply in humans and uh, sometimes cause disease. Okay, how does it replicate? It divides. Um, uh, it has mechanisms for for d dividing and multiplying. And what is a virus? Uh, a virus is a um, DNA or RNA molecule with uh, properties to produce pr proteins and to replicate in cells. Um, and make more of it, more of it, and is capable of causing disease under certain circumstances. Okay. When you say replicate, replicate in cells. Yes. Do you mean in the host, the person that it infects? The, yes. So it takes over the person it infects' own cellular DNA material. Uh, well, it doesn't take over the DNA necessarily, but it is able to replicate. Uh, in cells that which of course have DNA, uh, uh, not all viruses require that 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 they influence the DNA of, of of the cell, but they all are able to replicate in the cytoplasm or in the nucleus of uh, the, the the cells of the host. And in, and in that fashion, they will spread from cell to cell? Yes. Okay. By duplicating themselves into more and more cells in the body? Yes. Okay. And the virus DNA will, you said it can be either DNA or RNA? Yes. Okay. And those DNA and RNA pieces, they, they provide coding for protein structures? Yes. Um, those protein structures are typically, DNA creates protein structures that are important for regulating bodily functions? Well, uh, the viruses uh, uh, I meant DNA in general, I'm yeah. sorry. Oh, well, DNA in general, yes. yes. DNA in general codes for RNA, which then codes for proteins. Okay. Um, essential for human life? Yes. Okay. Um, and is DNA shared across humans? Uh, meaning, is, is there similarity between the DNA sequence in different people? Uh, there are similarities, yes, and there are differences. Okay. What percent of, you know, is, is the um, similarity is there between human DNA amongst individuals? <laughs> well... <laughs> There, uh, 
there are uh, mostly similarities, but there are, of course, differences. That's why we are each different from one another. I've read, and I mean, tell me if this is not accurate, that human DNA is approximately, among individuals, 99.9% similar among yeah. different yeah. people. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. But th that still allows for differences. Right. Oh, some of us mm -hmm. have different eye color. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Sorry? Yes. Yeah. Um, do all humans and mammals uh, strike that? Um, what is the percentage of similarity between human DNA and the DNA in uh, in mammals uh, of different kinds? Why don't we start well, with? Why don't we start with? Sorry. Why don't we start with primates? Well, uh, the similarities are in the in the upper nineties, uh, uh, no doubt. But um, one has to appreciate that uh, the differences that occur are are critical, and um, result in in critical differences. So. Mm -hmm. um, the the fact that that we're let's say ninety nine percent similar to chimpanzees doesn't mean that uh, the the differences are are um, the one percent difference is unimportant um, uh, because much of the DNA actually uh, the the function of mu most of the DNA is unknown. Mm -hmm. So humans have approximately between humans have about a 99.99% similarity in DNA and between humans and I think you said chimpanzees about 99% similarity yeah. in terms of sequence. Yes. Uh, what about for other mammals such as let's say uh, between humans and chickens or cows or huh. is oh, there a similarity? I, I, well there are similarities <laughs> certainly but there, there, there are key differences that's what I was referring to, even okay. though much of the DNA is the same, most of the DNA that we have, the function of which is unknown. And what percent would you say is similar? With chickens? I, I don't know offhand. Cows? Uh, again, I, I don't know the, the number, okay. but the, 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 the point is that uh, it doesn't require a large percentage of the DNA to be uh, to be different. Sure. Uh, uh, what about uh, guinea pigs? <laughs> if you don't know, that's yeah. fine. You can just yeah. say you don't know. I don't know. Okay. Um, um, are you familiar with how the CDC makes changes to its pediatric vaccine schedule? Yes. Okay. Have you ever been part of that process? Not part of the process, but par certainly part of the discussion. Okay. An addition and changes to the CDC pediatric schedules voted upon by ACIP, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, what happens when ACIP votes for a pediatric vaccine to be added to the CDC's pediatric vaccine schedule for universal use? It is... Um, uh, adopted by various medical organizations and recommended to the physicians. Okay. And so the pediatricians around the country rely on those recommendations to decide whether or not to administer a vaccine? Absolutely. Okay. Um, and what about children in the United States that can't afford the vaccines recommended by ACIP? Well, uh, until the present time, remains to be seen whether that will still be the case. Uh, the, the government pays for those ch children to receive vaccines. Okay. Is that called the Vaccine for Children program? Yes. And ACIP votes on whether or not to add a vaccine to that program, yes. correct? Okay. And when a vaccine is added to that program, the manufacturer is paid f for the vaccine even if the child can't pay, correct? Correct. Do you know what percentage of vaccines 
uh, pediatric vaccines administered in the United States um, are purchased from pharmaceutical companies using federal money in the, through the Vaccine for Children program? Uh, 50 to 60 percent. So, so when ACIP recommends a vaccine for universal use, it will essentially create a liability-free market of millions of children for this pharmaceutical company manufacturing that vaccine, right? The, the act provides payment to the pharmaceutical company to manufacture the vaccine. That is correct. Are you talking about the 1986 Act? Uh, yes. All right. And they're not liable for injuries from the, from the vaccines, right? Uh, unless it is the result of a bad manufacture. Okay. But not for, if, if it wasn't, not for design defect claims. Right. Meaning, meaning you can't sue a vaccine manufacturer claiming that they could have made the vaccine safer. Correct. Okay. Who comprises the voting members of ACIP? No, they, I, uh, strike that. <laughs> I, I didn't want the names. Um, let me ask it a different way. Um, uh, uh, are the individuals that serve on ACIP government employee? No. Okay. Where do these individuals come from? They come from all over the United States, and they are chosen because they have no conflict of interest. That is to say, they uh, receive no um, funding from uh, vaccine companies, um, but uh, are uh, thought to know something about vaccines nevertheless with the exception of a um, community representative who is um, um, a lay person. So none of the members of ACE have any conflict with regards to the manufacture, development, or a vaccination? Right. Okay. When was the first rotavirus approved by ACE for universal pediatric use? Uh, that was, I don't remember the, uh, the year, but my recollection is that was in the 1990s. If I tell you June 25th, 1998, does that jog your memory? Yeah, that could be right. Yeah. Um, Um, on that date, June 25th, 1998, um, you and your co-inventors, Paul Offit and Fred Clark, had already had a patent on the rotavirus vaccine, correct? Yes. Were you at ACIP at the meeting that they first approved the first ever rotavirus vaccine for universal pediatric use? I believe I was. Okay. Was Fred Clark at that meeting? I think he was. I'm, I, I'm not certain. Was Paul Offit at that meeting? Yes. Okay. What was Paul Offit's role at that meeting? His role. Um, I don't remember whether he was still on the committee or not. Um, I, I don't remember. He was on ACIP? Uh, I, he was on ACIP, yes. He was a voting member of ACIP. I, he, but I am confident that he was not allowed to vote on the licensure of Rodotech or on the administration of Rodotech. For the f first, what was the first rotavirus vaccine that was approved for universal use in this country? Rodotech. Okay.
Well, is that the, vex the rotavirus vaccine that you worked on? Yes. There wasn't a rotavirus vaccine that was approved before that? I don't believe so. No. Well, there, yes, there was um, a vaccine that had been developed uh, at the National Institutes of Health uh, that uh, had been licensed uh, but uh, was found to cause uh, intussusception and um, the manufacturer took it off the market. Okay. Poloff was on the committee and voted to approve that vaccine for universal use, correct? Uh, very likely, yes. Okay. At the time that he voted to approve that rotavirus vaccine for universal use, he was a patent holder with you and Fred Clark on a rotavirus vaccine, correct? Yes. He didn't accuse himself from voting on recommending the rotavirus vaccine for universal use at that meeting, correct? That's correct, uh, which uh, in a sense was voting against himself since hmm. obviously um, uh, he was in favor of the vaccine that we were trying to, to develop. So in, a, in effect, he was voting for a competitor. Mm -hmm. When you have one vaccine for a given disease approved for universal use, wouldn't that make it easier to then have a, another vaccine for that same uh, uh, disease approved for universal use? Assuming that the properties of the second vaccine were equal to or better than the first, mm -hmm. yes. So approval of the first one paves the way for the second one, doesn't it? It paves the way in the sense that if people believe that rotavirus disease is worth preventing, they will want more than one vaccine licensed so that in case there's a shortage of supply of one vaccine, there is no alternative. All right, so there's, so there's once you have one approved, it's a good idea to have a second one approved then, isn't it? It is, yes. Yes. Are you aware of the many other conflicts of interest regarding the vote to approve the rotavirus vaccine for universal use that we've just been discussing? That's been reported in a U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Government Reform report? No. Are you aware that this report found that, quote, the overwhelming majority of members, both voting members and consultants, have substantial ties to the pharmaceutical industry, end quote? Well, um, I can't go back to 1998, uh, but uh, at the moment, uh, my criticism of the ASIP committee is that um, Many of the people on the committee uh, do not have a uh, very large knowledge uh, about vaccines uh, because they are eliminated from participating on the committee if they have any uh, connections uh, with, uh, with industry. Uh, and I understand why that is the case, but it, it does result in a group of people who aren't necessarily the best informed. Uh, that being said, uh, I agree with the idea that, uh, uh, that people who are on the ASIP should have no conflict of interest. Pardon? I would, uh, the, the videographer was kindly advising me not to um, keep smacking my mic. Uh, that's uh, pinned to my tie. Um, gotcha. La last question on, on, on this. Are you aware that, the report, that this report by the U.S. House of Representative Committee on Government Reform concluded that ASIP, quote, reflects, quote, a system where the government officials make crucial decisions affecting American children without the advice and consent of the governed? I'm not aware of that report, and... Um I'll give you a uh, I um, do not agree with it. Oh, I'm gonna. Oh, well. There are nine. <clears throat> 
Uh, I'm going to hand you what's being marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 9. Um, happy to provide you a copy as well after the deposition that you can take home with you. No, my, I, I will um, be interested in uh, reading this, uh, but I would say um, two things. One is that um, CDC certainly recently has le lent over backwards uh, to try to um, avoid people with conflicts of interest being on ACIP. And second, that ACIP meets under uh, public conditions. That is to say, uh, the meeting is open to the public, uh, the meeting is on the web, uh, so that uh, thousands of people literally can um, observe what goes on at, at the meeting and decide for themselves whether or not uh, there is any hanky-panky. Uh, so uh, although, as I said before, I might wish that people with more knowledge about vaccines be on the ACIP, uh, by and large, uh, I think that they, they do a hell of a good job uh, under uh, public scrutiny. Are the working groups, do that, are those also public? Um, they are not public in the sense that um, the public does not attend the working group. Uh, the working group does report back to the, um, f to the full ACIP and the working group's presentations are uh, presented publicly. But the discussions that the working groups have in conference calls leading up to ACIP meetings, those are not transcribed, are they? They are not, no. Right. And, and, the, and the members and individuals who participate in those working groups, right, which often lead to what the ACIP then rubber stamps, are permitted to have all forms and do have all forms of conflicts with industry, don't they? They, they may, uh, but I would contest the word rubber stamp. I've never seen the ACIP rubber stamp a working group recommendation. Uh, often it's just the opposite. Mm -hmm. you've, also, mm -hmm. you've also said that, um, that the meetings are available to the public. Um, you've attended, you said, almost every ACIP meeting, correct? Correct. Since, what was it, the 60s? Uh, yeah, roughly, yes. And you attended the most recent one as well? Um, the most recent one being, um, let's see, that would have been last October. Uh, yes, I did. Did. Mm -hmm. You presented anything at that meeting? <laughs> um, I presented the fact that I will no longer attend the meetings. Were you presented anything by the ACIP? Committee. Yes. I what was, were you presented? I was present. Well, I was um, told that there is a gavel uh, with my name on it that it will be um, used henceforth at the meetings. And they gave. It. So, f going forward, from this point forward, the gavel that's used at ASIP will have your name on it. Correct. <clears throat> you gave a speech at that meeting, correct? Yes. When they posted the video of that meeting on the internet, did they include your speech, Dr. Plotkin? I don't know, but I suppose uh, they did. Uh, I, uh, well, I, uh, you can check after this deposition on the website and see if your speech is there. Um, I, I, we have not been able to find it. Um, and really? Now, wow. regularly Too at bad. ACIP meetings, you get up and speak, correct? I often do, yes. Yeah, so you're given free, you're able to get up pretty much at any time and speak, aren't you? Yes. Um, you don't have to wait for the public comment period, correct? Correct. And that's also true of vaccine manufacturers. They also are permitted to get up and come to the mic and speak, even not when there isn't public uh, um, 
Yes, they are often asked to answer questions that are being discussed. Isn't it true that they also get up and come to the front to speak even when not asked a question? They may do so if they have, if, if it's a discussion about one of their products. Uh -huh. But if members of the public want to speak, they have to wait till the public speaking period, correct? Uh, normally, yes. Okay. And the, when the videos are released, a lot of the conversations that occur between the pharmaceutical representatives and ASIP, do those also make it to the video that's released publicly? As far as I know, the, the video uh, contains all of the uh, public hearings. In other words, uh, if somebody comes to the mic, uh, they are photographed. And uh, as far as I know, uh, they appear on the web. I, I must say that um, since I've been attending the meetings, I haven't really uh, watched them, uh, but I will. Um, in February when they meet again. So apart from the working groups that, that occur out of public site, uh, what other, what other uh, meetings or, or, or goings about uh, does ASIP engage in that's outside of the scrutiny of the public? Aside from working groups, I'm not aware that they do have anything that's not uh, public. I suppose they meet at lunchtime, um, and I don't attend those discussions, but uh, that's all I know. Um, billions of dollars worth of rotavirus vaccine have been sold to date, correct? I believe so. I'm not acquainted with the sales figures. Uh, does vaccination create a systemic change in the body? V vaccination uh, ch uh, creates a change in the immune system of the body. Okay. Is that supposed to be system-wide? Meaning, if I get vaccinated in my arm, but I'm infected in my toe, am I supposed to still be immune? <laughs> Y yes. Okay. So would you say, is it correct to say that vaccination is intended to create a systemic change in the body, throughout the body? It's intended to create a systemic change in the immune system of the body. Okay. In the immune system everywhere in the body? The immune system is expressed everywhere in the body, yes. The immune system consists of uh, antibody producing cells and cells that are able to influence other cells. So the, can you read back the last answer? Question, the immune system is expressed everywhere in the body, yes. The immune system consists of antibody producing cells and cells that are able to influence other cells. Okay. Does the immune system comprised of more than antibody producing cells? It also uh, has uh, also includes what are called T cells that are able to kill infected cells, uh, for example, um, uh, and to um, uh, secrete substances that also have an effect on the immunity. Okay. And that, that, is that referred to typically as cellular immunity? Yes. And the, and the immunity conferred by vaccines that you were talking about earlier is called humor, I, humor, I, humoral immunity, yes. Thank you, I appreciate that. Humoral immunity. Yes. Okay. So humoral immunity creates antibodies, um, and it's called humoral because it originates from the bones, is that? kind of where the name derives from? Well, the name <laughs> I don't know. derives from the ancient term humors, uh, but uh, uh -huh. in, in effect it, it means uh, antibodies that circulate throughout the body and can um, impact uh, against infecting organisms. Okay. 
and the systemic change that we've that you've described as supposed to last years, if not a lifetime, correct? Yes. From vaccination? Yes. <clears throat> when you say interact with other cells, mm -hmm. um, when you say that the immunity created by vaccine creates antibodies which then interact with other cells, can you describe that a bit more? What do you mean by interact with other cells? Well, this, the, the, the T cells, as I said, uh, are able to um, attack infected cells in the body uh, by a variety of, of mechanisms. They may actually directly kill those infected cells um, uh, by direct action, as it were, or by secreting substances that c can kill the cells. Uh, and th they also um, uh, influence um, um, cells to respond to, to the infection uh, so that the infection doesn't continue to spread and, um, and impact on the, on the individual's health. And how do the cells, uh, how do the cells respond to the infection? Can you describe that? You mean um, the the patient's own cells? I mean, I, th it, I, th I thought that's what you were referring to in, in your explanation. Yeah, the the T. Uh, the you are, do you mean the infected cells or the T cells that are acting on the infected cells? <coughs> we'll start with the T cells. Well, the T cells, as I've said, have a variety of, of functions. They can secrete substances that. Uh, that will kill an, an infected cell, uh, or they can influence uh, actually the antibody-producing system. They they have uh, impacts on um, uh, on a, a variety of ways in which the body protects itself uh, against infection. Uh, there are uh, cells called natural killer cells, for example, that. Mm -hmm. Uh, that can uh, help uh, protect an individual against an infection, and the T cells can influence the natural killer cells. So it's a, a complicated uh, system uh, by which the um, uh, body responds to an infection uh, or to a vaccine, uh, which allows the individual cells to be ready uh, for uh, infection if it occurs. Mm -hmm. Modern immunology, though, doesn't fully understand that full cascade, correct? I'm sorry? I said modern medicine, modern immunology, does not fully understand the complete sequence of events um, in terms of going from vaccination to immunity, correct? <laughs> well, uh, science never completely understands anything, but we know a great deal about how the body responds to vaccines uh, uh, or to infection, uh, and that knowledge is, is growing every, every day. Uh, so, uh, of course, we don't completely understand uh, anything, uh, including how the sun works, but that doesn't prevent us from using knowledge. What about its effects on other body systems? Um, can creating this immune response also have effects not only on creating antibodies to target cells that have been infected, but can it also have other bodily changes, other effects that are either known or unknown? Well, that's such a hypothetical question. I'm not sure how to, how to answer it. Um, is a, an immunized individual any different than an unimmunized individual? Uh, yes. Uh, does the fact that the individual is uh, immune uh, have an effect on his or her general health? Um, I not aware that that's the case. Um, uh, it, it, remember that vaccines are in effect mimicking 
what happens after natural infections in, in many cases, uh, w but uh, w without uh, 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 causing the complete range of, of uh, disease uh, that, the, that the organism uh, causes. So vaccines are just nothing more than a piece of the virus or bacteria? Is that it? Is that all they contain? It depends on the vaccine. Um, the, um, uh, that is to say whether it's a live vaccine or, or a killed vaccine. The killed vaccines uh, may only have uh, small parts of uh, the organism that they're protecting against. Uh, the uh, live vaccines uh, contain the, the whole organisms but altered so that they don't cause disease. Before vaccines are licensed, uh, they go through clinical trials to confirm their safety, right? Correct. Okay. These clinical trials assess if, if there are any harms caused. Sorry. sorry. These clinical trials assess if there are any harms caused by the vaccine, correct? Yes. Was the, DTT, the DTP vaccine withdrawn from the U.S. market? The whole cell. The DTP pertussis wholesale. vaccines uh, have been withdrawn, yes. Right. Because of safety concerns, right? Uh, because they cause significant uh, fever uh, and um, uh, convulsions, uh, febrile seizures, uh, and um, they were, it was decided that it would be better to have a pertussis vaccine that didn't cause that type of reaction. So they were um, taken off the market, not because they were um, not working, uh, quite the opposite, uh, but because of uh, safety concerns. Now, I do have to point out that uh, aside from the U.S. and Europe, uh, whole cell pertussis vaccines are still used in the vast majority of countries in the world okay. and they are getting along just fine with those vaccines. Are you familiar with Peter Abe, Dr. Peter Abe? Yes, of course. Didn't he recently publish a paper in which he looked at children who received DTP vaccine in the first six months of life versus children who received no vaccines in the first six months of life and found that those that received DTP died at a rate of 10 times that? of the unvaccinated? Uh, I don't remember the exact figures, but you have to take into account that Peter Abbey, I, I have um, had many discussions with Peter Abbey. Uh, Peter Abbey's work is done in a, a non-placebo controlled ways. That is, his studies are observational. Uh, second point is that those studies have been uh, examined more than once by World Health Organization committees, and uh, their judgment has been that uh, the effects of the pertussis vaccine in particular are uh, not uh, sufficiently documented to be uh, acceptable or to change vaccination practice. So WHO does not recommend against the use of whole cell pertussis vaccines, quite the opposite. Uh, they do recommend them. You said non-placebo controlled. What do you mean? I mean that uh, essentially what Peter does, and I'm not criticizing him because obviously it is very difficult uh, to do, but uh, he doesn't have randomly vaccinated or, or children who randomly receive pertussis vaccine or don't receive pertussis vaccine. What he has is he follows children who have received this or that or the other vaccine and uh, tries to draw conclusions uh, from uh, what he sees. But in the absence of a random administration, uh, you don't know for sure whether it's the vaccine or other factors that are operating. So in the study that I mentioned to you, if, if this if there, if the children were either that were the exposed to DTP and unexposed were randomized, that would make the study valid. Yes. Okay. 
And again, the WHO has at least twice gone over Peter's studies mm. and has uh, decided that they are not of, of sufficient proof uh, to change their recommendations. Do you have a copy of those reports from the WHO? Oh, gosh. Because I'm going to make a demand for those WHO reports. Do you remember when those reports were came out? Oh, within recent years. I don't don't remember the year. More than a year ago? Uh, probably yes. Okay. Peter Abe's study just came out last year. Well, I imagine WHO will reconsider them. But 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 his studies um, um, suggesting that. Uh, uh, pertussis uh, may uh, vaccine may increase mortality have been around for a while uh, not the first study that, that, that he's done uh, and um, also one has to uh, appreciate the, um, uh, the 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 context uh, by that I mean that he's also shown uh, or attempted to show that live vaccines uh, like measles vaccine has a very positive effect on uh, mortality. In other words, that uh, in, in his observations, those who receive measles vaccine uh, suffer f from fewer diseases in general and have a lower m mortality. And uh, that effect uh, has actually uh, been confirmed uh, immunologically. Uh, so um, one has to look at the whole context of things. That is to say, his, his data are, are not uh, anti-vaccine data. His, his data uh, r relate to the possibility that uh, vaccines uh, have uh, uh, effects beyond the specific disease that they're designed mm -hmm. for. So you agree with his findings regarding live vaccines? Uh, I agree because, uh, as I've said and as I uh, advised him uh, years ago, uh, that he has to uh, find some immunological correlate to his findings or otherwise they're, they're not believable. Mm -hmm. And what's happened is that scientists uh, not working with Peter uh, have looked at measles uh, vaccination and have shown that uh, the, the vaccine has effects on um, what I referred to as natural killer cells before, uh, and that um, uh, they do seem to reduce mortality against uh, other uh, diseases. So, um, you know, science works that way. Uh, one um, scientist does not uh, uh, gain acceptance for his findings unless they are re repeated elsewhere and unless they are consistent with uh, the entire range of facts, not, not just uh, mm -hmm. uh, single ones. Peter Abe is a re respected researcher, correct? I'm sorry? Is a respected researcher. He's a respected researcher. He, uh, I respect him. Um, uh, just as I respect many other scientists who are attempting to find out things that we don't know yet. Um, <clears throat> In conducting pre-licensure clinical trials for vaccines, what is the difference between solicited and unsolicited reactions? Well, solicited reactions means that you ask uh, the vaccinee whether he's had X, Y, or Z unsolicited uh, are, uh, reactions that the patient reports uh, to the investigator uh, without um, being specifically questioned about them. Okay. And who decides what gets put on the solicited list and what's... Who decides get what, what um, symptoms get put on the solicited list? of reactions? Well, generally the investigator, however, 
uh, one has to take into account that uh, the uh, companies meet with FDA uh, during the development of vaccines and that FDA basically uh, has to approve uh, the protocols. And so if uh, FDA uh, thinks that a particular reaction uh, should be measured, uh, they will tell the, uh, the investigators to uh, include them. But, it, but the list is created by the pharmaceutical company developing the vaccine? In the first instance, yes, and then okay. approved by the FDA. Okay. Let's take a, uh, take a two-minute break. Does that sound good? We are going off the record. The time is 11.50. I just have to use the restroom. In the deposition of Stanley Plotkin, we are on the record. The time is 12.37. Okay. <clears throat> Dr. Plotkin, earlier you... You testified that there are two Hep B vaccines in the market, one uh, by Glaxo, GSK, that's Endrix B, and the other one is by Merck, Recombivax HB, right? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> For Recombivax HB, how long was the safety review period in the pre-licensure clinical trial for this vaccine? I don't know. Dr. Plock, I'm going to hand you what's been labeled Plaintiff's Exhibit 10. Sent it? Okay. Um, this is the product, the manufacturer insert for Recombivax HB, correct? Yes. And the clinical trial experience would be found in Section 6.1, correct? Correct? Dr. Plotkin? Yes. Okay. Uh, in Section 6.1, when you look at the clinical trials that were done pre-licensure for Comavax HB, how long does it say that safety was monitored after each dose? Uh, let's see. Uh, five days. Is five days long enough to detect adverse reactions that occur after five days? Uh, no, they would, be, they would be reported uh, separately um, as observed in the clinic. Mm -hmm. uh, in Section 6.1 of the manufacturer insert, which under the Code of Federal Relations, they're supposed to describe the clinical trial, does it provide for anything other than five days of monitoring after each dose for adverse events? Uh, it does not specifically say that, no. Okay. Is five days long enough to detect an autoimmune issue that arises after five days? Uh, no. Is five days long enough to detect a seizure that arises after five days? <clears throat> okay. Um, it would be unlikely to have a seizure occur after five days. Okay. Is five days long enough to detect any neurological disorder that arose from va the vaccine after five days? No. Okay. Are, was there any control group in this trial? Let me uh, rephrase that. There is, no, there is no control group, correct? Um, not, let's see. Well, they mention um, 3,258 doses were administered to 1,252 healthy adults. That's right. But does it mention any control group, Dr. Plotkin? Uh, it does not mention any control group, no. No. If you turn to Section 6.2...
What is the list of, of a adverse reactions listed in, in this section? These are reports of adverse reactions okay. uh, that uh, likely were reported to the VAR system. Um, under immune system disorders, um, does it say that there were reports of hypersensitive reactions, including anaphylactic, anaphylactoid reactions, bronchospasms, and urticaria having been reported within the first few hours after vaccination? Yes. Does it, it, have there been reports of hypersensitivity syndrome? Yes, that's what it states. Uh, does it, reports of arthritis? Um, it is mentioned. Okay. It also reports uh, autoimmune diseases, including systemic lupus, uh, erythematosis, lupus-like syndrome, vasculitis, and polyteritis nodosa as well, correct? Uh, yes, that's what okay. it states. And also it states that um, under the nervous system disorders, it states that um, after that, there have been reports of Guillain-Barre syndrome, correct? Yes. As well as multiple sclerosis, exacerbation of multiple sclerosis, myelitis, including transverse myelitis, mm -hmm. seizure, febrile seizure, peripheral neuropathy, including Bell's palsy, radiculopathy. Radiculopathy. Thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, muscle weakness. Hypothesia and encephalitis, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, um, now before, you, the top, before you go on, I'll, these reports are required to be included because they have been reported to the authorities as happening after vaccination. That is not proof that the vaccine caused those reactions because things happen to people all the time, uh, uh, whether or not they've been vaccinated. And uh, as I said, the company is required to report these. Now, I mention that specifically because multiple sclerosis, for example, is mentioned here. Multiple sclerosis has been studied in relation to hepatitis B vaccine, and there's no relationship, no causal relationship. So the fact that these, these things are in the package circular does not mean that the vaccine necessarily caused the, uh, the stated um, uh, phenomenon. When you say that multiple sclerosis has been studied and is determined to not have been caused, you're talking about the 2011 IOM report, I assume? Uh, I'm talking about studies mostly done in, in, in France where um, the uh, situation arose uh, where there was a con concern about that. You're aware of the 2011 IOM report that looked at certain vaccines in relation to whether they can cause certain adverse reactions? Yes. Okay, are you aware that one of the conditions they looked at was multiple sclerosis? The, the, among others, yes. Among others, and that, they, and that they specifically looked at it with regards to hepatitis B? Yes. And do you know what their finding was? Uh, I don't remember the exact wording, no. Yeah. There, Maybe this will remind you, inadequate to accept or reject a causal relationship. They didn't yes. know, correct? Yes, but you, you have to understand, first of all, that science continues, and so studies continue. And secondly, that the IOM specifically decided that they would not draw a conclusion if they weren't sure of the conclusion. So what, what that statement means is that they don't have data that confirm
that multiple sclerosis is caused by the hepatitis B vaccine, and they and they but that they don't regard that they have enough data to positively exclude it. So you cannot read that as saying that multiple sclerosis is caused by hepatitis B vaccine. I I never said that. Um, the IOM did, for some of the uh, vaccines and adverse reactions, did conclude that it favors rejection of a causal relationship, correct? Yes, that's it, correct. It didn't reach, sorry, it didn't reach that conclusion for hepatitis B and multiple sclerosis, correct? Uh, it, did, uh, it did not reach that conclusion, okay. but other data suggests that that conclusion is warranted, that there is no uh, relationship. Okay. Uh, do you, well, I'll make a demand for that. You can produce that after uh, this deposition. Um, just keep in mind all the things. Um, so, what would need to be done to, in order to know whether or not any of these reported conditions are caused by the vaccine? What you would need is a properly randomized, as you said earlier, placebo-controlled study, correct? Correct. Okay. And the, the, also, uh, uh, I would point out that multiple sclerosis is a disorder of adults, uh, and uh, the uh, issue that arose in France was related to vaccination of adults. Okay. Uh, there, um, uh, that, that does not mean that it would be an issue, even if it were an issue, uh, for children. Dr. Pollack, and I, 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 I was just asking what, what it mm -hmm. says on there. There's lots of conditions listed. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that multiple sclerosis is caused by this. I'm just asking you if it's listed on Section 6.2. In fact, we can even read the top of Section 6.2, which says the following additional adverse reactions have been reported uh, with the use of the marketed vaccine. Because these reactions are reported voluntarily from a population of uncertain size, it is not possible to reliably estimate their frequency or establish a causal relationship to a vaccine exposure, right? Correct. Okay. So that's what it says right at the top of 6.2. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, but these are uh, events that are reported after vaccination. And, and as you just, we've just discussed, in order to establish whether it's causal between the vaccine and the condition, you need a randomly, a, a randomized, placebo-controlled study. But yes. that was not done for the hep this hepatitis B vaccine before licensure, was it? No. Okay. <clears throat> and given that the vaccine now appears on the CDC's recommended list, isn't it true that it would now be considered unethical to conduct such a study today? Um. It would be, yes, yeah, it yeah. would be ethically difficult. Okay, so let, let's take a look at uh, uh, Ngerex B. Uh, that's the other hepatitis B uh, vaccine that you're testified you recommend Faith received. Um, do you know how long adverse reactions were um, reviewed after each dose of that vaccine in the pre licensure clinical trial? Not offhand, no. I'm going to hand you what has been marked Plaintiff's Exhibit 11. This is the manufacturer insert for the Endrex B, correct? Yes. Okay. If you turn to Section 6.1, which is tri Clinical Trials Experience, can you please tell me how long the safety review period was in the pre-licensure clinical trials um, after each dose. Um, all subjects were monitored for uh, four days post-administration. 
that does not necessarily mean that they didn't collect reactions after four days. Are you, are you claiming they collected reactions after four days but didn't disclose it here in violation of the Code of Federal Regulations? I dare say that they collected uh, putative reactions for a longer period. I, um, I feel quite uh, positive about that. Uh, when they say they were monitored for four days, that means uh, a active monitoring as opposed to um, uh, collecting reports later on. Uh -huh. That is not uncommon in, in clinical trials. Uh -huh. Is four days long enough to detect an autoimmune issue that arises after four days? No. Or a neurological disorder that arises after four days? No, okay. that would be reported later. Uh huh. And can you provide any proof that there was any reports or follow-up after those four days? Uh, well, it doesn't say that here, but I um, am willing to bet that uh, they did uh, collect uh, reactions after four days, and I imagine that the FDA would not have allowed them not to do that. But as you sit here today, that's just speculation, correct? Yes, that's speculation based on experience. I'm going to make a request for you to provide proof of what you're claiming, that there was actually for both hepatitis B vaccines um, any safety review that occurred after four days of administration of any dose of these vaccines. Well, well, again, I'm going to continue the objection, I guess, from last time since we took a longer break. There's a proper procedure to request documents and discovery. He doesn't have to come back and produce it. I, I, the objection's noted. Thank you. Okay. So, um, and there was, no, there was no placebo group, correct? Um, in the 13,000, in the trial of, at the top where it talks about 13,000 doses being administered. Uh, it does not say that there was a control group. I don't know. I'd have to go back and look at the study. Uh -huh. And do you believe, so you think there, but you're just speculating that there might have been a control group? There, there well m might have been. It is not unusual uh, uh, for, for controls to be included, especially if, uh, if you're looking at reactions. Uh, but I, I don't know specifically for this study. Uh-huh. All right. Well, if, if you're claiming there might have been a control group, then uh, please do provide support for that because as far as I understand, the manufacturer, and this was, uh, who makes NGRXP? Glaxo? Glaxo. One of, one of your clients. Um, if there was a, um, a control group, they needed to have disclosed that. Um, and I assume they're not disclosing it because there was none. Um, uh, well, doc, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, doctor. I, I, all right. Go ahead. All right. Um, Miss Newsom, are you still there? Yeah, my headset died, but I called back in, so I, didn't, okay. I don't think I missed much. We're still going over the answer. So let's go back to section, now section 6.2 on this uh, uh, manufacturer insert for NDREXB. It talks about the post marking experience for, for this vaccine. Um, this one lists for immune disorders, immune system disorders that were reported, a, a, whole, a whole number of them, correct? Mm -hmm. And it also lists a number of nervous system disorders, including encephalitis, encephalopathy, migraine, multiple sclerosis, neuritis, mm -hmm. neuropathy, parathesia. Uh, I'll, ask, I'll ask the question all the way at the end. Guillain-Barre syndrome, Bell's palsy optic neuritis, paralysis, paresis, seizures, syncope, and transverse myelitis. Correct? Mm -hmm. It lists all of those? Yes. Okay. Um, but to know whether or not these are actually caused by NDREXB, again, you would need a properly random, randomized um, placebo-controlled study, correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, but this study wasn't done pre-licensure for this vaccine, right? Um, I'd have to go back and, and look at the original studies, um, but 
the, these data undoubtedly refer not only to the uh, study that was done before licensure, but also to phenomena reported after licensure. That's 6.2, right. Okay, and, and again, given that this vaccine now appears on the CDC's recommended list, it would be unethical to do a, a randomized, placebo-controlled study um, of this vaccine, right? Uh, in children, it would be unethical. It could be done in adults. Okay, now, if you could please go to page 11 of this same um, manufacturer insert for the hepatitis B. If you take a look over there, I think you'll find that it provides that there was a follow-up with regard to efficacy, mm -hmm. not safety, efficacy, um, that was beyond the four days. Yes. Do you see there that there was a 12-month and an 18-month follow-up? Yes. Okay. So just to be clear, efficacy, was, efficacy of the vaccine was followed up for at least 12 months, for 18 months, uh, but safety was only done for four or five days. I do not agree with that statement. Okay. I, I do believe that GSK, like any other company, would have followed their patients much longer than four days and would have collected reaction data. And if they didn't do that, you would agree that that is completely inadequate in terms of assessing safety pre-licensure? I would say that would be inadequate, yes. <clears throat> do you agree with the CDC's recommendation that babies receive a hepatitis B on the first day of life? Yes. And these are the Endrex B and Recombivax, H HB, are the only two hepatitis B vaccines approved for one-day-old babies, correct? Correct. Okay. And why is and that, and you may ask? It you, is because if the baby is I, I not vaccinated, well, I'm telling you that if a baby is not vaccinated <laughs> at one day of age, transmission may occur from an, in, an infected mother and hepatitis B occurring in yeah. babies is likely to become chronic and to cause serious disease later in life. Okay. That's why the dose is given at one day of age. I, I'm not, I wasn't asking you any questions about efficacy or but why it's done. But I'm telling you why it's well, given. Well, thank you, but obviously I'm, I'm just trying, like any product, obviously you wanna have informed consent, understand the risks and the benefits, and I'm just trying to understand what was done pre-licensure for these vaccines, and I think you've, you've explained that to me. One of the things you've, you've said in the past, and I believe, is that without a clinical trials, without a control group in a clinical trial, you're in la-la land, right? You said that one time, do you recall? Without a control group, if you're looking for uh, a phenomenon occurring in the vaccine group, you cannot judge that phenomenon without having a control group. Okay. Um, there's only one standalone polio vaccine currently licensed in the United States, correct? Uh, well, the, uh, as far as licensure, I think both oral and inactivated vaccines are licensed, but the only one that is used in the U.S. currently is the inactivated one. IPV? Yes. Right. And there's only one comp Sanofi, there's only one iPol by Sanofi, correct? Yes. Okay. A vaccine you strike that. Um, Um, how long was the safety review for each dose of IPOL in the preclinical pre trials for that vaccine? I do not know offhand, but uh, Counselor, uh, IPV has been used throughout the world for years in millions of people, mm -hmm. and safety data have been collected on, uh, on m many such studies and the essentially serious reactions to IPV are extremely r rare. 
So uh, IPV is, is, a, is a very safe uh, vaccine. I'm asking you in the, pre, in the pre-licensure clinical trial for... That goes back to Jonas Salk. Okay. Where he, or what he, where millions of children actually were vaccinated with IPV mm -hmm. back in the 50s. And is there a clinical trial data on safety? Yes. Okay, and is that the same vaccine that's used today? Yes. Are you prepared to produce that clinical data? Yeah. Those data are in this book. And I'll be glad to provide you with the, the references if you really uh, insist. But uh, IPV, as I've said, has been used in millions and millions of people. If it's so safe, then how come the safety review period for the pre-licensure clinical trial as provided in the manufacturer insert for IPOL only reviewed safety for 48 hours? <laughs> Once again, I have no doubt that safety observations were made after 48 hours, but they expected that immediate reactions such as a sore arm or, or, uh, or fainting or something like that would have happened within 48 hours. And, uh, and also, uh, I'm sure that they're talking about their own uh, specific production of IPV uh, and uh, not re relying on the millions of uh, other uh, uh, people who have been vaccinated with IPV. I'm going to hand you um, what's been marked as Exhibit 12. This is the manufacturer insert for the IPOL, poliovirus vaccine inactivated. If you could please turn uh, well, so, uh, to section 6.1, Dr. Plotkin. Well, this is an older one. If you could turn to uh, the <coughs> adverse reactions, which is on page 12, and this 14. This preserves the objection. To my understanding, Dr. Plotkin had no role in the study design. You're asking him to speculate as to the reasoning of other people that he had no contact with. Okay. Uh, he's, he's testifying that, that, that my client should receive this vaccine. I can certainly ask him about the pre licensure clinical trials that were done to assess its safety. And you well, put him up no as an expert in, in vaccinology. But your objection is noted and preserved for the record. Thank you, Counselor. Um, Okay, so if you go to page 14, Dr. Plotkin, how long mm -hmm. does it say that, um, that adverse reactions were observed after vaccination? Uh, 48 hours. Okay. And did the, did the gr subject group that received IPV only receive IPV, or did they receive another vaccine along um, with it? Uh, concurrently with DTP. Uh-huh. And what did the control group receive? I don't see that stated. If, if, if DTP is given along with IPV, how could you know whether a reaction was caused by DTP or IPV? Uh, you could not. Okay. <clears throat> um, if you... However, they do say these systemic reactions were comparable in frequency and severity to that reported for DTP given alone without IPV. And DTP was the vaccine we talked about earlier that was withdrawn from the market, correct? For yes. safety issues. Okay. Um, there's only, the only MMR vaccine available in the United States are made by Merck, correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, how long was the safety review? Do you know how long the safety review period for each dose of MMR in the pre licensure clinical trials for this vaccine? I'm sorry, say it again, Councilor. I'm so sorry. No, no problem. Do you know how long the safety review period for each dose of MMR in the pre licensure clinical trial was for this vaccine? Uh, not uh, offhand, 
Uh, the vaccine has only been used now for about 50 years. Okay. So it's, it's, for, it's more recent, right? So. Dr. Plock, I'm going to hand you what's been marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 13. This is the manufacturer insert for MMR2, correct? Yes. Okay. If you go to the if you go to the precaution section. I'm sorry, the adverse reaction section, I apologize. On page six. What you'll find is that there was no clinical trial prior to licensure for MMR, correct? I doubt very much that's the, the case. It's, you're not aware that it's, a, is it, are you aware that it is a grandfathered product? I am not aware of this grandfather. I was uh, uh, alive and well when the product was first licensed, and it was tested extensively before it was licensed. So, so to say that it hasn't been tested is absolute nonsense. How come there is no clinical trial data in the manufacturer insert? Uh, that is something that the FDA would have decided isn't necessary. Hmm. Are you willing but to we, We're talking about a vaccine that's been given to millions of children. And uh, just um, uh, I, I insist on, on, on uh, this point, that measles is now a relatively rare disease in the United States because most children Dr. receive uh, measles uh, MMR vaccine. That, however, in the last, since 2000, uh, because of um, uh, uh, children who, a, have, who have not been vaccinated, there have been five cases of measles, I'm sorry, 24 cases of measles encephalitis and three deaths caused by measles itself. Dr. So Plank, we, and I, I, we're, we'll get to that piece of this, yeah. and, but right now I'm trying to talk to you about the pre-licensure clinical safety. Okay, and what I'm done. telling and, you is that you millions to, of doses have been that. used of this vaccine. I understand you want And to that there the was pre-licensure trials, okay. which, which, which I am absolutely confident about. Okay. And you're talking about stuff that's in a package circular that the FDA has, has approved in full knowledge that uh, safety and efficacy uh -huh. have been demonstrated. So you're saying there were clinical trials before the MMR was licensed? Absolutely. Is that okay, and you can provide those? You can find them in this book if you wish. Uh -huh. So you're saying you won't provide them? Uh, I, I'm, well, yes, I guess I am saying I won't provide them. If you want to take the trouble, uh, read the book. Okay, so sitting here today, when did these, can you tell me what year these clinical yes, trials occurred? Yes, they were done in the, in the 1960s and the 19, uh, yes, the, okay. mainly in the 1960s. So you're claiming something happened, but you're not willing to provide any proof that it happened? The proof is in the publications, which you okay, can, can read. Okay, can you please turn to the page where it's, where it's in there? I'd like to note for the record that Dr. Plotkin has been reading from his notes as well as looking through a, a book entitled Plotkin Vaccines, 7th Edition. So on um, pages, let's see, uh, 
uh, between pages 592 and 600, including tables that show the antibody responses, proportion of ch uh, children with fever and rash after measles vaccine, uh, et cetera, uh, and the numerous references which uh, go with this chapter. So, which, so are you saying that that was a pre-licensure clinical trial yes. that you just read from? Yes, but again, I insist that pre-licensure or post-licensure, the fact remains that the vaccine has been studied extensively over a period I, I, of 50 years. I know, I understand you want, you want us to just take your word for it, but I prefer to rely on science, peer-reviewed publications, That's and what you'll find trials. in there. And so, you know, I understand yeah. that you're getting a little upset about me trying to ask for the data, but, you know, that, that, that sh I'm just trying to get to the substance, the FDA, I, it requires that clinical trials be on the insert, they're not here, okay? So let's, you're saying that this table, and let me take a look at it. This would have been post-licensure, not pre-licensure, and it doesn't indicate a placebo group. Um, nor that it was, so I'm not, this is not a clinical trial as far as I can tell. Do you have a, can you point me to something that had a placebo group and was pre-licensure, please, sir? Uh, I'm not sure of the placebo group. I would have to go back and look at the individual studies. But in, in terms of, um, uh, of uh, pre-licensure studies, I am, um, absolutely certain that they were, were done uh, when the measles, the rubella vaccine that I developed was incorporated into MMR. Obviously, clinical trials were done uh, before licensure, and I'm absolutely certain about that. Well, maybe they're not included because they didn't include a placebo group. So they they were not may considered... not have included placebo groups. So yes. maybe they weren't deemed valid and, and, and enough to, to consider a clinical trial. That's absolutely f false because you can I'm certainly collect reactions in uh, individuals who receive the vaccine, for example, fever and seizures and that sort of thing that happen uh, immediately. Um, uh, and... Um, uh, and whether there's a, an effect on um, blood cells, et cetera, uh, those things were, were, were definitely done. I, I'm absolutely certain of, of, about that because I was there. But there was no control group? I don't remember there being a control group for the studies that I'm recalling. So, you don't, so you're not aware of any trial that assessed safety in MMR with a control group, correct? I cannot cite such a study offhand. I'd have to go back and uh, look to see whether, uh, whether control groups were in included. Okay. I, I'm just, I, you know, we, we, we talked earlier that you know, to assess safety, you need a randomized placebo-controlled study. And um, my understanding from looking at this insert is that no such study exists. You told me that it's in this chapter, and you assured me it's in there, but you're not citing to anything in there right now. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to get a copy from you if you'd like to provide it after this deposition. Would you like to do I that? I will look. Okay. Going back to page six, there are a there of the manufacturer insert for MMR. There is an extensive list of adverse reactions that have been reported after licensure of this vaccine by individuals receiving the vaccine, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not going to read through all the ones in the, because it's, page and a half long, but they are, they're extensive. Um, uh, so, and, and of course, we won't know 
whether or not MMR actually causes any of these unless we have a randomized placebo-controlled study, correct? Correct. And when I say these, I mean all the adverse reactions listed in the manufacturer insert for MMR on page 6, 7, and 8, right? You understood that's what I meant? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, l l let me ask you this. Yeah. Look, l listen, l let me ask you this. M maybe you can help clarify, okay? Um, I'm sorry. I'll leave that alone for you. Uh, you also testified um, that Faith should be vaccinated for Hib, correct? Yes. Okay. Do you know how long the safety review period was for each dose of ACT-Hib in the pre-licensure clinical trials for this vaccine? Not offhand, no. I'm going to hand you uh, what's been marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 14, Dr. Plotkin. Um, um, this is the ma manufacturer insert for ACTIB, correct? Yes. Okay. If we go to Section 6.1, which is the clinical trials experience, um, I believe you'll see it addresses a number of clinical trials that were performed, correct? Yes. Okay. And what were the safety review periods in these trials? Um, uh, 48 hours uh, for, uh, yes. Okay. Um, Actually, you know, if you turn to page eight, Dr. Clock, and there was, they did one that actually was 30 days long, correct? Uh, say again? I said if you turn to page eight of the insert, one of the clinical trials they did actually did look at, did do a 30 day follow up, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, Now I'm going to read. I'm going to read you uh, a sentence from the paragraph at the bottom of that page. It says, "In study P3206, within 30 days following any dose one through three of Daptacel plus Ipol plus Actib vaccinees, okay, 50 of 1,455. That's 3.4%. Mm -hmm. Participants experience a serious adverse event. Yes." Right? Um, now, if uh, one way to establish whether there or not those adverse events were related to the vaccine was, was to have a placebo group, a control group receiving an inert substance, correct? That's one way. That's right. But there wasn't a control group here receiving an inert substance, correct? Uh, as far as it says, no. All right. Um, and... Uh, the control group here received other vaccines, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and well, so... Well, actually, there does appear to be... Well, that for dose four, anyway. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, it's, all right. Yeah, it's all right. Yeah, no, I don't do. Anyway. Um, so, since there is no placebo group receiving a, a inert substance, then it's left to the vaccine manufacturer seeking licensure to determine whether or not the 50, the uh, adverse events they, they, uh, uh, that arose 
are or are not related to the vaccine, correct? Generally speaking, studies organized by manufacturers or anybody else for that matter of vaccines has a safety board attached to the study and they evaluate whether they think the uh, reaction was due to the vaccine or not. As it says here, only one of the serious adverse events was attributed to the vaccine, uh, which was a seizure with apnea occurring on the day of vaccination after the first dose, which is, uh, you know, in 7,000 infants, uh, and a vaccine that prevents meningitis and other serious diseases is not too bad. Right. So let's well let's let's look at that more carefully. Um, this is out of the out of 1,455, correct? Yes. And it was 50 children that had a serious adverse event within 30 days, correct? And this they po- they had. Um, let's see, where is that? That's the bottom of page eight. Yes, but you have to understand what is meant by a serious adverse event. They uh, try to accumulate all uh, uh, things that happen to children in a trial. And when they say it's serious, they mean that it's, it's not something like pain in the arm or, or something that's relatively trivial. And then they evaluate whether or not the serious adverse event could be related to the vaccine or not. And what this says is that only one of those events was attributed to the vaccine. That's right. That's exactly what this says. What yes. I'm asking, and, and you told me that the per people that evaluate that is a board set up by the company, the pharmaceutical company seeking approval, correct? Yes, they okay. set up the board and they choose individuals who uh, are not uh, employees of the company. But they choose the individuals, correct? They choose the individuals, okay. yes. Um, in your experience, Dr. Plotkin, in any given 30-day period, do 3.4% of children in this country experience a serious adverse event? Yes, that's quite possible. Okay. In your experience, would you expect 3.4% of children receiving a saline injection to experience a serious adverse event within 30 days of receiving the injection? That's what that means, yes. Okay, so 3.4% every month, uh, that would mean within three years, every child in this country would experience a serious adverse event, correct? Yes, correct, but you have to understand that serious adverse events mean, for example, that a child develops a respiratory infection during the, the period of the trial, and then the question is, could that respiratory infection be attributed to the vaccine? Mm-hmm. And the board decides whether or not it's likely that a vaccine could cause a respiratory infection two or three weeks after the vaccination, for example. Mm-hmm. Wasn't there recently a study out, out of Hong Kong in which it was, a, it was actually one of the few randomized placebo-controlled studies in which some children were randomly got flu vaccine and others didn't get the flu shot? And those that got the flu shot and those who didn't had the same rate of flu, but those who got the flu shot were four times more likely to get certain other respiratory infections? Uh, well, I have not read that uh, particular study. We can, we can get to it later. But um, uh, influenza vaccine is a whole uh, story in itself. Okay. Um, it, that's fine. If you haven't read it, um, that's, you know, we, can, we can get to it. I have it. We'll, we'll come back to it. Um, in... Um, Now, there was also, there's another act, there's another HIB vaccine called Hibarex, right? And then, which was licensed after Act HIB, correct? Yes. And in that clinical trial, they used uh, Act HIB as the placebo to assess safety, correct? Um, If you say so. Okay. All right. Um, the CDC's pediatric schedule you testified earlier also includes vaccination for HPV, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to... Okay. 
I'm going to hand you <clears throat> what's been marked as plaintiff's uh, exhibit 15. Um, and um, sorry, handing to you. The, uh, this is the manufacturer insert for Gardasil, correct? Mm -hmm. Which is a vaccine against HPV? Yes. Gardasil is currently the only HPV vaccine used in the United States. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Gardasil, uh, I'm going to ask you a question unrelated to what I just handed you for a moment while um, uh, my co-counsel here uh, sends a copy to opposing counsel. Um, okay, thank you. So, um, Gardasil is currently the only HPV used in the United States, correct? Uh, I'm not sure whether the GSK vaccine is still being used or, or not, but Gardasil is the one that is, is used mostly in any case. Okay. Um, can you please turn to page 8, table 9? of this insert. Mm -hmm. Okay, this table reflects girls and women nine through 29 years of age who reported an incident condition potentially indicate indicative of a systemic autoimmune disorder during the clinical trial, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, the subjects receiving Gardasil show a rate of 2.3%, um, right? So that means 2.3% mm -hmm. of the girls and women in the clinical trial um, during a six month period um, uh, had an incident that, that indicated a systemic autoimmune disorder, correct? Yes. Okay. And, the, and, in the, and in the AAHS control or saline placebo group, it shows the same rate, correct? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Do you know how many individuals were in the saline placebo group versus the AAHS? S control group? Well, it says 9,412. All right. That would be the total number for both groups, correct? No, for the placebo group. For the placebo group, correct. But some of them received AAHS and some of them received the saline injection, correct? Uh, correct. Okay. Do you know how many received a saline injection over an AAHS injection? Don't know. Okay. Um, let's go to page four, um, and table one is for girls, and table two is for boys. I'm assuming all participants were either girls or boys. If we add up the saline placebo group for the girls and the saline placebo group for the boys, do we get 594? Um, well, I'd have to do the <coughs> arithmetic, okay. but um, three. it appears that um, there were about 5,000, more than 5,000 in the AAHS control, and um, about... 600 in the saline placebo. Right. It's about 594. It's about 600. That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if we go back to page 8. The saline placebo group had five, about 600, and the rest of them were AAH control, correct? Um, apparently, yes. Yeah. What does AAHS stand for? The aluminum adjuvant. Okay. Um, 
and, and I see and it's defined here as amorphous aluminum hydro hydroxyphosphate sulfate right yes all right thank you um which we'll refer to as AAHS uh, or the or the aluminum adjuvant. Yes. Good. Okay. Um, AA, AAHS is not an inert an inert substance, correct? Well, it's not saline, if that's what you mean. But they use it as a control because they are trying to make uh, to determine what the reactions are to the HPV vaccine that contains the uh, aluminum and separating uh, the um, uh, reactions to vaccine from reactions to the aluminum. Make sure I understand that. Are you saying they're trying to determine what the rate of reactions is between the group that gets Gardasil? Yes. With the group that gets the aluminum? Yes. With the group that gets saline? Yes. So the, they want to compare between those three distinct groups, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they did do that in table one and two that we just looked at on page two. Yes. Uh, page four, correct? Yes. Okay. Why is aluminum added to the Gardasil vaccine or any vaccine? To in increase the immunogenicity of the um, active part of the vaccine. If I may, what you mean is that it, it, if I could use a little more layman terms, are you saying it's intended to stimulate the immune system to create antibodies? Yes. Would that be correct? Uh, yes, not by itself, but by enhancing the response to the vaccine antigens. The antigens bind to the aluminum? The, yes. And, they, the, and, and the aluminum is persistent? Yes. In the, and it, it remains in the body such that it continues to present the antigen such that antibodies can be created to it, correct? Well, at least during the immediate period of vaccination, yes. Okay. Um, there is, in fact, a, a syndrome called autoimmune autoinflammatory syndrome induced by adjuvants, correct? Uh, that is a um, debatable point. There was a fellow named Yehuda Schoenfeld, an Israeli who has pushed this idea uh, for many years. Um, as uh, I, I think it's fair to say that he has never uh, had acceptance by the larger community of um, uh, immunologists or um, rheumatologists. Um. I am going to hand you what is being marked. Mm -hmm. you what's being marked as exhibit uh, 16. Yes. Are you familiar with this book? Uh, generally speaking, yes. I can't say I've read it all, no. Okay. Um, and it's entitled Vaccines and Autoimmunity, correct? Yes, correct. Okay. And it extensively discusses, uh, it's, it's a, it, 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 it discusses many autoimmune conditions that the authors believe can be caused yes. by vaccines, and in particular by aluminum adjuvant, correct? Uh, well, I know about it. Aluminum adjuvant. <clears throat> I don't know about particularly uh, uh, aluminum adjuvants, but that's one of their arguments. Okay. Can you please turn to um, uh, the contributors, which starts on um, Roman numeral, little Roman numeral nine? Okay. Uh, keep going. 
a few more pages. There are, um, I think, somewhere around 77 contributors listed here. Um, you said that Yehuda Schoenfeld was kind of alone, I think, um, or something like that, with regard to the claim that of uh, autoimmune, autoinflammatory syndrome induced by adjuvants. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, can you just flip through and look at the universities that are listed here, where these professors, over 70 professors, hail from? Are these respected uh, institutions of medicine around the world? Well, first of all, uh, Counselor, uh, I'd have to go over the CVs of uh, each of the uh, people here. I, you know, I, I don't know what their role is at the universities. Uh, as I said before, Schoenfeld, uh, Schoenfeld, first of all, Schoenfeld himself is not anti-vaccination. I know that for, for a fact. Uh, on the other hand, he, at least one of his co-authors, uh, Tom, Tom Lajenovich, is a well-known anti-vaccination uh, person uh, who's uh, written a lot about how terrible vaccines are. And um, as far as the, the articles uh, are con concerned, uh, you know, I have to re uh, read each one, but for example, uh, vaccination in patients with autoimmune inflammatory rheumatic diseases, in other words, patients who themselves already have uh, autoimmune diseases, that's a, certainly a, uh, a, a, a legitimate um, field of study. In other words, how do you vaccinate people who already have autoimmune disease uh, could their vaccinations make things worse? Uh, but that doesn't um, necessarily mean that the vaccines themselves uh, cause disease. Now, here we have a chapter called Measles, Mumps, and Rubella Vaccine, a triad to autoimmunity, uh, of which Schoenfeld himself is, is one, of the, one of the authors. I am... Um, uh, uh, what shall I say, I do not believe there is any solid evidence that measles, mumps, and rubella vaccines cause uh, autoimmune responses. So, you know, lots of books are published, and a lot of them are absolute bull. Are you and saying that this book is bull? I haven't read the whole thing, but I am uh, almost certain that there's a lot of bull in it, uh -huh. judging from, from the editors. Bef without reading it, right? without reading all of it, yes. Okay. Um, are you familiar with the uh, Tel Aviv Sorowski Medical Center? No. Okay. Um, are you familiar with the University of Paris? University of Paris. The, you know, Paris has many different Universities, uh, they are s sort of numbered. Okay. Um, Familiar with the University of Pisa? Pisa? No. Mm -hmm. well, I'm sure there is a University of Pisa. Okay. Are you familiar with the te Technion, Israel Institute of Technology? Yes. The Rappaport School of Medicine? Mm hmm. I can't tell you one thing because I've talked to Israelis about Schoenfeld and Schoenfeld's opinions are, are not majority opinions even in Israel. But for better or worse, there is a syndrome out there that is called autoimmune autoinflammatory syndrome induced by adjuvants and there but, are apparently professors at universities um, who disagree about uh, the syndrome but it is out there, right? There is, Schoenfels has postulated this syndrome, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's at least 70 professors at universities around the world that are in agreement with that no, syndrome. No, absolutely in not. Okay. I'll bet if you go through that book and talk to them, you, you would find that most of them probably do not agree because all of the articles in this book don't say 
that vaccines cause our autoimmunity. Some of them do. Okay. There has been concern raised that aluminum adjuvants and vaccines can cause autoimmunity. There has been concerns raised, yes. Okay. So if there's been concerns raised um, that aluminum and vaccines can cause autoimmunity, and there's this medical textbook, which we've, I understand your opinion on, <laughs> um, why combine the autoimmunity rate in the aluminum adjuvant control with the autoimmunity rate in the saline placebo? Why not break those out to show them separately? Well, they did to some extent. Uh, but uh, I, I think the, the, re the reasoning was that they wanted to uh, be sure that the reactions that uh, were seen, uh, and let me par parenthetically say that uh, HPV vaccine is painful, and they wanted to be sure that the reactions that they were seeing uh, were not c caused by the, uh, the adjuvant, or uh, that they were specific to the HPV antigens themselves and, and not uh, to, to the adjuvant. So I could judge that's why they did that. Well, under that logic, then they certainly should have broken out the aluminum control from the saline placebo control and showed them in two separate columns on page 8, correct? They probably should have, yes. So that you could see the difference in autoimmune rate between the individuals receiving the aluminum and the saline placebo, correct? Yes. Okay. In, in your experience, would you expect 2.3 percent of the girls, of girls and women in this country between the ages of 9 and 26 to develop a systemic autoimmune condition in a six-month period? Well, that's uh, a hard question for me to answer. I, I, am, I am not a uh, rheumatologist. Uh, but um, the, when they say um, autoimmune conditions, I'd have to read exactly There's a list. what they mean. If you go to uh, page 8, um, it, they've got a long list right there of the conditions. Yeah. It starts with arthri you know, arthralgia. Right. right. Uh, so um, <clears throat> Yeah, so they have included just about uh, everything that you could consider an autoimmune uh, d disorder. And um, all I can say is that they have, uh, um, as I, well, as I just said, they've attempted to include uh, everything. And those are the, those are the data. What, you know, what can I say? Okay. As far as 2.3% uh, autoimmune disorders in, in six months. Um, these are women nine through 26 <coughs> years of age, so they're not just girls. Uh, and uh, I don't think it's impossible that that's the case, when, especially when you have a list of disorders that is comp mm -hmm. so comprehensive as this. Okay, so 2.3% in six months, 4.6% in a year, in 10 years, half the women in this country would have autoimmunity. Does that, in your experience, would that be accurate? Uh, well, again, I am not a rheumatologist, so I, I cannot answer uh, that question spe specifically. Uh, all that I can say is that they attempted to do a comprehensive study of autoimmune uh, phenomena in, um, or putative autoimmune phenomena in, in this uh, study. And that's what they found. What do you th do? You know the percentage of girls in the saline placebo group that developed a systemic autoimmune condition during this clinical trial versus uh, the AAH control? Uh, no, a I do, No, I do not. Without going back to the original study. And. <clears throat> Dr. Plock, I'm going to hand you what's been marked, Exhibits six, Plaintiff's Exhibit 17, 
This is the clinical trial data for the saline placebo control group in the Gardasil trial. So you can, you can go to page two, Dr. Plotkin. You can see that the number of vaccinated in the placebo is 596, all right? Well, you can see at the top. Um, on the first page, I'm sorry. On the first page, Dr. Plotkin, it says a study of Gardasil in pre-adolescent adolescents, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, a study of Gardasil in pre-adolescents and adolescents, okay? And uh, page two, you can see that it has the 596 saline placebo recipients. Can you please turn to um, the serious adverse event section, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the seventh uh, page. They don't print with page numbers, unfortunately. Um, serious adverse events. Okay, now if you go to the next page, run right after that. <coughs> if, just take a look at that. You could see that the second column is the placebo, the results for the placebo group, correct? Mm hmm Okay. Can you please take a minute and go through each page and tell me if there was any value that wasn't zero in terms of uh, finding a serious adverse event? No, I don't see any. Okay. So in the saline placebo group during the, the trial, they, there was not a single systemic autoimmune disorder um, that was reported, but yet there was 218, 2.3% 2 in, or maybe more actually, in the AAH control when you pull out the saline placebo group. Well, let me, well, let me well ask, again, you have to do the arithmetic, but if you subtract the uh, 600 or so uh, from the total, you could easily figure out the percentage uh, in the uh, aluminum group. All right, so let's do that. Let's do that. So there's 900,412 in the aluminum group, mm -hmm. excuse me, in the total in all of, in both groups combined. Yeah. If we pull out the saline placebo group of 594 from the 9,412, mm -hmm. Would that make the 2.3% number go up or down? Uh, it would go up um, slightly. That would be, <clears throat> um, I'd have to go back and look at the numbers, okay. but that would be reducing the total to about 8,800. And um, so uh, I guess that would be in, in here, right? Go to go to page eight. Right. So, so the point is, is that if they would have broken out, it's two. It would be two hundred over eighty eight. Eighty eight hundred. And uh, I doubt if they would, that would show a significant difference between the Gardasil, and the AAH. S group. So the Gardasil group would show 2.3, it shows 2.3%. Yes. If we took out the saline placebo group from the, the second column, it would show 2.3 or above, around 2.3 still, correct? Uh, maybe. A little higher, 2.4, 2.5, yeah. 2.5. And then if we had a third column that was just the saline placebo, mm -hmm. it would show 0%. Yeah. Wouldn't that have been a significant finding to report? Um, and I don't think you'd have to ask a statistician, but I doubt that the statistical difference would be significant. Doesn't it at least caution having a larger saline placebo group if your concern is statistics in terms of 
statistical power, which I yeah, see. Yeah, they, they, they might, might have done that. Um, but they didn't do if that. They, yes. Uh, I don't know uh, what that decision was uh, based on. But uh, if you're talking about uh, implication of, uh, of aluminum, uh, there, uh, uh, at this point, uh, there's really no reason to suspect that aluminum by itself can cause autoimmune disease. I, I, here is the clinical, pre-licensure clinical study in mm -hmm. which 2.3% of participants in the Gardasil group and in the control group had, uh, had a systemic autoimmune disorder, and it was deemed safe because they were around the same rate, right? Mm -hmm. yes. But the saline placebo group that didn't get the aluminum adjuvant had a 0%, right? A small group, yes. Of, of, of 594. Yeah. And so the vaccine apparently they that if you turn back Dr. Plotkin to page 4 please of the Gardasil insert. You there? Yeah. Do you see that they break out Gardasil in one column, those who received AAHS control in another, mm -hmm. and those that had saline placebo in a third column? Right. And that's with only 320 participants in the saline group in table one. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yes. Okay. And, they, and in table two, they break it out as well, correct? The saline group from the AAHS control group? Yes. If you turn to page five, they again break out the Gardasil, AAH control, and saline placebo groups in tables three and four, correct? Yes. Okay. But they chose to conveniently combine it when it came to systemic autoimmune disorders, right? Well, in the case of the um, page four and five, uh, they were looking at uh, local reactions, and of course aluminum does give local reactions. Uh, on uh, page 8, where they were looking at uh, systemic autoimmunity, uh, I guess they uh, believed that uh, aluminum uh, in itself uh, is a reasonable control and uh, would not cause autoimmunity. Okay, so going into this study, they just assumed aluminum wouldn't cause autoimmunity, and so that's how they proceed in designing it. I got it. All right, let's. All right. <clears throat> Dr. Plock, and I'm going to hand you what's. Uh, yes, I'm going to hand you what's being what's been marked as plaintiffs exhibit 18. This is a oh, did it? Did you send it? Okay. This is the manufacturer insert for a drug called Enbrel, correct? Mm -hmm. What is Enbrel f uh, a drug for? Um, well, it's essentially uh, an immunosuppressive, and it's, um, I think it's used a lot for uh, in autoimmune diseases and uh, cancers. Mm -hmm. This is a drug given to sick people, not healthy people, correct? Right. Unlike vaccines, which are typically given to healthy children and babies, right? Right. Okay. Um, 
If you turn to um, page 10, Dr. Plotkin, go all the way to the bottom, the 6.1, section 6.1, clinical studies experience. Mm -hmm. The very first line under 6.1 says, the data described below, below reflect exposure to Enbrel in 2,219 adult patients with RA followed for up to 80 months. Mm -hmm. So that in studying this drug given to six people, they reviewed safety for up to six and a half years, mm -hmm. correct? And they also used... Sorry. There's no answer to the question. Oh. No, mm -hmm, as you're oh, sorry. Say, when you say correct, there's you're no right. answer. You're right. I've all... Okay. Uh, was that a yes, Dr. Plotkin? Yes. Do we, are, do we miss any others? No. It's gradually happening more and more. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and, and there was, and the placebo group here was, in this study, was a saline placebo for all controls, correct? Yes. Okay. So what is your point? I think the point speaks for itself, Dr. Plotkin. Well, it doesn't because Enbrel is given over long periods of time and one has to, uh, since it's immunosuppressive, one has to look for things that may happen because of, it, uh, of immunosuppression. Uh, vaccines uh, are given at particular times and are generally not uh, uh, continuously given over long periods of time. But be, because uh, aside from that, uh, you're, you're basing this on the package circulars, not on the uh, combined experience with the vaccines that in many cases has taken place over 50 or 60 years. I, I, I'm basing this, Dr. Plotkin, I'm not basing anything on anything. <laughs> I'm just asking you questions, but I, but, but, uh, I, uh, and my questions are geared towards being able f for uh, my client to be able to pick up what is supposed to be a document that includes the clinical trial experience of the particular biologic or drug and understand what the adverse events rate was for that product. And that's all I'm trying to ask you questions about to understand, um, that, that, that's it. And in terms of uh, your, what you've just said about Enbrel, uh, the, uh, let's just, uh, we'll just talk about one quick vaccine and then and, and we've really got to move on because um, Got a lot of, a little more material to cover. Um, uh, DTAP vaccine is given at two months of age, correct? Yes. And at four months of age? Yes. And at six months of age? Yes. 18 months? Yes. At three to four years of age? Yes. Then again at 11 years of age? Yes. In, in, in the slightly Tdap version? Mm -hmm. Okay. So here you have a, just one vaccine, put aside the other one, that is given over an extended period of time, but yet as we saw, you know, uh, as the manufacturer interest will show, there is no uh, a clinical trial that I'm aware of, um, and, and I'm happy for you to show me or produce one that actually does what the study in Enbrel does, which is uh, has a saline placebo control group and reviews safety over uh, anything more than, you know, typically a few days or 30 day period. I dispute that, I think, is. Um almost certain or the certain in my mind that they observe the patients over a longer period of time but that they looked uh, specifically for acute reactions during the first few days after I immunization and uh, also I add to that and I insist on repeating that one has to look at the total experience with a drug or a vaccine over a period of time not simply what is in the FDA package circular. So are you saying that the, we should, instead of relying on clinical data, placebo, saline, inert placebo-controlled studies, 
we should just rely on the experience. Well, uh, isn't it true that there's a lot of people out there? In fact, you, you've you've said a lot of uh, used a lot of adjectives for them today so far, who are out there and say that their experience is that vaccines have caused all kinds of serious adverse reactions. Isn't that precisely what is on section 6.2 of each of those, of those inserts? If your approach is yeah. used, why are they not given equal weight? I mean, if, if that's the way we're gonna do science. I'm asking science, for the clinical, si clinical science, data. Science depends on a body of work. It does not depend on any single studies. It depends on repetition, on data that confirm other data. And so you cannot take any single study and re rely on that and say that is the truth. The truth comes out of re repetition and experience. So is your point just to trust you versus actually have the actual data to support? No, it's the accumulation okay. of data. And you can provide the data to support everything you're saying here today, correct? Everything that I'm saying is in this book. <clears throat> you wrote that book? Sorry? You're, you're the editor of that book, correct? Yes. It's called Plotkin's Vaccines? Yes. Um, Dr. Plotkin, um, what is thrombocytopenia? Uh, decreased platelets. Okay. Can it be caused by an autoimmune reaction? Is, isn't that what it's um, known to be caused by, the body attacking its own platelets? Uh, that's one of the reasons, yes. Okay. Um, can the MMR vaccine cause thrombocytopenia? Yes. Okay. Um, what is brach brachial neuritis? Brachial neuritis is basically uh, a... Uh, uh, reaction to a local in injection where you have pain in the arm. Okay. I'm going to read you a definition of brachial neuritis from John Hopkins Medicine, and you can tell me if you agree or disagree with it. Quote, brachial neuritis is a form of peripheral neuropathy that affects the chest, shoulder, arm, and hand. Peripheral neuropathy is a disease characterized by pain or loss of function in the nerves that carry signals to and from the brain and spinal cord, the central nervous system, to other parts of the body, end quote. Yes. Okay. Can DTAP or, DT, can t DTAP or TDAP cause brachial neuritis? If it's administered in the incorrect way, yes. Okay. Um, can the uh, MMR cause febrile seizures? Yes. Can the flu shot cause Guillain-Barre syndrome? Um, uncertain, but possible. Can the DTAP or TDAP cause Guillain-Barre syndrome? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, hepatitis B cause Guillain-Barre syndrome? Again, I don't think the evidence supports that. Guillain-Barre syndrome is a not uncommon event, particularly in adults. After vaccination, is that what you mean? No, I mean in general. In general, okay. Um, can the hepatitis B vaccine cause encephalitis? No, I would say definitely not. Okay. Can the MMR vaccine cause acute or chronic arthritis? Uh, it can cause, uh, in, uh, in adults, it can cause acute arthralgia, uh, I would say, pains in the joints, uh, but um, that does not seem to be a permanent phenomenon. And it's uh, unusual in children. So yes, for the acute in adults, but uh, otherwise uncertain? In children, uh, it must be quite rare if, if it occurs at all. Um, but, but it does occur in adult women. Uh, can um, the flu shot, DTAP, or Hep B cause transverse myelitis? <laughs> um, 
I would say that's uh, unlikely. Um, the um, you said uh, influenza. What would you say? Hepatitis B or DTaP? Or DTaP. I've. Uh, I think that's the most unlikely. More likely if, that it would be the flu shot or Hep B. Um, well, it's difficult with influenza because it's such a widely used vaccine, but um, uh, I, I don't see any um, medical reason why any one of those vaccines should cause transverse myelitis. <clears throat> but it has it, been reported. It has been reported. Influenza, okay. I suppose, maybe, but uh, I'm not aware of any proof. Are you aware that, okay. <clears throat> Can hepatitis B or the flu shot cause fibromyalgia? Fibromyalgia, that's such a vague syndrome. It's, again, difficult uh, to know, um, but, and uh, influenza is, there are some differences between influenza vaccine and other vaccines, but with hepatitis B, uh, I don't see any, any reason why it should cause fibromyalgia. So no on the hep B and maybe on the flu? Uh, yeah, I guess boils down to that. Uh, can the DTAP or TDAP cause acute disseminated encephalomyelitis? Uh, I would say no. Can the hepatitis A vaccine cause autoimmune hepatitis? Oh dear, no. Can hepatitis B cause lupus? I see no reason why it could. That's a no? No. Okay. Uh, can influenza cause lupus? Influenza vaccine. I... I can see no mechanistic reason why it would, and so I would say no. Okay. Can the hepatitis B vaccine cause rheumatoid arthritis? Um, there have been studies along those lines, and uh, I would say that they're unconvincing as far as the vaccine causing rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, the, the difficulty is that rheumatoid arthritis is a common disease and it of course occurs frequently uh, in adults. So it's very difficult to know um, whether um, some precipitating event could have caused it. But at this point, I would say no. Vaccines are also commonly given to most people in the country, correct? They're often given, yes. So determining causality really requires a double-blind placebo-controlled study, correct? It, it does if you want to be certain, or at least a, a statistically uh, strong relationship. What do you mean by statistically strong relationship? Uh, I mean a situation where you have a comparative group and you can say that uh, compared to the uh, comparative group that the the uh, association you're looking at is statistically um, different than the control group. And, you, and from that you believe you can determine causation? Well you can determine association then you have to look and see whether there is some kind of um, uh, biological explanation. Well, it, well, isn't it difficult to determine association? Isn't it difficult to determine association when it comes to vaccines and a alleged injury because everybody, for the most part, gets vaccinated? That is true. That is precisely why there are so many false associations between vaccines yeah. and disease. Isn't it also the reason then that careful 
preclinical studies using an inert placebo should be conducted before licensure? It, it would be ideal to, to do so, but um, one would also have to <laughs> it would have to be very large studies uh, and covering different age groups. Right. And uh, by and large, um, uh, those data uh, uh, come out much later after experience uh, with a vaccine mm -hmm. uh, used in thousands or, or millions of, of people. Well, that, that of course presumes that the that the adverse events are, long-term adverse events are rare, doesn't it? Yes. Okay. Um, do you know whether faith is susceptible to any, uh, I'm gonna try, strike that. There's a lot of conditions, so I'm gonna try this a little bit of a, a different way so we can get through this a bit quicker. Um, is faith susceptible to suffer any of the conditions we have reviewed thus far? You mean the infectious diseases or, or the non-infectious diseases? I'm talking about the adverse event. I'm talking about the conditions that we just reviewed, um, starting with thrombocytopenia and ending with well, rheumatoid arthritis. I, I know nothing about the child and therefore I'm unable to answer. Do you know whether Faith has a genetic variant that renders her predisposed to suffer any of these conditions from I vaccination? Do, I do not. Do you know whether Faith has a genetic variant in her microbiome DNA that renders her predisposed to suffer any of the conditions we reviewed? I am not aware of that. Okay. Do you know whether Faith has any environmental exposure that would render her predisposed to suffer any of the conditions that we've just reviewed? No. Okay. In 1991, the IOM issued a report regarding vaccine safety. Are you familiar, correct? Yes. Are you familiar with that report? Yes. Okay. Um, that, that report looked at 22 serious con injuries associated with DTaP vaccines and rubella vaccines, correct? Mm -hmm. okay. uh, did you provide information to the, was that a yes? Yes. Um, did you provide information to the IOM committee conducting this review? Uh, I believe I s sent them papers. Uh, I was not involved with the committee in any uh, direct way. Are you, are you aware of whether they thanked you in the, in the introduction? They may have. I mean, I um, obviously um, uh, was a source of information about rubella vaccine, for example. <clears throat> the IOM searched for evidence regarding whether DPT can cause autism, correct? Uh, yes. And they could not find any evidence um, that would help them to make any determination one way or another with regard to whether DPT causes autism, correct? Well, if, if, if you mean that they, uh, they use their um, uh, statement of not having enough information to make a decision, uh, probably yes. Do you recall that they had five categories of conclusions, Dr. Plotkin? In that yeah, report? something like that. They, yeah. Okay. The first category, strike that. Do you recall that the first category was no evidence bearing on a causal relation? I, I don't recall specifically, but I, I believe you're correct. Okay, well, well, well I, I'll give you a copy. Let's get you a copy. Um,
I'm um, going to hand you Dr. Plock and what's being marked as Exhibit 19. Um, Dr. Plock, in the title of this is the adverse effects of pertussis and rubella vaccines. Correct? Yes. This is by the Institute of Medicine in 1991. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if we go to all the way, if you go to the second to last page, Dr. Plock, I suspect that's what you're looking for. All right. This is a table of the summary of conclusions by adverse mm -hmm. event for DPT and MMR, correct? Yes. Okay. So there are five conclusion categories, correct? Mm -hmm. The first one is no evidence bearing on a causal relation, correct? Mm -hmm. And what that means, if you see the, did you, was that a yes? Yes. Okay. Um, if you go to footnote C, which defines what no evidence bearing on a causal relation means, uh, isn't it true that it says, no category of evidence was found bearing on a judgment about causation. All categories of evidence left blank in Table 1.1-1, correct? Yes. Okay. There's only one condition for which they, literally, they couldn't find any evidence one way or another on whether, it caused, it, whether the vaccine causes that condition, correct? Uh, right. And that was, what was that condition? Um, autism. Okay. Um, now, the IOM reviewed um, whether DPT can cause 17 other serious conditions. And uh, on this chart, it found that evidence supported a causation for four of them for DPT, rejected causation for four of them, but that the evidence was insufficient to determine causation for nine of them. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, as for the MMR vaccine, um, uh, the IOM reviewed four conditions, right? Mm -hmm. For the first two, it was that a yes, Dr. Plotkin? Yes. Uh, I hate to trouble you, but if you could say yes instead of mm-hmm, it would mm -hmm. speed things along a bit. Appreciate it. Um, if for the for two of them, it found that the evidence was insufficient uh, to make a causation determination. Correct? Yes. Okay. But for chronic arthritis, it found that the evidence is consistent with a causal relationship. Yes. That would be a, there's evidence consistent with a causal relationship between the MMR vaccine and chronic arthritis. Correct? Yes. And it also found that the evidence indicates a causal relationship between the MMR vaccine and acute arthritis, correct? Uh, yes. Do you dispute these findings? Uh, well, first of all, the IOM's later report uh, was not as definitive as far as chronic arthritis is concerned. Uh, and um, the evidence for the uh, consistency, first of all, it must be stressed, we're talking about adult women receiving the vaccine, not children. Uh, and uh, the other point is that um, uh, the, the data really came from one center in British Columbia uh, and was um, not uh, generally seen. As far as acute arthritis is concerned, uh, it really should be arthralgia, not arthritis, because uh, there's a difference between those two things. But anyway, uh, there's no doubt that the vaccine does cause uh, pains in the joints. But again, uh, particularly in adult women, uh, it is um, uh, not uh, a big problem in children. Uh, on the next page, Dr. Plotkin, where it says of the report, it's under research needs, does the first sentence say, 
In the course of its review, the committee encountered many gaps and limitations in knowledge bearing directly mm -hmm. and indirectly on the safety of vaccines. Yep. Okay. And then the last sentence of that paragraph says, clearly if research capacity and accomplishment in these areas are not improved, future reviews of vaccine safety will be similarly handicapped. Correct? Right. Correct. Okay. So I think it's worth pointing out that um, the vaccine community uh, did respond uh, to those conclusions and that uh, in particular a CDC set up a situation with um, uh, centers like uh, Kaiser Permanente in California where they do very elaborate safety studies because they have a large, large populations receiving vaccines or not receiving vaccines and they can do comparative uh, studies and uh, in addition uh, WHO has set up uh, uh, safety uh, uh, reviews on vaccines uh, and uh, of course CDC has a, a safety d a department uh, and there are funded um, um, sort of safety centers th throughout the country. Okay. So it's not a, a, as if the vaccine community has ignored the issue mm -hmm. of vaccine safety. Well, wonderful. We'll go through all of that, I can assure you. But, but I got to take it piece by piece, okay? So one step at a time, and we will get to Kaiser and the, the various things that you just talked about, and we'll address all of them. I just want, hopefully we, we get to everything. Um, uh, all right. Um, you know what? Why don't we take a uh, just a, a two-minute quick break? I'm going to end it this. Perfect. This ends just number three of the deposition of Dr. Stanley. Uh, we are going off the record. The time is fourteen twenty-three. This is the beginning of disc number four of the deposition of Dr. Stanley Plotkin. We are on the record. The time is 1433. <clears throat> Dr. Plotkin, you earlier said that it would be ethical, you believe, to conduct a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study of the childhood immunization schedule using adults. Is that correct? Well, I mean, you, you can't, I suppose you could test the childhood schedule in adults, but it wouldn't make a lot of sense if, if that's what you mean. Um, uh, you could test individual vaccines, I suppose, although uh, the adults uh, in all likelihood will have been either previously vaccinated or previously infected. So it wouldn't be a very easy study to do, but what? I suppose it's conceivable. And you think, but it, and, and it is something that could be done to assess the, certainly adults are not children, but it would at least give a sense of the safety profile of people who've, on the one hand, gotten the childhood schedule versus those who haven't. And I would think it's something that you would, you know, any that you would welcome, given that it was, should hopefully, I presume, show um, that both groups will have similar uh, rates of any uh, of total health outcomes. Well, it's difficult to imagine how one would do it. Now, for example, for Haemophilus influenza. Uh, disease uh, is rare in, in adults, uh, of the type B anyway, and so uh, I'm not sure what one would learn by doing such a study. For hepatitis B, The adverse of course, events, not the efficacy, Dr. Park. Yeah, well, uh, uh, I suppose, but whether it would be translatable from adults to children uh, is uncertain in itself. So. Uh, I don't think it's a very practical way of studying the, the safety of uh, vaccines. 
Uh, fortunately for hepatitis B, it's indicated for adults as well as children, so that's something that uh, can be done. Uh, and papillomavirus vaccine, of course, can be given to adults. So we have data uh, from mm. the, that type of study. But in terms of systematic studies of childhood vaccines in adults, uh, I don't f think that's a very feasible or, or useful. If the, gr if, the, if the group that receives, the adults that received the full schedule versus those that didn't, had r significantly higher rates of autoimmune or neurological or other adverse events, you don't think that could provide useful information for potentially making, addressing potential safety concerns and making the, safe, the schedule safer? So for that, you need a group of adults who have never received vaccines. And Why is that? I, well, what are you comparing? If you're comparing uh, those who were vaccinated as children with those who weren't, so you need a group that was, was not vaccinated. Well, most adults today have not received anywhere near the number of vaccines that children are being exposed to today. So, um, for example, Dr. Plotkin, uh, you know, when you were a child, as an example, what vaccines did you receive? <laughs> uh, diphtheria. Um, uh, well, uh, uh, in childhood, I, I think it was probably only diphtheria. Okay. In those days. It, so if, 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 if such a study were constructed, would you be willing to participate? You mean as someone who uh, did yes. not receive? Would you be willing to be part of the study in which you would either, you know, you would be randomized, so you'd either get the saline injections or the full mm -hmm. childhood vaccine schedule? Would you be willing to do yeah. that? Yeah, but then you'd have I'm to I'm sorry, have, I didn't hear the answer. Would you be willing to do that? Yes, but then you'd have to have a group of 80-year-olds who have received all of the childhood vaccines that are now given, which would be pretty difficult to do. So I think this kind of study you're talking about is uh, either difficult or, or uh, useless because you don't have the, the right groups to compare. Uh -huh. You could do it perhaps in 20-year-olds mm -hmm. um, if you could find 20-year-olds who haven't been vaccinated. Well, if it was... Um if they did age controls and so they had a range of ages, um, including 80s and 20 year olds, would you be willing to participate? Oh, I'd be willing to participate okay. in any reasonable study, Great. but I don't think it would be very useful. Okay. Um, in 1994, the IOM issued another report regarding vaccine safety. Are you familiar with that report? Uh, 94, the, mm, yeah, the last one was in 2000, as I recall. 2011 was the last one. Uh, well, uh, okay, there was, there was uh, a large one in about 2000 as well. Anyway, so. In 1994, um, let me give you, sounds like you don't remember, let's just give this to you. Handing you, Dr. Plock, and what's been marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 20. The title of this report is Adverse Events Associated with Childhood Vaccines, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. This is also by the Institute of Medicine. Um, this is also, in this report, the IOM looked at 54 serious injuries associated with a number of different vaccines, correct? Yes. Okay. Did you provide information to the IOM committee conducting this review? I don't recall doing that. Okay. Do you see on, um, and there are the acknowledgments on the second page. Your name is in the middle there, Stanley A. Plotkin, Pastor Morak. I can't pronounce. Me or the other. Yeah, yeah. I don't speak French, I apologize. And can you pronounce that? Me or the other. That's M-E-R-I-E-U-X-C-O-N-N-A-U-G-H-T -E 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 company. Okay. Um, now, if you go to, out of these 54 conditioned pairs, um, 
the IOM found sufficient evidence to support a causal relationship for 14 of them and rejected a causal relationship for four of them. Do you see that? Uh, where are you, are you referring? So if you go, Dr. Plock, into the uh, fourth, the fifth to last page, it has the causality table. Mm -hmm. You see category three is the evidence favors rejection of a causal relationship? Yes. Okay, and you see they rejected it for four of the associated adverse events, correct? Mm -hmm. You see, is that a yes? Yes. You see in category four, it says the evidence favors acceptance of a causal relation? Yes. Okay, do you see that there's two, three, there are five conditions listed there, including Guillain-Barre, branchial neuritis, anaphylaxis, do you see that? Yes. Okay. And on the next page for category five, which is the evidence establishes a causal relation, do you see that it lists one, two, three, four, five, six, seven conditions, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, however, uh, for the remaining conditions, so they looked at 54, if we subtract out the three categories we just looked at, 38 of those conditions, the 38 remaining conditions, the IOM couldn't make a causality determination because the science hadn't been conducted yet, right? Yes. Okay. The IOM stated at the end of this report, uh, quote, the lack of adequate data regarding many of the adverse events under study was of major concern to the committee. Presentations of public meetings indicated that many parents and physicians share this concern. Do you see the last page of the report that you're holding? Of the excerpts, do you see that it says that? The first two lines under need for research and surveillance? Yes. Um, Dr. Plotkin, in, in 2011, the IOM then issued it's another report on vaccine safety, and this time it looked at 158 of the most commonly claimed serious injuries uh, after vaccination, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, the title of that report is Adverse Effects of Vaccines, Evidence of Causality. Yes. You're familiar with that report? Yes. Okay. Um, do you know who commissioned and paid for that report, by the way? Which commission? Who co sorry, who commissioned and paid for that report? No. Okay. <clears throat> uh, would it be surprising to you if I told you that H HRSA, uh, the agency within the, the uh, HHS that defends against vaccine injury claims that commissioned that report? Wouldn't surprise me. Okay. Um, did you provide information to the IOM committee conducting this review? <laughs> uh, I don't recall specifically whether I did or not. A lot of people ask for my opinions, and if, when asked, I give my opinions. Dr. Plotkin, and I'm going to hand you what's been marked as Exhibit 21. Is this the 2011 IOM report we were just talking about? Yes. Okay. Do you see there's Roman numeral, little Roman numeral 7? Page little Roman numeral seven. You see a section entitled Reviewers? Oh, yes. I'm on the list. Okay. Do you see? Um, I'm going to read the first uh, two sentences and you can tell me if, they're, if that's what this report says. It says This report 
has been reviewed in draft form by individuals chosen for their diverse perspective and technical expertise in accordance with procedures approved by the National Research Council's report review committee. The purpose of this independent review is to provide candid and critical comments that will assist the institutions in making its published report as sound as possible and to ensure that the report meets institutional standards for objectivity, evidence, and responsiveness to the study charge. Is that mm -hmm. what it says? Yes. And you're one of the people that gave the report to you to review? Yes. And next to your name, it says University of Pennsylvania. Yes. It doesn't disclose that at that time you were working for all four of the major vaccine makers, correct? What do you mean by working for them? I mean, at, at, at that point, I was no longer at Pasteur Media Connaught. Did you, in 2011, were you receiving compensation and remuneration from Sanofi? I was, yes, as I've said before, I um, was consulting for uh, Sanofi as well as others. Were you consulting for Merck? Yes, probably and, at that and, time, yes. And GSK? Yes. Okay. And, and as well as a whole host of other for-profit companies seeking to develop vaccines, correct? Yes. But I'm just, say, I'm just saying that's not mentioned here, correct? No. Okay. So um, do you know how many other individuals who were involved in reviewing or compiling this report were receiving money from pharmaceutical companies making vaccines that's not disclosed in this report? I have no knowledge of that. Um, uh, you provided handwritten comments to the IOM for this report? If I reviewed the report, which apparently I did, I am sure I made comments. I don't know if they were handwritten, probably not, since my hand reading is illegible. Um, um, in this report, um, the IOM found that 14 of the 158 serious injuries most commonly reported after certain vaccines were uh, that the evidence supported a causal relationship, correct? Um, is that, where is that stated? Well, if you go to page three of the report, Uh, it's a uh, numeral there. Uh, well, no, let me ask you the right. question a different way, Dr. Bach. And why, if you look at that of that chart, you can see that there is little symbols. Do you see those, Dr. Pockin? Um. Yes. Okay. So an I represents um, inadequate to accept or reject a causal relationship, correct? Yes. And an FA, FR means fav favors rejection of a causal relationship, correct? Um, yes, apparently, okay. yes. If you look through this... Uh, no, FA favors acceptance. I meant that I said FR. I'm sorry. FR yeah. favors yeah. rejection. Right. FA favors acceptance, mm -hmm. um, and CS is convincingly supports a causal relationship, yes. right? So um, I think that, I think what, what you'll note when you look through this chart is that most of the conditions have an I, correct? Yes. Um, any reason, uh, the report indicates that for 135 out of the 158 reviewed, it found that it could not locate sufficient evidence to make a causality determination, right? Yes. Okay. So the IOM concluded that of the 135 most commonly claimed injuries from vaccination, um, it, it didn't know whether or not the vaccines caused that. Let me ask you something. You know, um, you, you earlier stated um, that You stated that um, 
hepatitis B is uh, doesn't cause encephalitis, right? That's that's my opinion. Right. Yes. But the IOM, after doing its review, determined it couldn't find science to support a causal determination one way or another. Correct. Yes. Okay. But that means that they that they don't have evidence for the supposition. That it right. either causes or doesn't cause. Right. They don't know. They don't know because there aren't enough data. Right. But you have... But In the absence of data, my conclusion is that there are no... There's no proof that causation exists. So if there's no data to show that it causes or it doesn't cause... Yes. Your, your, your supposition... Is that, is that, is that what I understand correctly? Yes. Is that it doesn't cause it? Uh, that there's no proof that it does. Okay. That's different than saying it doesn't cause it, correct? Correct. So when you were saying earlier that when I asked you at, at the beginning of this whether certain vaccines cause certain conditions and you said no, they don't, did you just mean that no, there's not enough evidence to make a decision one way or another? I mean that I, there's no knowledge known to me that they do certain things that are that uh, uh, some may have alleged happen after vaccination. Like, for example, you know, uh, they uh, the IOM reviewed whether hepatitis B can cause lupus because of lots of reports, or, or influenza can cause lupus. They concluded that there's insufficient evidence, one way or another, to make a determination. You indicated, right. and but you indicated earlier that that those vaccines don't cause lupus. Your testimony, you're, you're saying that you said no because you weren't aware of a mechanism by which it could cause it. Is that yes, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, but the science really isn't available to make a determination on causation yet, right? The science doesn't show that there is a relationship, and it is unfortunately. To prove a negative requires a lot more data than to prove a positive. If we, if there was a, uh, I mean, if there was a study that was had a placebo and um, a control group, then we could know whether or not these conditions are caused by these vaccines. Correct? Yes, it would have to okay. be an, an enormous study, yeah. and it would have to be randomized, ideally which is uh, unlikely to, to be the case uh, since... Um, it, it needs to be the normus because you're assuming these conditions are rare, correct? Correct. Okay. And, and, and this study that you're saying needs to be done before vaccines are licensed, they do do clinical trials, we've seen, right? Yes. And they have thousands of people typically in them, correct? Yes. And okay. therefore, they can study common conditions. But right. uncommon conditions are very difficult to study because they are uncommon mm -hmm. and therefore one would need a very very large study and one would have to have randomization which is of course uh, inherently difficult if if you actually had a placebo controlled study a an ERT placebo controlled study of 7 8000 people you could at least determine that in a population of that size, whether or not there is a detectable adverse event rate for any of these conditions, correct? Uh, for some of those conditions, yes. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to show you, I want to like to show you an excerpt from that report, okay? Um, before I do that, actually, a few quick little questions. Uh, Tdap is one of the vaccines on the childhood schedule, right? Yes. It's administered to babies during the first year of life. Yes. Uh, we already talked about this at two, four, and six months, right? Yes. Okay. Did I say Tdap or Dtap? Oh, Dtap is the one that's used. I meant Dtap. I meant Dtap in that question. I have Tdap. Okay. Um, same answer if it was Dtap, correct? Yes. Okay, so let's correct that, please. Now, as for TDAP, T-D-A-P, little d, little a, little p, with a capital T, um, that's given to pregnant women, correct? Yes. Okay. 
and DTaP and Tdap refer to vaccines which contain diphtheria toxoid, tetanus toxoid, and acellular pertussis, correct? Yes. Okay. What was the IOM's conclusion in 2011 about whether these vaccines can cause autism? Uh, I'd have to look that up, but um, I, I feel confident that they do not cause autism. You feel confident that that's what the IOM concluded? Uh, I don't remember what the IOM concluded, but uh, I don't believe there's any evidence that that's the case. Is there any evidence that that's not the case? <laughs> why, don't, uh, why don't I show you this, Dr. Plotkin? <clears throat> going to hand you what's being marked as Exhibit 22. <clears throat> oh, Dr. Plotkin, may I actually have that back for a moment? I'm sorry. Nope, I gave you the right one. There you go. Thank you. Um, okay. This is an excerpt from the IOM's report. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. Okay. And this is where the IOM discusses the evidence with regard to whether DDAP, DTAP or TDAP cause autism, correct? Correct. Okay. If you turn to the second page, can you read the causality conclusion with regard to whether DTAP and TDAP cause autism? Um, the committee did not identify literature reporting clinical, diagnostic, or experimental evidence of autism after the administration of vaccines containing diphtheria toxoid, tetanus toxoid, and acellular pertussis antigens. Okay. Dr. Plotkin, I'm sorry. Can you please read, Dr. Plotkin, can you please read the causality conclusion? With regard have, to the, that the IOM reached for three, one is, second, Dr. Plock, and I, yeah. I'm sorry. I, 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 the court report has got to be able to take down the full question or there won't be a clear record. Can you please read the causality conclusion in the IOM report with regard to whether DTAP and TDAP can cause autism? The evidence is inadequate to accept or reject a causal relationship between diphtheria toxoid, tetanus toxoid or acellular pertussis containing vaccine and autism. So the IOM reviewed the available evidence with regard to whether Tdap or DTAP can cause autism, and their conclusion was the evidence doesn't exist to show whether Dtap or Tdap do does do or do not cause autism, correct? Yes, but the the, the point is that there are no studies showing that it does cause autism, except one study by two well-known anti-vaccination figures, Geyer and Geyer, who have no legitimacy whatsoever. So w what they're saying is that there's, there's no evidence, and uh, uh, the important point from my point of view is that there is no positive evidence right. to do a, a proper study as we've been discussing, uh, which would uh, uh, disprove it, would involve the controlled administration of vaccines and uh, withholding vaccines from children who should have them. Dr. Plotkin, is there, was the IOM able to identify a single study that supported the, your claim Strike that. If you, if you take a look at that section, please, was the IOM able to identify a single study supporting that DTAP or TDAP do not cause autism? No, they did not identify a study. Okay. But the point is, and I have to re repeat myself, I, that uh, absence of evidence does not allow you to conclude that the two phenomena are related. You're making it assumptions, all, Dr. Plotkin, about, I think, what's built and not... I, I understand that. I mean, I, I only interrupt because, you know, I, um, it's 3 o'clock and I, I, I don't mind letting you, you know, give a lot of discussion about things that aren't relevant, but 
to the, I think to the it's, question. I think it's relevant in the reports issued by the IOM yes. that their conclusion about evidence not being available yes. does not uh, allow you to conclude that the phenomena, uh, that there is a causal relationship. I don't, right? I'm not sure. No, I, I, <laughs> I never said that. And I'm not sure mm -hmm. anybody in this room said that, Dr. Plot. Good. I'm okay. glad to hear that. But, but it does allow you to conclude that the evidence doesn't exist to say that DTAP and TDAP do not cause autism, correct? There is not evidence to uh, say a million different things. Okay. You have to prove. Did the IOM report look at whether the MMR vaccine can cause autism? Uh, I'd have to it, look and see. Yes. I believe that it they did. did. And, and what did it find? Found? I'm sorry. It said it did. And Well, I'm looking to see. It said it favors rejection because it did find studies. Yes. Correct? Yes. That's right. So studies are possible to determine whether or not a vaccine does or does not cause, does not cause autism, correct? They are possible, yes. yes. Okay. But the study to determine whether DTAP or TDAP does not cause autism has not been done, uh, right? A study that would definitively show that it doesn't has not been done, okay. but there's no evidence that it does. Okay. But since, Dr. Plotkin, we don't know whether DTAP or TDAP cause autism, right? It would be a bit premature to make the unequivocal sweeping statement that vaccines do not cause autism, correct? In the absence of evidence, one should not draw any conclusions uh, except that there is no evidence. And so uh, I, I, I don't uh, infer from the absence of evidence about a million different things that they're necessarily true. One has to uh, do studies to determine whether or not a phenomenon uh, exists and uh, usually those studies are done because there is some suspicion that uh, of a relationship. But in, in, um, we have no suspicions, at least I don't, uh, that uh, autism is caused by DTAP. Well, you may not have that suspicion, but it is one of the most commonly reported conditions uh, adverse events, which is why it was reviewed in this IOM report from DTAP TDAP, uh, which we discussed earlier. So I, I just, I'm not, I, I'm not saying, I'm not asking you to say that vaccines do cause autism. I'm, I'm not asking that at all. I'm asking you as a scientist, can you make the statement that vaccines do not cause autism if you don't know whether DTAP or TDAP cause autism? As a scientist, I would say that I do not have evidence one way or the other. Right. As a practicing physician, I have to uh, weigh uh, all kinds of things in making a decision about a patient whether to d do something or not to do something. And I make that, those decisions based on the body of knowledge, even in the absence of uh, definitive information for every case. This has been true for medicine ever since its inception. I'm, I'm asking you a simple question. I'm asking you, since the science has not yet been done regarding whether vex DTAP or TDAP cause autism, isn't it true that you cannot make the sweeping statement that vaccines do not cause autism. I could make the statement that there is no evidence that vaccines cause autism. Okay. And therefore, I'm not, I'm not asking you that and question, therefore, Dr. Plotkin. And therefore, yeah. vaccines. He's, and therefore, he's not answering the question. And therefore, vaccines sh should be given 
to protect against serious diseases. Will, Dr. Plotkin, if we've already reviewed the IOM report, the IOM could not find evidence that DTAP or Tdap cause autism. I'm asking you, knowing that, isn't it just a bit premature to make the unequivocal sweeping statement that vaccines do not cause autism? I would say it is uh, logically uh, true that you cannot uh, say, you cannot point to proof that it doesn't cause autism. But as physicians and public health specialists, one has to make decisions in the absence of thousands of pieces of, in, of information that one would like to have. And one of them is that vaccines protect against serious infectious diseases, and there's no evidence that they cause autism. So therefore, I recommend vaccinations to uh, this child and every other child who does not have a contraindication. But since there's, but since there's no evidence that DTAP or Tdap don't cause autism, you can't yet say that vaccines do not cause autism, correct? I cannot say that as a, uh, as a scientist or a logician, but I can say as a physician that no, they do not cause autism. Because as a physician, I have to take the whole body of scientific information into consideration when I make a recommendation for a child. Their IOM reviewed the science. They didn't find a single study that supported whether or not vaccines. Forgive me. Counsel, your, your, your connection's not that great. It's very choppy, and I cannot hear anything you're saying, but I do hear your voice. Please repeat. All right. At this point... Dr. Plotkin, just wait for him to move on to the next question. I'm, I'm not asking the same question, Counselor. Your objection is noted. I'm responding to his comments, which are different every time. So, okay, so what you're saying is, as a physician or logician, then you, you couldn't say vaccines do not, you, you, you could not say vaccines do not cause autism. Um, but as a pediatrician, you're saying that you would say that to a parent because you want to make sure they get the vaccine, is that right? You know, I can't be sure that DTAP doesn't cause leprosy. That doesn't mean that that stops me from using a DTAP vaccine. Are, are people claiming that D DTAP has caused leprosy? Uh, I, Are you aware I, of any such complaints? I'm not aware of any such complaints, but I wouldn't be surprised to see it on the web one of these days. Okay, but, but, but people have made enough complaints about DTAP, Tdap causing autism that the Institute of Medicine at the commission of HHS thought it was serious enough to do a scientific review, correct? Yes. Okay. They didn't review whether DTAP causes leprosy, did they? Uh, no. Okay. So, and, and after conducting that review, th they found that there was no evidence at all that they could find whether DTAP or TDAP cause autism. I'm just asking you a simple question, which is, since there's no evidence that whether DTAP or TDAP cause autism, isn't it a little premature to say, to make the sweeping statement that vaccines do not cause autism. No, I do not agree with that because uh, uh, absence of, of evidence works both ways. There's no evidence that, that they do and uh, the ideal study has not been done. I, I agree with that. But in, in the absence of any reasonable evidence that they do, uh, I, I continue to uh, recommend their use. Okay. So you're willing to make a statement that a vaccine does not cause a condition, even in the absence of any evidence. I'm willing to state that there is no evidence that the vaccine causes the condition, and there, and there is a lot of evidence that they do uh, protect against disease, and therefore uh, the child should receive the vaccines.
I mean, there are a million things on the, on the web, including all kinds of, of uh, diet advice based on, uh, on r uh, ridiculous information. Uh, so why, why should I uh, uh, adopt that? Are you saying that the IOM was engaging in a ridiculous uh, review here? They were doing a scientific review, uh, which is certainly legitimate, and their conclusion that there are uh, insufficient data to draw a formal conclusion. I can understand that and appreciate that. But that does not mean that the vaccines cause autism. Nobody, you've never been asked that. The only thing I've asked you is whether or not one can assert that vaccines do not cause autism. Counselor, not that they do. Let's be, let's be real. You're asking me these questions because you want me to legitimize a view that vaccines cause autism. And I will not do that because absence of evidence is no proof whatsoever. I think that record is very clear, Dr. Plock, and I'm not trying to legitimize anything. I'm just asking you to, I'm, I'm not trying to legitimize that vaccines cause cause autism i think we very clearly we have very clearly established what the iom found the iom found in their estimation no evidence right right they found no evidence that vaccines do cause that excuse me that d tap or t tap cause autism let's make that very clear right right they found no evidence right. that d tap or t tap cause autism yes period they found one study which they said was unreliable mm -hmm. because it relied on VAERS data and it, and it had, mm -hmm. had no control, right? Right. Okay. But similarly, in the same vein, they also didn't find any evidence that DTAP, TDAP do not cause autism. Now that doesn't mean that DTAP, TDAP do cause autism, correct? Correct. It doesn't mean that, right? Yes. That's right. Mm -hmm. All it means is that they couldn't find a study that showed it support that supported that it does not cause autism, right? Yes. Okay. Until and, and that's why they reached the conclusion that they did, which is they said the data is insufficient, mm -hmm. right? I assume you. Is that a yes? Yes. All right. Do you agree with the IOM's conclusion that the data, the evidence is insufficient to determine whether or not TDAP, DTAP cause autism? I agree with their conclusion, but that doesn't mean that I don't act on other information. Okay. Um, I, okay. I can understand that. I can understand that. But you're making... I, I'm not. I'm not saying that. That you, I'm not asking you to ignore any benefits you believe accrue from vaccines. Okay, I'm not asking you to do that at all, Dr. Plotkin. I'm simply asking you, as a pure matter of logic, as a pure matter of logic and common sense, if you don't know whether A causes something, can you say A B? Let me not use a hypothetical. If you don't know whether DTAP or TDAP cause autism, shouldn't you wait until you do know, until you have the science to support it, to then say that vaccines do not cause autism? Do I wait? No, I do not wait because I have to take into account the health of the child. And, and so for that reason, you're okay with telling the parent that DTAP, TDAP does not cause autism, even though the science isn't there yet to support that claim? Absolutely. I, okay. I'm also willing to tell them it doesn't cause leprosy. Okay. I, I, again, did the, did the IOM review whether DTAP caused leprosy? No. Okay. All right. Um, Dr. Plotkin, has there ever been a study which looked at the total health outcomes of children following the CDC's vaccination schedule and those who are completely unvaccinated, such as Faith? Not that I'm aware of. Um, 
Um, no, I, I don't think so. Um, but, but you know, there are all kinds of studies. Uh, uh, there's a study that suggests that children who are vaccinated compared to unvaccinated children have lower rates of leukemia. Now, do I believe that study? Uh, I find it interesting, but I would want confirmation of that study before I, I believed it. But just to, to, to point out that um, uh, Peter Abbey, for example, as I mentioned before, found that measles vaccination had a positive effect on health and reduced mortality. Uh, so um, uh, I, I think there is abundant evidence that uh, vaccines do contribute to the health of children. But in answer to your question, uh, there is no study that I know of that uh, compared the health of vaccinated children with unvaccinated okay. children. Why has that study not been done? Probably because uh, it is considered bad malpractice not to vaccinate a child. So you're saying a prospective study is, might be improper because it will leave a child unvaccinated? Correct. Okay. What about a retrospective study? That, I suppose, could be done, but it wouldn't be randomized. Can, um, when I say retrospective, that means using existing data, correct? Using children. Why don't I ask you, strike that. Can you define retrospective, please? I mean, uh, looking at children who had been vaccinated and comparing them to children who had not been vaccinated. Okay. Um, presumably, HMOs, insurance companies would have health data on enough vaccinated and unvaccinated children to conduct such a comparison, correct? Well, I don't know, because the percentage of unvaccinated children, fortunately, is quite low. So um, I'm not sure how easy it would be to do that study. And I would suspect that many of those unvaccinated children are not in um, registers that could be used. You're familiar with the vaccine safety data link? Yes. Are you aware that there are a few thousand children that are, my understanding, are you aware that there are reports from uh, the gov government reports that show that there are a few thousand children that are my understanding, completely unvaccinated in the VSD? Oh, I, I don't doubt it. Okay. Couldn't uh, the vaccine safety data link be used to conduct a retrospective vaccinated versus unvaccinated study to look for health outcomes? Well, I d don't know. Um, uh, theoretically, perhaps, but uh, one would have to um, uh, be convinced that the children were uh, were compar comparable in, in other ways besides being vaccinated or unvaccinated. Okay. Every time you do a retrospective study, that you always need to control for potential co-founders, correct? Correct. And that's what you're talking about, controlling for co-founders, right? Yes. And, and you know, if you're, doing a, if you're doing a case control properly matching cases, or if you're, right? Uh, are you saying mm. that, uh, so, so, CDC, pharma, they conduct studies all the time, right? Mm -hmm. um, including studies. Yes. Yes. Including studies that have um, co founders that need to be controlled for, right? Yes. Vaccine try, yes. Vaccine studies, um, especially for efficacy, happen all the time, correct? Yes. Okay. So. Uh, Again, if the data is there, why not do a study comparing vaccinated to completely unvaccinated children to look for the total health outcomes so you know what the real risks are from vaccine or get at least a sense of what the real risks are for vaccine from vaccinations? Well, I can't completely uh, answer that question. I'm sure it would be a difficult study to do, but I will repeat what I said earlier about measles vaccination, I would just uh, remind you again that uh, in, among those children who were not You've vaccinated, said all this, Dr. yeah, well, I'm going to repeat I, I got it. it. But there were three three deaths and 24 cases of encephalitis, okay. Okay. and that's unbearable. I'm sorry, 
Can you read back what, what Dr. Plotkin just said? We were talking over each other. I apologize. Um, well, answer, well, I can't completely answer that question. I'm sure it would be a difficult study to do, but I will repeat what I said earlier about measles vaccination. I'll just remind you again that among these children who were not DASH, you've already said all this, Dr. Plotkin. I got it. Answer, well, I'll repeat it. Three deaths and 24 cases of encephalitis. That's unbearable. Um, take your time. Dr. Plotkin, who prepared the notes that are in front of you? Me. Okay, when did you prepare those? Oh, about a week ago, I guess. Okay. Um, during the break, our lunch break, did you talk with anybody? No. Well, yes, I talked with my wife. Anybody else? No. Okay. Um, so, I, I understand that you find um, injuries that can result from what you've called, I believe, vaccine-preventable diseases. Um, I, what we're trying to do is understand the risks of vaccinating, and in particular for faith. Uh, and can you, under, can you appreciate that, um, understand, strike that. So you're just, you just think it's too difficult to look at, to do a study comparing vaccinated and unvaccinated children, even though the data exists to do that. Is that right? Well, I, I simply am saying that I, I don't know how feasible it is. I've never been asked uh, to look at it before, and, but I do think a priori that it would be difficult because those children are uh, very likely from different uh, socioeconomic groups and uh, different uh, racial groups, and so it will be a difficult study to do. I don't know if it's feasible or not. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so with all of the government, so the pharma school industry, you said, made, made approximately $20 billion last year in revenue from vaccine sales? I think so. I uh, don't okay. ha I have yeah. the financial statements. Mm -hmm. Should we review them, or do you think $20 billion is about right? I think it's about right. I, I, uh, I, you know, I'm not an accountant. I don't uh, uh, give or take read a those. Few, give or take a billion or two, would you say? Yeah, I think so, okay. yes. So the pharmaceutical industry has had $20 billion in revenue, and the CDC spends hundreds of millions of dollars buying vaccines every year, is that right? I think so. Okay. But yet you don't think that the resources can be done to, to do a single solitary study comparing the health outcomes of a for-profit product given to almost every child in this country to assess what the rate of adverse reactions are between those who get all those products and those who don't? What I said is I simply don't know whether such a study is feasible or not, but I, I think it would be difficult to do uh, because it would not be a randomized study and therefore the conclusions uh, might, be, uh, might be questionable. Or but I don't know whether such a study is feasible or not. Aren't most, most studies that are done that you rely upon in that book that you have in front of you not randomized? Many of them are not. Many of them are. Okay. Do you throw out the ones that are not randomized? No, it, it, it depends on what the, the purpose of the study is. Mm -hmm. If it's uh, studying immune responses, it, it doesn't necessarily have to have a control group. 
Um, Dr. Plotkin, I'm going to hand you uh, what's being marked as exhibit, plaintiff's exhibit 23. Whoops, I'm right. sorry. Do you, Dr. Plotkin, what's an ICD-9 code? Well, it's, it's uh, essentially a way of coding diseases for, usually for uh, remuneration purposes. Okay. So when a, a doctor administers a drug or diagnoses as a patient or something similar, there is a code that they would enter yes. into the system, right? Yes. And the, the ICD-9 codes are published by the American Medical Association, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, please take a look at uh, the exhibit I just handed The exhibit I just handed you is the 2015 ICD-9 CM Professional Edition for Physicians code book, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Or at least the front page in one excerpt, correct? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. So, so if you go to the second page, do you see there's a code V64.07? Yes. W what is that code for? Uh, vaccination not carried out for religious reasons. Okay. So wouldn't it be feasible, for example, to compare children who have this coding who are not being vaccinated with those who are being vaccinated who are in similar communities, have similar demographics, and otherwise avoid as much as possible other potential co-founders? Well, if you could uh, eliminate the co-founders, it would be feasible. And what are the co-founders, Dr. Plotkin? Well, as I said before, the co-founders in, include uh, a socioeconomic level, uh -huh. uh, uh, racial grouping, um, uh, exposure to, um, to, to agents, in other words, uh, are they living in a community where uh, it's uh, unlikely that uh, someone uh, unvaccinated from um, uh, Ethiopia is going to come into the community and be able to transmit uh, diseases? There are, uh, I mean, I'd have to sit down and write up a list mm -hmm. of possible co-founders, but there, but there would be many of them. Mm -hmm. So when you do studies for efficacy, are you able to control for all of these co-founders? Well, usual, uh, usually the effort is to include as many uh, different types of, of individuals as possible so that um, uh, if there is a problem with a particular group, you can identify it. Uh, but... Um, Doing clinical studies is is not always easy, and that's why the conclusions from clinical studies have to be um, seen in relation to other clinical studies. Why is it you can control for co-founders in various other vaccine studies, including in vaccine safety studies that are cited in your book, but but include you know but you believe you. Are you saying you couldn't control for these same co-founders in the study of a vaccinated versus unvaccinated population? I am unable to draw a conclusion about whether a, such a study is feasible. What I'm pointing out is that the likelihood of there being multiple co-founders is uh, uh, confounders, sorry, is very high. And therefore, it wouldn't be an easy study to do. That's all I can say. I've never sat down to try to figure out how to do such a study. Okay, well, we've got socioeconomic, which are probably pretty easy to control for. Racial grouping, pretty easy to control for. Um, exposure to agents, since it's retrospective, you'll know if there's been an outbreak in a community. What, what other co-founders do you think might exist? I mean, I'd like to hear one that... that, that can you tell me a co-founder that's not easily to, easy to control for? Um, in principle, one can control for any uh, uh, confounding uh, problem. Uh, the, 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 the issue would be uh, just how many there are and just how large a group 
you would need for statistical significance. See, that, that's, that's another issue. I mean, we accept uh, as a, um, a, a valid conclusion something that is false five times out of a hundred. And so uh, not only do we have to try to eliminate uh, confounders, uh, but we also need repetition of studies to be sure that the results we got in the first study were not in the five studies that were false Great. in their conclusion. But, uh, so you would need multiple studies. Okay. And, and since these are retrospective, they're really just running data, right? Uh, if the data are encoded, yes. Okay. Um, so I'm, I, I asked earlier, what co-founder can you list that's not easy to control for? And I did not hear another co-founder. Can you tell me a co-founder in this proposed study that would not be easy to control for? Uh, exposure would be probably the most uh, difficult. Um, in other words, whether uh, a, a child is living in a community where uh, exposure to disease is, is rare or, or absent, okay. uh, or a child is living in a community where um, there are uh, significant possibilities of exposure. I think that would be probably the most difficult uh, to um, account for. When's the last case of polio in the United States, wild polio? Oh. Uh, I forget the exact year, but it's been probably 20, 25 years. Would 1979 sound correct to you? Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Um, so that, that wouldn't be an issue, correct? No, Suppose polio would not be an issue. Okay. Um, how many cases of diphtheria have there been in the last 10 years in the United States? It's very rare or absent. All right. Less than mm -hmm. five, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, we can, isn't that true for most of the uh, diseases, except for maybe pertussis, right? Well, pertussis, uh, HIV, hepatitis, um, um, those are diseases that are still common. Okay, so if we uh, excluded... Mumps. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead. Mumps, pertussis. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... Since this is retrospective, we would know where those outbreaks are, right? Because they're, yes. they're very carefully tracked by the CDC, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. Since we know where the outbreaks are for those diseases, that could be... Was that a yes? Yes. Since we know where those outbreaks are, that could be actually probably pretty easily controlled for as well, correct? In principle, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So can you name me a co-founder that would be difficult to control for in the study? Well, at the moment, I can't think of uh, uh, any other that um, would be material, uh, although um, I think um, uh, one would have to look at uh, genetic issues and um, um, uh, the health of other members in the family and so forth. But again, okay. uh, uh, I, I am not saying that such a study is impossible. I'm just pointing out that it would be a very difficult study to do, and the conclusions that you could draw from the study might be very limited. Well, I, well when you keep saying it's difficult, but I, I, and your reason for that, I understand, is, is potential co-founders, and I'm just trying to understand what those are. So you said f uh, familial history. Uh, presumably the parents would be in the same health plan as the children, so you'd have mm -hmm. the parents' medical history too, correct? Mm -hmm. So that could be controlled for as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and you said, mm-hmm, two questions yes. ago? That was a yes? Okay. Um, so that could be easily controlled for, correct? Yes. Okay. And um, so I'm, I'm w can you tell me again, I'm, I, can you tell me a co-founder that would actually be difficult to control for in this study? Well, other than the ones that I've mentioned uh, and uh, 
uh, and not, not having thought about doing such a study, uh, that's all I can say. Okay. <clears throat> If you did such a study, isn't it, are you aware that advocacy groups and other people interested in this issue have been calling for this exact study of comparing vaccinated and unvaccinated for 30 years already? Um. Uh, I, I don't spend a lot of time on the web, so okay. uh, I, I can't say that I know that such a study is uh, being requested. Okay. Well, if um, but you do read IOM reports and CDC yes. reports. Okay. And you never come across any IOM or CDC reports in which they specifically address the repeated calls for such a study. No. Okay. Um, would it be surprising to you if I told you those existed? That what existed? That CDC and IOM reports in which they document the calls for such a study. Well, I wouldn't be surprised, no. Would you be surprised to know that the CDC, in fact, issued an entire report regarding conducting such a study and, and the calls for conducting such a study? And... Uh, I, they issue the what, did you say? I said, would you be surprised to know that the CDC, in fact, issued a report in response to the request for the calls for such a study? No, I wouldn't be surprised that there was a response, no. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, in, in looking for such a study, um, isn't it true that there actually has been one such study conducted um, in the past, for the first time ever uh, in the last year, correct? I'm not aware of that study. Okay. Uh, I'm going to hand you what's been marked Plaintiff's Exhibit uh, 24. The title of this study is A Pilot Comparative Study of the Health of Vaccinated and Unvaccinated 6 to 12 year old United States Children, correct? Yes. Okay. And the authors of this study are professors at the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics School of Public Health, Jackson State University, correct? Just a minute. That's what it says. Absolutely. I, I, I'm sorry, let's just wait for co-counsel to get a copy. Sorry about that. I thought it had gone through. Did you mark these? Okay, so... Ms. Newsma, do you have it? I shouldn't have... Yep. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. Are you familiar with this pilot study, Dr. Plotkin? No. Okay. I see it's been published in um, the Journal of Translational Science, which um, is not one of the journals I read, and is probably one of those multiple so-called predatory journals that mm -hmm. we are um, trying to deal with currently. So is anybody in any university that publishes anything that's negative about vaccines, predatory or I forgot the other no, adjectives it's, you it's used it's earlier No, it's today. not that. It's that there are journals now that will publish anything for money. Ah. And um, I get about 10 of those invitations a day. So does, does money influence judgment? It may. Conduct? Yeah. It may. I, okay. ca I cannot tell. Until, so, until I read this study. Hmm, I understand. So, um, well, in this study, if you look, um, if you take a quick look at it, 
you'll see that it involves looking at total health outcomes between mm -hmm. vaccinated and unvaccinated homeschool children. Yes. Okay. When you're ready, please turn to page five. Do you see um, the row that says chicken pox? Um, yes. Okay, so the odds ratio for the unvaccinated, the unvaccinated were twice as likely, uh, no, I'm sorry, four times as likely to get chicken pox, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, 0.26, so odds ratio of about four. The kids who are unvaccinated were about four times more likely to get chicken pox? Mm-hmm. Okay. Is that a yes? Yes. And do you see for whooping cough, the unvaccinated children were uh, three times as likely to get whooping cough? Yes. Yes. Um, go down to where it says allergic rhinitis. Mm. What is yes. that? Uh, well, it's essentially runny nose because of allergy. Okay. Do you see that it says that the vaccinated children were 30 times as likely to have allergic rhinitis? Yes, I see that number. Do you see that it says that uh, vaccinated children were 3.9 times as likely to have allergies? Uh, yes. 4.2 times as likely to have ADHD? Yes. 4.2 times as likely to have autism spectrum disorder? Yes. 2.9 times as likely to have eczema? Mm-hmm. 5.2 yes. times as, sorry, 5.2 times as likely to have learning disability? Yes. 3.7 times as likely to have neurodevelopment disorder? Yes. And 2.4 times as likely to have any chronic condition? Yes. Okay. Um, wouldn't you like to see a larger scale study that refuted these claims? Uh, it would be ideal, yes. Um, it would certainly be um, important to repeat the study and to um, enroll patients uh, in a, um, a blinded fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I really would have to read this to see uh, exactly how they uh, enrolled uh, the, um, mm -hmm. um, uh, the, uh, the children or the parents uh, in this study. Doesn't the existence of the study, though, um, I mean, I, I, it, strike that. Okay, so it at least calls for further similar studies, um, hopefully, to either confirm or disprove the findings in the study, correct? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, I would agree. Okay. And, I'm going to show you one more um, study that was done with the same data um, from, from this author. Um, Um, Dr. Clark, I'm going to hand you what's been marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 25. Has it been sent? Okay. Uh, this is another study by the, this, this is another publication using the same data, I believe, from the same group of professors at the uh, Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics School of mm -hmm. Public Health, Jackson State University, correct? It appears that way, yes. Yeah. Okay, and uh, the title of this one is Preterm Birth, Vaccination, and Neurodevelopmental Disorders, a Cross-Sectional Study of 6- to 12-Year-Old Vaccinated mm -hmm. and Unvaccinated Children, correct? Yes.
Okay. Um, I'll, let, I'll, I'll give you a moment to read the abstract. Just, have you ever seen this study before? No. Okay, so just take a moment, please, and read the abstract. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm Okay. Yes. So, in the middle of the abstract, um, I'm going to read a, two sentences and you can tell me if, they're, if I've read them correctly. No association was found between preterm birth and NDD in the absence of vaccination. Um, strike that. Um, actually, Dr. Plotkin, um, if, could you... Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines down in the abstract. You see where it starts, no association? Um, yes. Can you start, can you read that sentence in the next one? No association was found between preterm birth and NDD in the absence of vaccination, but vaccination was significantly associated with NDD in children born at term, odds ratio 2.7, uh, is that sufficient? And the next sentence, please, sir. Thank you. Uh, however, vaccination coupled with preterm birth was associated with increasing odds of NDD, ranging from 5.4 uh, compared to vaccinated but non-preterm children to 14.5 compared to children who were neither preterm uh, pre nor vaccinated. Um, what does NDD stand for? Uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. Right. And in this study, it was defined as learning disability, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, and autism spectrum disorder, correct? Yes. Okay. But I will also point out yes. that the abstract says that it was a convenience sample of 666 children. So mm -hmm. clearly, it was in no way a randomized study. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't we do better studies? Uh, one would have to do a better study if... Uh, larger samples? Larger samples and okay. uh, in, enrollment, yeah. not uh, um, I th uh, by I convenience. Right. I, I believe Dr. Mawson calls these pilot studies, correct? Because nobody uh, else is doing them, so he tried with limited resources, not the resources of pharmaceutical companies and the CDC to conduct such a study, right? Um, well, that's your interpretation. I, I would have to read the study. Fair enough. More than fair. Um, is it possible that his findings in both of these studies could be correct? Is it possible? Yes, of course. Possibility is always possible. And hopefully, uh, and ideally, you would conduct a larger or at least additional similar studies to either confirm or dispute the findings in these studies, correct? Uh, ideally, yes. Okay. Um, now, let me ask you a question. In terms of randomization, if, uh, to make sure I understand the concept, if I, for example, choose to vaccinate based solely on birth dates, would that be randomized? Yes. Okay. And that would be considered a randomized study? Yes. I'm going to hand you what's been marked, what, what is being marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 24. 26. 26. Thank you. Sorry. Mm-hmm. 
This is the Peter Abe study that you and I were talking about earlier, correct? No, uh, this is one of them. Right. This is the study in which Peter Abe found that children who received DPT in the first six months of life versus those who got no vaccines died at ten times the rate, correct? Um, right. And in this study, you earlier said that your concerns with Abe's prior studies that had similar conclusions was that they weren't randomized. But in this study, it was randomized, correct? Because uh, it was, let me, yeah. you know, strike that. Mm. In this study, in this study, the vaccinated versus unvaccinated children were simply vaccinated or unvaccinated purely by the chance of when their, hap when their birthday happened to be. Isn't that correct? Uh, yes, it says they were allocated by uh, birthday. Um, have to, well, let's see. Well, you know, it's not absolutely clear as to how the randomization w was done. Apparently, there were periods of time when they were vaccinating and other periods when they were not vaccinating. I think that if you... Um, have you read the study before, Dr. Plotkin? I, I, I've, I've glanced at it, yes. I, I haven't read it thoroughly. Uh, but um, the... As I said before, um, the, this kind of study is, uh, is useful, there's no doubt about that, but one needs to have some sort of uh, immunological correlate uh, to really confirm that, that, um, uh, that the findings uh, are, uh, are real. Um, the other point is that um, uh, Peter is working in an African community where there is a high mortality to begin with. And uh, that's, of course, because of uh, other uh, f uh, factors. And so w whether um, this would be true in, um, let's say, Denmark uh, or uh, elsewhere uh, is, is not clear. And if my memory serves, uh, attempts to show in Denmark uh, what Peter has found in Africa uh, have not been uh, positive. Are, you, are so, you saying that there's a randomized study in Denmark comparing uh, uh, death actually, rates between DPT and, and T? Uh, uh, it, it was. One uh, second. It was Dr. not. Dr. Plotkin, hold yeah. on, hold on a second. Yeah. I'm sorry, you got to yeah. let me, because the court reporter can't take down both of us talking, okay? I'm asking is, are, is there a study from Denmark that compared children who received DTP versus children who received no vaccines at all that was randomized, like this study was, and that compared the death rate between the two groups? Well, I'd have to go back and look, but my recollection is that uh, because in Denmark uh, everything is registered and they had uh, excellent data on um, vaccines b being given, uh, that they did not find an, uh, an effect on mortality of giving a DTP. But um, regardless, my, my point is that uh, mortality in, in the developed world is relatively rare in, in childhood, whereas in, in Africa um, uh, it's obviously common. 
But I, uh, let me repeat what I said ab about Peter Abbey's work. It's not that I discard it or, or think that uh, his conclusions are, are wrong. What I'm saying is that they are observational data and they have to be confirmed by um, studies of the, the Im immune responses and those have been done only to a certain degree. When you say studies of immune response, what do you mean? Uh, I mean whether the uh, immunity of the child is interfered with by D DTP, that is immunity to other diseases. Mm -hmm. um, and as I mentioned before, um, he has shown that measles has a positive, measles vaccine has a positive effect and that has been confirmed uh, by showing that measles vaccination influences immunity to other diseases. So what you're saying is, is that you don't dispute his findings that at least in this African country, yes. there is a 10 times greater death rate amongst those who got DPT TP in the first six months of life versus those who got no vaccines, correct? I, I don't dispute his findings. I would have to look further to make sure that the populations that were studied were absolutely equal uh, in, um, in other respects. Okay. Um, but uh, again, I, uh, I'm not one who, who uh, discards Peter's studies a priori. Well, because earlier you told me the issue was it wasn't randomized, but now... That, you... that is an important issue, yes. And it is ran this one is randomized. Well, um, Again, uh, I, I just have to be sure that it was randomized, uh, that both groups were vaccinated or non-vaccinated at the same time, rather than sequentially. Yes, because it was done by birthdays. When people came into the clinics, right, um, depending on their birthday, they either got the vaccine or they didn't, correct? I need the 1994. Um. Oh, you know, I don't need it. I don't need it. I have it. I'm sorry. Yeah, correct? Well, subject to my reading is this carefully, uh, it, uh, I agree that uh, he is uh, claiming that it's randomized. So, so DTaP has been used um, around the world for what, 30, 40 years now? 50 years? Um, mainly since the 1990s. Okay. So, mainly the 1990s. 20 and, years. And Peter Abe has been claiming, making this claim, a respected scientist um, whose conclusions you said you take seriously that DTP co might cause more deaths than people it saves. Yeah, I, but I, I, let me just finish my question, please. Um, when do you think this extra science on immunology you think is necessary is going to get done? So we know whether or not DTP is saving more children than it kills. Yeah, well, I would imagine that WHO is looking into it. I don't know that for a fact. But it also has to be pointed out that the vaccine that he's studying is whole cell vaccine. It is not the vaccine being used in the United States. That's right. It, but it is being used in most third world countries, correct? Um, in the vaccines being used in the United States are being used in the U.S. and Europe. The DTP but the DTP, whole, the whole cell vaccine, is used very largely uh, in... Um, uh, Latin America and Africa. In uh, developing and countries? Yes. Any reason that the life of a child in a developing country is not equal to the, that in a first world country? Uh, no, okay. but the whole cell vaccine is considerably cheaper. Um, Dr. Plotkin, I'm going to hand you what's being marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 24. 27? What is that? What does it say 27. on 27. 27. Sorry. Looked like a four to me. 
<coughs> um, got that. Okay, um, this is an, an excerpt from the 1994 IOM report, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, under risk modifying factors, okay, the first sentence there says the committee was able to identify little information pertaining to why some individuals react adversely to vaccines when most do not. Yes. Correct? Mm hmm. Okay. And Handing you what's being marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 28. Um, I'm going to read you an excerpt from this, and I'm going to ask you a question. Okay, Dr. Plotkin? Yes. Okay. It says, both epidemiologic and mechanistic research suggest that most individuals who experience an adverse reaction to vaccines have a pre-existing susceptibility. These predispositions can ex exist for a number of reasons genetic variations in human or micro microbiome DNA, environmental exposures, behaviors, intervening illness, or developmental stage, to name just a few, all of which can interact as suggested graphically in figure 3-1. Some of these adverse reactions are specific to the particular vaccine, while others may not be. Some of these predispositions may be detectable prior to the administration of vaccines. And then skipping down a little, much work remains to be done to elucidate and develop strategies to document the immunologic mechanisms that lead to adverse effects in individual patients. Do you disagree with what the IOM wrote here? Well, not in principle. If if such factors can be identified, uh, so far it has been very difficult to identify uh, so-called predispositions. Isn't that because, Dr. Plotkin, in the science is just not being done to make those identify? Well, uh, uh, some attempts have been made. Uh, there is a whole literature by um, Dr. Poland at the Mayo Clinic uh, on, uh, on, on such, mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, the things that he's studied have been relatively minor uh, reactions. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of any serious large-scale studies that have been done to assess the predispositions that might result in an adverse reaction from a vaccine? Uh, there have been some genetic studies uh, done. By who? Um, as I said, by the Mayo Group in particular, um, and uh, also um, some studies done at Vanderbilt. Okay. Who did the studies at Vanderbilt? Well, um, uh, James Crow was one of the authors. Okay. And what did the studies involve? The studies involved looking uh, at uh, certain um, uh, enzymes, particularly, uh, to see if there was an association uh, with, um, uh, let's see, it was with, um, 
trying to remember which vaccine that was based on. Um, oh, smallpox vaccine. Smallpox. Mm. Is, do people routinely get smallpox vaccine anymore in America? No. Okay. Uh, other than the uh, researcher at Vanderbilt and the one at uh, the Mayo Clinic that you mentioned, um, is there anybody else that you know of that is conducting any serious science to identify what might, what's, uh, would render a child susceptible to a vaccine injury? No, I think the people at British Columbia are doing some work. Who's that? Um, uh, I can't remember the guy's name. Is it Chris Shaw? Sorry? Is his name Chris Shaw? Uh, it could be. Um, it's a whole group of people at British Columbia. Uh huh. And and they've published good good science in this area. Yes. Respectable science. Yes. And and the na and and they are the ones who've looked at aluminum adjuvants injected into lab animals in particular. Correct. They they have done some work with al aluminum adjuvants. Yes. Right. Uh, showing that injecting aluminum can go to different parts of the animal, right? Yes. I just want to make sure we're talking about the same group of scientists mm -hmm. um, at the University of British Columbia. So um, is, <clears throat> so do you recall if it's Chris Shaw and his I, group? I, I don't recall specifically. Is, um, okay. But it's the group at, at the University of British Columbia that's looking in particular at aluminum adjuvants in vaccines, correct? Uh, well... In animal models. They're looking at a lot of different things, uh, including adjuvants. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, understood. Um, okay. And, and other than the group at British Columbia, Mayo Clinic, and Vanderbilt, are you aware of anybody else doing such science? Not that I recall, no. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if anybody would know, it would be you, right, Dr. Plotkin? Well, I don't read, I cannot read every published scientific paper. Right on. Okay. Um, Dr. Plotkin, I'm going to refer to the various forms of aluminum adjuvant. I'm sorry. To uh, various forms of aluminum adjuvant used in vaccines as alum. Is that okay? Yes. Because there are different kinds, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, what is an antigen? An antigen is usually a protein that uh, induces an immune response. Okay. Antigens in killed vaccines, though, produce a very weak immune response, hence the need to add alum to the vaccine formulation, correct? Uh, frequently, not always. Okay. Um, and alum, injected alum can increase the production of all kinds of cytokines, including IL-1, IL-2, IL-6, IL-17, correct? Yes. Uh, alum can be recovered from the injection site months or years after intramuscular injections, correct? Uh, well, it's, yeah, it's possible to uh, f find alum. Uh, of course, aluminum is uh, a frequent, um, what shall I say, is present in all of us. Uh, we ingest a lot of it. I'm asking, talking about injected aluminum. I'm asking, it, can it be recovered from the injection site months or years after intramuscular injection? Uh, I believe it's possible, yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, if I, I want to read a In your book um, that you're holding in front of you, do you know if it says, quote, 
It is established that aluminum salt can be recovered at the injection site months or years after intramuscular injections? Well, I'd have to look at it, but I don't doubt that that's, uh, that could be in the book, yes. Okay. Uh, an antigen um, that is absor absorbed by alum can be taken up by macrophages and dendritic cells. Yes. I'm sorry. No problem. Antigen that is absorbed by alum are taken up by macrophages and dendritic cells. Correct. Macrophages is M-A-C-R-O-P-H-A-G-E-S. Um, macrophages are, are immune cells, correct? Well, they are scavengers, basically. And what do they do? They take up antigens and present them to other cells. So that means that the, uh, um, the alum, as well as the antigen that's bound to it, are taken up by macrophages and dendritic cells, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, aluminum injected into the brain, into the body, can travel to the brain, correct? I don't know that for, uh, for a fact, but I wouldn't be surprised. Have you, you've never seen any studies that show that aluminum injected into the body can travel to the brain? I have not seen such studies, no. Or not read such studies. I'm going to hand you what's being marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 29. Please take a look at that. Did you send it? This study, um, um, do you have a problem with the journal that this study was published in? No. Is is the name of the journal vaccine? Yes. Are you a editor in that journal? Um, I was at one point. Uh, okay. And you consider to that be a prestigious journal? Yes. Okay. So in this study, um, conduct, um, they found that injecting rabbits with aluminum, and then they dissected them, they found aluminum in the brain of the rabbits, correct? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, does that change your opinion of whether injecting aluminum can travel to the brain? Uh, well, it, it shows experimentally that that's the case. I'd have to look at the concentrations that were injected, okay. uh, whether they were reasonable with respect to what's injected into humans. Here's, an, uh, here's another study, here's another study uh, that's being marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 30. In this study involved mice, can you please take a look at it? And that study's from 2009, correct? Yes. Okay. And Ms. Newsma, did number 30 go through for you? Yes. Okay. I'll let you know if I have anything. And that study found um, that injecting aluminum in mice caused... Um, motor deficits and motor neuron degeneration, correct? Uh, apparently, yes, but again, one has to uh, compare the amounts injected with what's, what amounts are injected with vaccines. So in this study, um, the authors um, note that they were 
as attempting to use dose equivalent amounts of alum vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the uh, vaccination schedule. Uh, uh, and uh, I'll pose that as a question, but I'll leave it to you to take, you know, you obviously, it sounds like you've never read the study, so you, um, you'll have, you could take your time. Um. And Dr. Plotkin. Okay, Dr. Um, Dr. Plotkin, there's no question pending about that study anymore. So let's move on. Okay. Okay. Um, so um, are you familiar with a study um, entitled Delivery of Nanoparticles to Brain Metastases of Breast Cancer Using a Cellular Trojan Horse um, from the Indiana University School of Medicine and Rice University? No. Okay. Uh, are you familiar with um, a study from uh, 2013 um, entitled Slow CCL2 Dependent Translocation of Biopersistent Particles from Muscle to Brain? No. <laughs> okay. Um, Are you familiar with the, um, and after this deposition, I'm happy to provide you copies of all these studies. Uh, you can take an opportunity to look at them. Um, are you familiar with a 2015 study entitled highly, uh, oh, actually, you know what, before we continue, I'm going to mark this one. Um, the study I just spoke about, I'm going to mark as 32. Plaintiff's Exhibit 32. I'm going to hand this to you. Yeah, I'll give that to you in a second. Um, in this study, um, if you turn to page 5, you can actually see pictures of the brain of dissected mice injected with aluminum and pictures of the aluminum in the brain. Let me know when you've had an opportunity to look at that. Yes, okay. Okay. Um, that's from 2013. Um, I'm going to show you uh, another study from 2015. I'm being marked a plaintiff's exhibit number 33. Okay. This uh, study involved 155 mice again injected with aluminum, and, a, and again, you can find pictures of the aluminum in the dissected mice in their brains. Uh, since we're running short on time, I'll, I, won't, I won't hand you all the studies on this. Um, but having had an opportunity just for the last few minutes to look at a few of these studies, um, uh, it, do you have any, is it, can aluminum injected into the body travel to the brain? Well, there are experiments suggesting that that, that is, is possible. Okay. Uh, the, um, in particular, there's a, I know there's a French group that's been uh, uh, 
let's say, uh, working on the potential dangers of aluminum, um, as well as the British Columbia group. Uh, what we lack is uh, evidence in humans uh, that um, such phenomena are causing uh, uh, the problems that are being caused in mice, and that may uh, relate to dose issues. Yeah. Isn't that because those, those studies would be unethical, Dr. Plotkin? Um, no, I wouldn't say they'd be un unethical. I would say that looking for uh, aluminum uh, deposits in the brains of people uh, at autopsy, et cetera, uh, uh, that, that's entirely feasible. And, and, and so if they did autopsies of people's brains and they found aluminum, then that would be a cause for concern? Uh, it could be, uh, but one would uh, need to uh, combine that or, or look at the symptoms of the patients who, whose uh, br brains were, are being examined. Uh, I'm going to hand you one final study on this. It's been marked Plaintiff's Exhibit 34. This one, they were very careful, my understanding, is to con give uh, an, uh, to do a number of different dose responses. And different. different doses to see the response. Oh, yeah, this is the French group. That's, that study is the French group, right, that I think you were referring to earlier? Yes. Okay. So, in any event, um, if aluminum bound to antigen does travel to the brain, Dr. Plotkin, and remains there, uh, would that cause an immune activation event in the brain? Uh, I don't know w whether it would or, or not. Okay. Um, Do you think I'm it could, could result in neurodevelopmental disorders? Uh, again, there's no evidence that that's the case. I'm going to hand you what's being marked. Okay. Being handed you what's marked Exhibit 35. Are you familiar with? Uh, let me know. Go ahead. Oh, uh, that's 104. Familiar with this book? No. Okay. Well then, uh, I'll give you a copy today when you leave. Um, okay. Miss Newsman, um, Exhibit Thirty Five is uploading, but it might take just one second. Doctor oh, Plotkin, has an increase in IL six been shown to induce autism-like features in, in lab animals? Um, well, IL six is an inflammatory. A cytokine and uh, its um, relationship to autism, I would say, is not uh, clear, but um, uh, it, it is an important cytokine. Has it been shown to induce autism like features in animals when injected into animals for experimentation? I'm not aware of that, but uh, uh, it's quite possible that that could happen if you use enough IL-6. Do you know the maximum amount? Um, strike that. No. No, I don't have time to do the marking. Um, are you familiar with the study um, out of, uh, uh, do you, are you familiar with the study uh, entitled Inhibition of IL-6 Trans Signaling in the Brain Increases Social Ability in the BTBR Mouse Model of Autism? <laughs> no. Okay. Are you familiar with the study 
called maternal immune activation alters fetal brain development through interleukin-6? Uh, I th v vaguely, yes. Um, yeah. Um, Published in the Journal of Neuroscience? Uh, yeah, well, I don't remember the journal. Is that one of the journals you consider respectable? Yes. Okay. And um, okay. this was out of the uh, University of California Medical Center. Uh, this is from uh, California Institute of Caltech. They, that institution did a number of studies regarding mm -hmm. immune activation and its effects, right? Mm -hmm. Respected group. I'm sorry, repeat the question. Sorry, that, that group did a number of studies related to immune activation and neurological disorder, correct? Yes. And they found a connection between immune activation and neurological disorders, correct? Mm hmm. Okay. And one of the, is that a yes? yes. Okay. And one of the studies, findings they had was that immune activation um, alters fetal brain development through interleukin-6, correct? As I said before, IL-6 is an important cytokine. Um, uh, the, um, uh, I, I would point out in relation to immune activation that immune activation occurs as a result of disease and exposure uh, to a variety of stimuli, not, not just vaccines. But it can be caused by vaccines, correct? Immune activation is the objective of vaccines. <clears throat> Do you know the maximum amount of aluminum that is injected into a child who follows the CDC schedule? Um, I haven't done the arithmetic, but it, I th believe it would amount to several milligrams. Mm -hmm. Mark these. Mark these two. I'll mark this one. Um, I'm going to hand you what's been marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 36. Okay. Um, and before I do that, question for you. Um, the group out of the British Columbia that you were t um. the group out of the University of British Columbia that's out of the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences uh, yeah All right. and, uh, okay Well, uh, I'm going to hand you uh, a letter from what's been marked as Exhibit 36, which is a letter from oh, one of the professors that runs the lab in that group. We have four minutes left on the desk. Okay. Um, Have you seen this letter before? No. Okay. Uh, this letter is from the group at the University of British Columbia you mentioned before, correct? Yes. And it's uh, addressed to the to HHS, correct? Uh, yes. As well as NIH, <clears throat> yes. FDA, and CDC, correct? Yes. Okay. In the first paragraph, um, can you read the first paragraph? I am writing to you in regard to aluminum adjuvants and vaccines. The subject of one is one my laboratory works on intensively and therefore where I feel that I have some expertise. In particular, we have studied the impact of aluminum adjuvants in animal models of neurological disease, including aut autism spectrum disorder. Our relevant studies on the general topic of aluminum neurotoxicity in general and specifically in regard to adjuvants are cited below. Now, can you read the last sentence in the next paragraph? Um, in children, there is growing evidence that aluminum adjuvants may disrupt developmental processes in the central nervous system and therefore contribute to ASD in susceptible children. Uh, and, so, one, and just the next paragraph. I, despite the foregoing, 
the safety of aluminum adjuvants in vaccines has not been properly studied in humans, uh, even though pursuant to the recommended vaccine schedule published by the Centers for Disease Control, a baby may be injected with up to 3.675 micrograms of aluminum adjuvant by six months of age. And just the next sentence, I'm, I guess we can wrap up. In regards to the above, it is my belief that the CDC's claim on its website that vaccines do not cause autism is wholly unsupported. So uh, my comments are one that my estimate was pretty much correct. Uh, second, that um, unfortunately, Dr. Shaw has been associated with um, the party that I mentioned before, uh, Tom Lujanovic, uh, who, uh, in my view, is completely untrustworthy as far as scientific data are concerned. So I'm concerned about uh, Dr. Shaw uh, being influenced by uh, that individual. And um, uh, the, um, I'm not aware that there is evidence that aluminum uh, disrupts de developmental processes in susceptible children. Uh, Dr. Shaw is a scientist that studies aluminum regularly, correct? Yes. Do you study aluminum regularly? No. Okay. Are we done? Yeah. Okay. This ends take four of the deposition of Dr. Stanley Plotkin. We are going off the record. The time is 1603. Beginning of this number five of the deposition of Dr. Stanley Plotkin. We are on the record, the time is 1643. Well, Dr. Plotkin, I'm handing you what has been marked as Plaintiffs Exhibit 37 and 38. Um, are these letters also written by individuals who are very experienced in studying aluminum adjuvant? Uh, yes, well, one of the letters okay. is from a French group. And I would point out that uh, the French Remember, government. Yes or no answer, Dr. Plotkin. We're trying to get you out of here, out of there. Um, yes. Okay. And um, did he, is the content of these letters similar to that of the letter from Chris Shaw? Yes. Okay. Dr. Plotkin, I'm going to hand you what's uh, been marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 39. Okay. Um, this is a study entitled Aluminum in the Brain Tissue in Autism, correct? Yes. Okay, and it was a, published in the Journal of Trace Elements in Medicine and Biology, correct? Yes. Okay, and it found, and according to its author, he found what he says is some of the highest values of aluminum in human tissue yet recorded in the brains of, of these autistic children who died prematurely, correct? Uh, well, I'd have to read the paper, but um, uh, apparently that's the case. Okay. And do you know that uh, the standout observation in this study is that the aluminum that he found was in the immune cells of the brain, including within immune cells traveling into the brain? Um, yes. Um, but they were not associated with neurons. They also found aluminum in, in the neurons as well, Dr. Plotkin, correct? But mostly in other cells. In immune-related cells, right? Immune system-related cells. Cells that travel, yes. Okay. What is encephalitis? Inflammation of the brain. What is encephalopathy? Um, well, it's a vague term that means something's wrong with the brain. And what is encephalomyelitis? Inflammation of the brain. Do all five of the deep tap containing vaccines sold in this country list encephalopathy within seven days of a prior pertussis containing vaccine as a contraindication? Uh, in other words, if encephalitis is present at the time of vaccination? M meaning, yes, I imagine so. No, meaning that if there was encephalopathy within seven days of a prior pertussis-containing vaccination, 
that's a contraindication to getting more pertussis vaccination. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and do all three of the hepatitis A containing vaccines sold in this country list encephalitis or encephalopathy as a reported adverse reaction in section 6.2 of their product inserts? Well, I don't know that for sure, but I imagine that it is a contraindication. Do all three of the hepatitis B containing vaccines sold in this country list either encephalitis or encephalopathy as a reported adverse reaction in section 6.2 of their product insert? Yes. Do almost all of the flu vaccines sold in this country list encephalopathy or encephalitis? Sorry, I'm sorry. Do almost all of the flu vaccines sold in this country list encephalopathy or encephalomyelitis as a reported adverse reaction in 6.2? Yes. Of their insert? Yes. Uh, does the only chickenpox vaccine sold in this country list encephalitis as a reported adverse reaction? Inception? Yes. Okay. Why do you think brain swelling after vaccination is being reported in all of these vaccines? Anything that happens after vaccination is included in contraindications. That they are related causally is uh, not necessarily the case. Mm -hmm. What is the total quantity of antigen in most pediatric vaccines? Well, that's very variable. I mean, um, uh, perhaps <coughs> up to 50 milligrams. Um, depends entirely on, on the vaccine. Minuscule amount, though? It's very yes. tiny. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's almost, could you even see it with the naked eye if you had it? Yeah. You could you in could, some cases, yes. Some cases. Mm -hmm. But for most vaccines, it would probably be very difficult. Yes. Okay. Um, are there any ingredients in vaccines that you're aware of that can damage neurons? <laughs> Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay. Are there any vaccines, any ingredients vaccines that you're aware of that can damage human cells? Oh, well, I mean, that depends on the concentrations and, and so forth. Uh, human cells, of course, are susceptible to lots of uh, uh, substances, um, but again, it's very much dependent on the concentration. Do any of the vaccines on the childhood uh, schedule contain monkey kidney cells? Uh, well, the polio vaccine uh, does. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, that's, I'll stop there. Okay. Are the monkey kidneys uh, used in making the polio vaccine removed from the monkey while the animal is still alive? Um, these days, um, much of the polio vaccine is produced in a continuous cell line of derived from monkeys rather than from um, monkeys, from live monkeys, so to speak. Um, so um, I, I'm pretty sure that the IPOL vaccine, for example, is produced in Vero cells. Okay. And when you say continuous cell line, what do you mean by that? I mean a, 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 a cell that grows continuously derived from uh, tissues that were normal tissues to begin with. I'm sorry. Say that again, Doctor. So they are, they are cells that continue to multiply, uh, uh, unlike cells from a, let's say, from a kidney that will not continuously multiply. These are cells derived from the kidney that uh, will continue to multiply and therefore can be used to make vaccines in. So, uh, cells that continue to multiply unabated are con typically considered cancerous, right? Well, uh, if, it depends on the, the circumstances and the cells, but uh, it's true that cancer cells do continue to replicate in, indefinitely. The Vero cells are only used at certain passage levels. They're, they're not used, you know, a, a thousand passages further on. Um, in relation to the amount of polio antigen in the final polio vaccine product, how much 
monkey kidney cell material is there in the final product? Is it about the same amount? Is there more monkey kidney cell? Is there uh, less? No, I, 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 I can't give you a figure offhand, but um, the, um, uh, I am uh, pretty sure that the amount of polio antigen is superior to the amount of kidney antigen. But you're not sure? I, I don't recall the exact amounts. Okay. Monkey cellular material remaining in the vaccine is considered either impurities or byproduct of the manufacturing process, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, do any of the vaccines in the childhood vaccine schedule contain blood serum from calves or other bovines? Well, um, uh, they frequently calf serum is used uh, to make the vaccine, but uh, calf serum is removed before uh, the vaccine is used because you don't want to uh, sen uh, um, sensitize the vaccinee to, uh, to cows. M meaning if, if there was cow serum remaining in the vaccine, the child could develop antibodies to essentially yes. cow Yes. Cow products. And yes. that, would, that would be, and they could develop an allergy to it, right? If, the, if there were, yes. If there were calf serum in the vaccines, correct? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So, but you're saying there's no calf serum in vaccines, right? It is removed, yes. Dr. Plock, I'm going to hand you what's in Marcus Plaintiff's Exhibit 40. What is this? Uh, vaccine Excipient and Media Summary. Okay, and who produces this document? The CDC, correct? Or the um, FDA? I think it's the FDA. Okay, and this lists the ingredients contained in various vaccines, correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. Can you go to Kinrix on the first page? That's K-I-N-R-I-X. Yes. DTAP IPV. Do you see in the third line down, it says calf serum? Yeah, well, that is used to grow the polio virus. Uh -huh. Right. And this is one of the ingredients that remains in the vaccine. I do not believe so. Okay. I mean, the vaccine, as I said, is made uh, using calf serum as a nutrient, uh, but uh, is, is then uh, um, removed. Because removed. otherwise it would yes. be dangerous, you said, right? Yes. Can you go to the top of this document? You see it says, uh, you know what? Let me ask you a few other questions, and then we'll come back to this document, Dr. Plotkin. Few quick questions, and we'll come back to it. Um, do any vaccines on the childhood schedule contain embryonic guinea pig cell cultures? Embryonic guinea pig. Uh, I don't think any current vaccine is made in guinea pig cells. Varicella uh, vaccine was passaged in guinea pig cells, uh, but uh, certainly not made in guinea pig cells. Do you know if any vaccines contain cow's milk in it? Or products cow's from milk? Cow, any product derived from cow's milk? Any component derived from oh, cow's well, milk? Oh, well, it could be, uh, casein, for example, could be. Casein? Uh, yes. Casein, I think it's. Uh, could be used. Um, um, and Dr. Plotkin, um, Dr. Plotkin, um, and, and, and if a, there was casein in the vaccine, the child could become sensitized to that, correct? Well, I'm not sure about that. You're not sure um, anymore about that? No, I, I yeah. think there are other sensitizing 
things in calf serum. Uh-huh. Uh, Dr. Paul, can I see that one second? Let me make sure I, did I give you the right one. I'm not sure I got too far. Um, it, so earlier you said, uh, okay, so do, do any vaccines contain egg protein? Oh, uh, yes, influenza. And vaccines. do those remain in the final product? Uh, I believe they do, yes. Um, not huge amounts, but um, there are traces, certainly. Do any vaccines contain gelatin from pigs? Uh, yes. Okay. Do any vaccines contain gelatin from cows? Um, actually, I think in Muslim countries they have tried to do that, um, but mostly uh, it's from pig. Do any vaccines contain recombinant GMO yeast? Recombinant GMOs. Um, yes, I imagine so, yes. Are there any other animal products, parts, cells, material, or any other kind that you are aware of that are contained in any vaccine in the pediatric schedule? Um, well, aside from trace amounts, no. Yeah. Guys, unfortunately, my five o'clock's here, so I got to cut this short. Well, we're, we're not, we're not done. So, um, um, we need to, you know, so we're going to, can you come back tomorrow morning, Dr. Plotkin? No, absolutely not. Okay, well, council, we, we need to, we, how long is your, you need to move whatever you have right now then. Uh, because no, I don't. I, I, I'm not done with the deposition. Um, then you re notice it for a second day. I, I don't know, the, the notice says from day to day, he's under subpoena, he needs to be here no, today. It's only, it's only five o'clock. And it says from day to day, so tomorrow is the next day. If he's not available, he's not available. You guys can feel free to try and have him held in contempt while he's in Pennsylvania, but I got to go. How well, long are you available in a half an hour or something that we could take a short break? Yeah, I can do that. Okay, so then we'll let us know when you're done. Half an hour? We'll start at 530 then, or if oh, you get done earlier. What, does she have to be present? Uh, do you mind... If we continue without you being present, Dr. Plotkin says he's fine with continuing without as you. As long as he's okay with that, that's fine with me. I think he's got a pretty good handle on things, so okay. I'm not too concerned. Okay, great. Then we'll continue. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank Ms. you. Ms. Newsom, if you want to rejoin the conversation, obviously you can dial back in. So. Yeah, I'm just going to leave you guys on speaker in my office and do this in the conference room, and I'll be back. Okay. <clears throat> do any vaccines on the childhood vaccine schedule contain MRC5 human diploid cells? Yes. What are these? Uh, rubella, uh, varicella, hepatitis A. Um, let's see. Um, mm -hmm. What are MRC5 cells? They are human fibroblast uh, cell strain. Okay, and, and how are they created? They were created by uh, taking uh, fetal tissue and um, uh, from a particular uh, fetus that was uh, aborted uh, by maternal choice uh, and the cells, uh, the so-called fibroblast cells were cultivated uh, from, um, uh, from that tissue. Uh, the fibroblast cells replicate for about 50 passages and then die. So MRC5 cells are uh, the cultured cell lines from aborted fetal tissue? They're not cell lines. They're what are they? Cell strains uh, cultivated from uh, an aborted fetus, yes. So cell strains from yes. an aborted fetus? Yeah, they're not immortal. Okay, so they, they live for five generations and then they die? About 50 generations. About 50 generations and then they die? Yes. And then how is more MRC5 created? Well, uh, a, um, a seed stock 
is made of early passage cells so that one can go back to the seed stock, uh, which is, let's say, at the more or less the eighth passage, and make new cells at the uh, 20th passage and use those to make the vaccine. Okay. And so these are, these cell strains are human cells? Yes. Okay. Um, do any vaccines on the childhood vaccine schedule contain WI-38 human diploid lung fibroblasts? Well, they used to, but I don't think anything is made in those cells anymore. They have been replaced by MRC5. So you're not aware of any vaccine that has in its final formulation WI-38 human diploid lung fibroblasts? Uh, well, as I said, at w one point in the past, um, uh, RA-27-3, for example, rubella vaccine was grown in WI-38, uh, but um, the supply is insufficient, so MRC-5 is now used. Okay. And uh, these and, and, and WI-38 was created from an aborted fetus? Yes. They took the lung tissue from the aborted fetus? Yes. And from that, they've grown the cell line, correct? Yes. Okay. Cell strain. Cell strain. And okay. is this cell line immortal? No. Do any vaccines in the childhood vaccine schedule contain human albumin? Oh, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. What is human albumin? Human albumin is part of human serum. And what is human serum? What's, what is human serum? Human serum is part of the blood that is liquid. Right. It's the non-red blood cell part of the, of the yes. blood, right? Uh, from where was it obtained? The human serum? Yes. Well, that is, would be variable uh, from donors um, uh, who are healthy do donors. Uh, that's all, all, I, all I could say to that. How is it used in the manufacturing process? I'm sorry? How is it used in the manufacturing process? Well, uh, the serum is used to keep cells healthy. Uh, during the um, process of making a vaccine. So in other words, uh, since the uh, vaccines or some vaccines have to be grown <laughs> um, in, um, in cells, you have to keep the cells in a, in a, in a good state. Mm -hmm. So the cells that are to use the, the virus or bacteria the virus is used in some of the vac sorry. sorry, the virus is used in some of the vaccines are grown in this human blood component. Well, yes, um, I, um, I, I believe that the uh, serum is removed uh, in the final product, but um, certainly uh, it's important to keep the cells healthy during the manufacture of the vaccine. Do you think that, so, so none of it remains in the final product? I don't believe so, no. Yeah, because that could be problematic, right? Well, it could be. I mean, if, uh, if the uh, individual is not, not healthy. Mm -hmm. um, right, or, or if maybe some of the, you know, uh, human blood components bind to some of the aluminum and develop antibodies, self-antibodies, correct? If they develop antibodies against a serum component, that would not be good. Right. Um, what, do any vaccines contain human material um, in them that... I'm sorry. Strike that. Apologies. Uh, do any vaccines on the childhood vaccine schedule contain recombinant human al albumin? Yes. Okay. What is this? Sorry? What, what is recombinant human albumin? It's made, it's albumin. Sorry, uh, recombinant human albumin, that's A-L-B-U-M-I-N. Yeah? Yeah, so it's um, a component of human serum, which is uh, useful to stabilize uh, cells and keep them healthy. Okay. 
uh, and it's made um, uh, by genetic engineering. Okay, so it's genetically engineered human serum, basically. A part of human serum, yes. Okay. Uh, is that, are these genetically engineered protein structures? Yes, and the idea was to eliminate any possibility of a contaminant from uh, human albumin uh, obtained from donors. So it's made in, uh, in cells uh, uh, using the, the, uh, the DNA for albumin, uh, and that way one can be sure that there's no contaminant. And again, you pretty much want to make sure that none of that remained in the final product too, right? Um, well, human albumin is probably not much of a problem in terms of, of causing reactions. So, But in terms of it potentially binding to the alum, that could be problematic, correct? Well, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I, okay. The vaccines that contain human material in them, they also contain human DNA and protein, correct? They may, yes. Okay. Uh, isn't it true that human DNA in vaccines is typically purposely fragmented to below 500 base pairs in length? Yes, uh, one doesn't, you know, I, I would say mostly um, for theoretical reasons, doesn't want to uh, put uh, DNA uh, in, into uh, attack DNA uh, into vaccines. Okay. Um, I think the the actual risk is zero, but uh, that's my opinion. Uh, isn't it true that MMR two contains approximately 150 nanograms cell substrate, double strand DNA, and single strand DNA per dose, purposely fragmented to approximately 215. Yeah. Base pairs in length? Yeah, that's probably correct, yes. Okay. Uh, and is it true that Varivax, vaccine for chickenpox, is manufactured using WI-38 and MRC-5? It yes. contains approximately 2 micrograms of cell Sorry. substrate. No problem. And contains... Just wait for the whole thing too, Dr. Yeah. Please. And contains approximately... Two micrograms of cell substrate, double-stranded DNA, or approximately one trillion fragments of human DNA. It may, it may be true. Okay. Um, isn't it true that Havrix, a hepatitis A vaccine, also contains millions of fragments of human DNA? Likely. Do you know whether strands of DNA below 500 base pairs are now known? to insert themselves into living cells with which they come into contact? Uh, I do not have that information, but the likelihood that they would uh, be genetically included in the genome of vaccinees, in my view, is zero. Do you have a study to support that view? Uh, I do not have a study that supports that view, but it is, uh, to me, unlikely that the DNA would travel from the site of injection to the semen or the, uh, the ovaries. Could it insert itself into DNA, in, in, even in the, in the muscle tissue, or it, if it gets into the blood? into Theoretically, but that's not going to mean that it's go going to have any impact on the individual. Are you familiar with the... In, were you familiar with insertional mutagenesis? Yes. Okay. Do you have any study to show that injecting millions of pieces of human DNA into babies and children is safe? The only studies are all the safety studies that have been done on vaccines. Okay. And you can produce those studies, right? Well, those studies are uh, available from the manufacturers and, uh, and from CDC. And uh, I'm not aware of any data showing that a her heritable characteristic was transmitted by a vaccine. Mm -hmm. 
so you don't so you don't personally don't know of any study that shows the safety of injecting human millions of pieces of human DNA into babies. Such studies are general safety studies, and I haven't yet seen a vaccinee uh, develop a new genetic trait as a result of vaccination. It's possible that it can cause cancer? Anything is possible, but there are no data that support that. Is there data to show that it doesn't do that? Yes. Okay. And Observations <laughs> made over millions of vaccinees. Okay. And you have the study to show that, right? The studies are uh, easily available in terms of vaccine safety studies that have been done by many, many people. Excellent. Then it should be very easy for you to direct the, me to those and, and provide yes, copies. Yes, you can Wonderful. read the chapter on vaccine safety. Uh, vaccines contain dead or weakened polio virus, correct? Uh, IPV does, yes. Okay. Uh, beginning in the 1950s, polio vaccines were routinely grown on non-human primate kidney cells, correct? Correct. Are you aware of any simian, monkey, viruses, meaning viruses that come from primates, that contaminated polio vaccines and infected individuals receiving the polio vaccine? Yes, SV40. And what does SV40 stand for? Simian virus 40. Okay. And what, was it the 40th simian virus found? Is that yes. why it's called? Are you aware of any other simian viruses that, that, uh, that are in any vaccine? Uh, at this stage, no. Okay. Are you aware of any bovine virus that is in any vaccine? Um, well, um, bovine virus. Nothing comes to mind at the moment. Are you aware of any virus from any animal other than simian or bovine that is in any vaccine? Yes, uh, there's a, a pig virus uh, present in uh, one of the rotavirus vaccines. What's that virus called? Uh, circovirus. Circo. Yes. Is there more than one type or is there only one? Oh, there's more than one type, but I think only one was recovered uh, from the vaccine. Uh -huh. Which one is that? I think it was two. Circovirus two? I think so. Okay. Are you aware of any retroviruses that are in any vaccine? Retroviruses? No. Are you aware of any prions that are in any vaccine? No. Are you aware of any human viruses that are in any vaccine apart from the virus for which the vaccine is intended? No. You indicated that they did find a porcine circovirus type 2 in rotavirus, correct? Yes. Was that unintentional? Yes. When it was released to the market, they didn't know that virus was in there, correct? Correct. And then when they released the polio vaccine on the market, they didn't know SV40 was in there, correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, are you aware of how many micrograms of 2-phenoxyethanol? How do you pronounce oh, two it? 2-phenoxyethanol. Yeah. Uh, are you aware of how many micrograms of 2-phenoxyethanol a child following the childhood vaccine schedule would be injected with? No, I'd have to look that up. Do you think it's close to around 100 micrograms? It could be, but I'd have to look it up. Do you know the safe level in terms of that ingredient? Uh, I am not aware that there, um, uh, that there is toxicity associated with uh, 2-phenoxy and ethanol. It's a okay. fairly harmless substance as far as I'm aware. Do you know any vaccines on the childhood schedule that include ferric nitrate? Ferric nitrate. Uh, 
No, I don't recall that. Uh, are you aware of how many micrograms of polysorbate 80 a child following the vaccine schedule will be injected with? Uh, I don't have the amount, uh, no. <clears throat> now, I'm going to give you back Exhibit 40, Dr. Plotkin. Take a look at that a moment. Um, you indicated that you weren't aware that WI-38 was in the final vaccine product. If you could turn to page three for MMR and MMRV. Do you see that within the ingredient list that lists WI-38 human diploid lung fibroblasts? Uh, yes, I do see that. Um, I believe that of the ingredients that we discussed till now, the rest of them you indicated you, you are aware is, are in vaccines except for, um, are there any ingredients we've discussed till now that you, you um, believe are not in vaccines? Huh. Uh, well, I'd have to go back over all the questions you, you asked. Uh, but I do want to say that WI-38, as I said before, was the original fibroblast cell line. And I, I think that manufacturers have shifted to MRC-5, but WI-38 uh, could still be used, and I don't see any, um, uh, anything wrong with that. Okay. Are there any vaccine ingredients that are not listed on the FDA's official vaccine excipient and media summary table that you're aware of? <laughs> I don't see how I can really answer that question without reading the, the, the whole thing, but I imagine that it's a complete list. Okay. Um, isn't it true that an adjuvant will bind not only to the target antigen but also to the impurities and byproduct of the manufacturing process? Probably, probably yes. Okay. okay. And those impurities and byproducts are all listed in what has been marked as exhibit number 40, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, once the uh, impurities or byproducts um, are bound to the aluminum, the body may also develop antibodies to these impurities and byproducts, correct? May is the operative word, but not necessarily. Okay. The entire purpose of the aluminum binding to a protein structure, be it an antigen or some other protein structure, is to cause an immune response to yes, develop antibodies, correct? Yes, but the protein has to be of the right size and presentation in order to induce an immune response. Mm -hmm. And that will not always be the case if the protein is small uh, or um, uh, is something not recognized by the human immune system. Mm -hmm. Do you know whether the protein structure for any of the ingredients on Exhibit 40 are not the right size to bind to alum? Well, I think it's um, uh, unlikely that monosodium glutamate, for example, uh, will, um, uh, will uh, cause an immune response. Um, uh, I have to look through the, the whole thing, but um, uh, amino acids probably are unlikely to induce an immune response. Anything else? You want me to read this whole thing? Well, no, thing? I'm just asking, I mean, in terms of just, just the stuff that's got protein structures in it. Uh, well, things like calf serum, if they were present, would, uh, uh, would uh, possibly induce an immune response. But um, the things on this uh, list, the vast majority of them are unlikely to do so. Because they're not protein structures. They're not proteins or they're, or they're very small. Okay. Um, uh, 
other than the um, strike that. Uh, How about, and we talked earlier, human albumin, that would be of a big enough protein structure to bind to alum, correct? It could, although the fact that it's human uh, means that um, individuals might well not respond uh, to, um, uh, that is, not respond to albu human albumin as a foreign protein. Right, maybe not alone, right, but a bound to alum, then it might, correct? It might, but... I'm not aware of evidence that it does. Are you, are you aware of a study that looked at that issue? Uh, I have not read such a study, no. Okay. How about the human DNA? Do you believe that the, the human DNA strands can bind to the alum? No. Why is that? I don't see any chemical reason why it should. Any reason why it shouldn't? <laughs> Proving a negative is always more, more difficult. Well, I'm just trying to know if you, if you know or you're just you're not sure. That's all. I'm not asking... I'm just saying, if you don't know, just say you don't know. That's I have fine. no reason to believe that DNA will bind to albumin. But you don't know for sure? I have not done the experiment, no. Okay. And do you know whether it will bind to um, any of the cellular debris from MRC5 or WI38? Uh, whether human albumin would bind? No, whether alum would bind to MRC5 or any of the cellular debris that's in the final product from MRC5? Uh, I, 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 th I think it could, but I don't know that it does. Do you know whether alum could bind to any of the cellular debris from WI38? It might, but I don't know that for a fact. Do you know whether alum would bind to any of the gelatin from pigs? Uh, I think that's unlikely. Why is that? Uh, I don't think that alum will bind to gelatin, but I don't know that for a fact. What about egg protein? Could alum bind to egg protein? Possibly. Okay. And to casein? Uh, I suppose it's possible, but I'm not aware of any evidence. But you don't know? I don't know. In, um, in, uh, so in, um, okay, <clears throat> in your work related to vaccines, uh, how many fetuses have been part of that work? My own personal work, two. So in, your, uh, in all of your work related to vaccines throughout your whole career, you've only ever worked with two fetuses? Uh, in terms of making vaccines, yes. Um, yes. I'm going to hand you... I'm going to hand you what's been marked Plaintiff's Exhibit 41, okay? Are you familiar with this article, Dr. Plotkin? Yes. 
Okay. Are you listed as an author on this article? Yes. Okay. This study took place at the Wistar Institute, correct? Yes. You were at the Wistar Institute, correct? Yes. How many fetuses were used in the study described in this article? Uh, quite a few, um, but my answer to my, the previous question was, what did I use to make vaccines? And the answer was two. Uh, can you read back the question I had asked? Just now, no, prior. In your work related to vaccines, how many fetuses have been part of that work? Answer my own personal work, too. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to ask that question again. In your work related to vaccines, how many vac fetuses were involved in that work? There were only two fetuses involved in making vaccines uh, when um, uh, uh, fetal uh, strains, uh, fibroblast strains, uh, were first developed. I was involved in that uh, work trying to characterize those cells, but they were not used to make vaccines. Wasn't the purpose of this study to help develop a human cell line or to support the use of human cell lines in the creation of vaccines? The idea was to study the uh, cell strains from fetuses to determine whether or not they could be used to make vaccines. So this was related to your work? Well, yes, in, in, a, in a sense, to yes. vaccines, correct? Yes. It was preparatory. Okay. So this study involved 74 fetuses, correct? Well, I don't remember exactly how many. To turn to page 12 of the study. You know, 76. 76. Mm -hmm. And uh, these fetuses uh, were th all three months or older when aborted, correct? Yes. Okay. And these were all normally developed fetuses, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, these included fetuses that were aborted for social and psychiatric reasons, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, what organs did you harvest from these fetuses? Well, I didn't personally harvest any but uh, a, a whole range of uh, tissues were harvested um, by uh, co-workers. Okay. And these pieces were then cut up into little pieces, right? Yes. And they were cultured? Yes. Okay. Um, some of the pieces of the fetuses were pituitary gland that were, that were chopped up into pieces to, mm -hmm. okay, included the lung of the fetuses? Yes. Okay, included the skin? Yes. Kidney? Yes. Spleen? Yes. Heart? Y yes. Yeah, and, and tongue? <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't recall, but yeah, probably yes. Um, so, uh, I, I just want to make sure I understand. In, in, in your entire career, and this was just one study, so I'm going to ask, I'm gonna ask you again. In your t entire career, how many fetuses have you worked with? Um, well, I don't remember the exact number, but uh, quite a few when we were studying them uh, originally before we decided to use them to make vaccines. Do you have any sense? I mean, this one study had 76. How many other studies did you have that you used aborted fetuses oh, for? Oh, I, I don't remember how many. You're, you're aware, are you aware that the one of the... Uh, objections to vaccination by the plaintiff in this case is the inclusion of aborted fetal tissue in the development of vaccines and the fact that it's actually part of the ingredients of vaccines? Yeah, I'm aware of those objections. The okay. uh, Catholic Church has actually issued a document on that which says that individuals who need the vaccine should receive the vaccines regardless of the fact and that, uh, that uh, um, I, I think it implies that I am the individual who will go to hell because of the use of aborted yeah. tissues, which you, I am glad do you know if, to do. Okay. Do you know if the mother is Catholic? I have no idea. Okay. Um, 
So but she should consult her priest. If she has a, if, if she's in fact Christian, I guess, right? Mm-hmm. In, in any event. Um, uh, so we have 76 in this study. Would you approximate it's been a few hundred fetuses? Oh, no, I don't think it was that many. Okay. It was probably not many more than in this paper. Uh-huh. And I should stipulate that we had nothing to do with the uh, cause of the abortion. Mm-hmm. Um, some of these are from psychiatric institutions, correct? Uh, actually, uh, all I can say is that uh, the the fetuses that I personally worked with actually came from Sweden uh, 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 from a Swedish co-worker uh, uh, and so uh, I uh, in no case uh, was able to determine w- what exactly the reason for the abortion was. I'm just asking you, some of the fetuses that you did use did come from abortions from people who were in psychiatric institutions, correct? I don't know that. And what I'm telling you is that I got them from a co-worker, and uh, if it's stated in the paper, it's true, but otherwise, I do not know. Okay, so if it's in the paper, you don't contest it, right? I don't contest it, Okay. No. Um, have you ever used orphans to study an experimental vaccine? Yes. Okay. Have you ever used the mentally handicapped to study an experimental vaccine? Um, I don't recollect ever doing studies in uh, mentally handicapped individuals. Um, uh, at the time, in the 1960s, it was not an uncommon uh, practice. Uh, so... Um, you're saying I'm, I'm not clear on your answer. I'm sorry. Did you? Did you? Have you ever used the mentally handicapped to study an experimental vaccine? What I'm saying is I don't re- recall specifically having done that, but that um, in the 1960s it was not unusual to do that, and I I wouldn't deny that uh, I may have done so. Okay. I've already marked this. I know, but that was wrong. Okay. Um, I'm going to read you a sentence from what's been previously marked as uh, no, that wasn't. Exhibit 7. That's not what got marked as Exhibit 7. That got the task force was 7. Oh. So this should be 42. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Got it. Okay. So, and, and well, in any event, he's you're you're not denying that 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 you that you uh, well. Look, look. There's an article entitled "Attenuation of RA273 Rubella Virus in WI38 Human Diploid Cells." Are you familiar with that article? Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, in that article, one of the things it says uh, is thirteen is is one of the things it says is thirteen. Seronegative, mentally retarded children were given RA-273 vaccine. Okay, well, then that's, in that case, that's what I did. Okay. Um, have you ever expressed that it's better to perform experiments on those less likely to be able to contribute to society, uh, such as children with handicap, than with children without or adults without handicaps? Um, I don't remember specifically, but it's uh, possible. Uh, And again, I repeat that in the 1960s, uh, that was more or less uh, common practice. Um, I've since changed my mind, but um, uh, those were, that was a long time ago. Do you remember ever writing a, uh, to the editor of Ethics on Human Experimentation? 
Uh, I don't remember specifically, but I may well have. Okay. Um, we'll mark this. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to hand you what's marked as Exhibit 43. Do you recognize uh, this letter you wrote to the editor? Yes. Okay. Is, did you write this letter? Yes. Okay. Um, is one of the things you wrote um, the question is whether we are to have experiments performed on fully functioning adults and on children who are potentially contributors to society or to perform initial studies in children and adults who are human in form but not in social potential. Yes. Okay. It may be objected that this question implies a Nazi philosophy, but I do not think that it is difficult to distinguish non-functioning persons from members of ethnic, racial, economic, or other groups. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Have you ever used babies of mothers in prison to study an experimental vaccine? Yes. Have you ever used individuals under col colonial rule to study an experimental vaccine? Yes. Okay. Did you do so in the Belgian Congo? Yes. Did that experiment involve almost a million people? Well, um, well, all, all right, I yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you ever visit what was the Belgian Congo and Rundi Urundi? Yes. How many times? Once. Uh, yes. R U A N D A dash U R U N D I. Uh, when was that visit? 1959. And how long were you there? No, a couple of months. T two months? I think so, yes. Could it have been longer? No, I don't think it was longer than okay. that. What places did you visit? <laughs> what was then called Leopoldville, Stanleyville, um, um, uh, Kivu. Um, Kivu? Yes. K-I-V-U? Uh, yes, Burundi. Okay. Um, Miss Newsom, are you back? I am. Uh-huh. Um, uh, there could have been a couple of other places, but I don't remember. Okay. I've heard you talk. I've heard some of your in some of your speeches. You you remember this trip fondly, I, right? Well, fondly may not be the right word, but I do re remember it as an important event. Yeah. In what order did you visit the places you just told me? Which one do you think you visit first? Leopoldville. Okay, and then after that? Um, Stanleyville. Then? Uh, then the eastern part of the Congo. Is that Kivu? Uh, yeah. Okay. And um, Bukavu. Bukavu. Is that before or after Burundi? Before. Can you spell those? Uh, can you spell Bukavu? B-U-K-A-V-U. So Leopoldville, then Stanleyville, then Kivu, uh, Bukum, and then Burundi. So how, um, uh, how long were you in Leopoldville? Oh, gosh. I, I, don't, I can't answer that question. I, Approximately? I don't A couple of weeks, probably. Okay, and then how long is Stanleyville? <laughs> I, I don't know, three, four weeks. I, I can't possibly remember that far okay. back. And then Kelong Kibu approximately? Oh, short time. Okay. And then Bukum? I'm sorry? Bukum? Oh, Bukavu? Bukavu. I don't, I don't um, know your pronunciations aren't Oh, B-U-K-U-V-B-U-K-A-V-U. A-A-V-U, sorry. Bukavu? Approximately how long? A couple of days. Okay, and then finally Burundi? Uh, again, I don't know, maybe a week, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, what were you doing in Leopoldville? I was examining the data on uh, oral polio vaccination in the city. Okay. Anything else? No. Did you uh, vaccinate anybody? Personally, no. Okay. How about in, uh, what were you doing in Stanleyville? I was visiting the uh, chimpanzee laboratory um, and um, talking to scientists in Stanleyville. Talking about what? Well, about polio mainly. Okay, what about polio? What about polio? Obviously, they were having polio, and it was, we were talking about how to protect uh, the people against polio. Okay. And did you vaccinate anybody while you were in Stanleyville personally? Personally, no. Okay. Um, what did you do in Kivu? As I recall, I just visited the, the place. Any purpose? I don't think so, no. Did you vaccinate anybody personally? That was a um, I'm sorry. scenic area. Okay. Did you vaccinate anybody personally then? No. Okay. What about Bukovu? I did not do any vaccination there either. And what were you doing there? I was just visiting. Like a tourist? Yes. Same thing with Kivu as a tourist? Yes. And what about Burundi? Well, there I had some discussions with... Um, uh, scientists. Okay, about what? About polio. Okay. Did you, uh, other than that, did you do anything else in Burundi? No. Did you vaccinate anybody personally? No. Okay. Uh, during your entire trip, did you vaccinate anybody personally? No. So your whole trip to Belgian Congo and Rwanda, Burundi, you never vaccinated anybody personally? That is correct. I also stopped in Kikwit, uh, which um, was to observe a vaccination campaign. And that was between what cities? Uh, well, geographically, it's between Leopoldville and Stanleyville. Um, I don't recall in what order I visited it. You you don't know if it was before or after Stanleyville? No, I don't. How long were you in Kikwit? Well, just a day or two. And that was just to observe a... Vaccination campaign. campaign. Did you observe a vaccination campaign in, in any of the other cities? Um, mm, Stanleyville, probably. Uh, Leopoldville was, as I said before, to collect data from prior vaccination. Okay. And what were you doing in Rwanda, Urundi? <laughs> Talking to people. Again, about polio vaccine? Yes. But not vaccinating anybody? No. Not part of any vaccination campaign there either? No. Okay. Um... Do you believe that someone can have a valid religious objection to refusing a vaccine? No. Do you take issue with religious beliefs? Yes. Okay. Uh, you have said that, quote, vaccination is always under attack by religious zealots who believe that the will of God includes death and disease? Yes. You stand by that statement? I absolutely do. Okay. Are you an atheist? Yes. Okay. Uh, do you accept that some people hold religious beliefs that are inherently unprovable? Uh, yes, I'm sure they do. Okay. Uh, you said that, quote, vaccination is always under attack by a legal system that profits from the failure of most people to understand risk-benefit ratios or public health issues. Correct? Correct. Yes. Can you explain what you mean by that sh sh shortly? Uh, I mean that the risk from vaccines, for example, is considerably less than the risk from disease, uh, but uh, people don't, don't necessarily understand that. It's uh, similar to the situation where uh, people may, may not fly, but they're willing to drive in cars where the, the, the risks are, are much higher. And what was the second point about... Uh, 
Public health issues. Public health issues, yes. Uh, not understanding the importance of a high vaccination coverage and prevention of disease. One child can make a difference? One child uh, probably doesn't make a difference, but a collection of one child's do make a difference. Um, at the most recent ASIP meeting, uh, you spoke and gave ASIP three pieces of advice, correct? Yes. Right. One of them was to conduct more vaccine safety studies to prove the anti-vaccinationists wrong, right? Yes, correct. Okay. Um, if the science to prove vaccines safe already exists, why would more safety studies be needed to prove the anti-vaccinationists wrong? Because there are so many people, as you can see on the web, who have these um, beliefs about vaccines. And uh, as we have discussed throughout this long day, um, uh, it would be valuable to have more safety data. Like a vaccinated versus unvaccinated study, correct? Uh, if such a study is feasible. Okay. Shouldn't vaccine safety studies be done for the sake of making vaccines safer, not for the purpose and with the predetermined objective of proving so-called anti-vaccinationists wrong? Oh, absolutely. I, they're, they're, okay. I do not deny that there are uh, known reactions to vaccines. Uh, fortunately, they are r rarely serious but uh, I, I support more research on every aspect of vaccines. And your claim that they're rarely serious is from your book, right? Yes. Okay. Um, when's the last time that you received a vaccine, Dr. Plotkin? Um, Zoster, oh no, influenza vaccine. Um, actually, not more than several weeks ago. Do you get the flu shot every year? Yes. You ever missed a year? No. Have you received the Zoster vaccine? It sounds like you have. Yes. The what vaccine? The Zoster. Z-O-S-T-E-R. When did you receive that? I've received now two doses, and I'm looking forward to receiving the new Zoster vaccine as soon as I can buy it. Have you received a PCV13 vaccine? Yes. Have you received a PPSV23 Vaccine? Yes. Happy vaccine? Yes. Let, let me let me do that again. Have you received a happy vaccine? Yes. Yeah. Have you received a hepatitis A vaccine? Yes. Have you received a men A C W Y or M P S V four vaccine? Um I believe so. That was a long time in the past. Uh, because those vaccines have been available for a long time. Um, I'd have to check my records, but um, I, I think particularly when I traveled um, to uh, Africa, uh -huh. I believe I took it. Have you received a Men B vaccine? Uh, not yet, no. Have you received a Hib vaccine? Oh, Hib, well, I was long, long past the age of Hib when it was developed. When's the last time you, you got a tetanus diphtheria containing vaccine? Oh, within the last 10 years. I don't remember exactly when, but... Um, do, you, do you think all adults should be required to receive all vaccines on the CDC's adult immunization schedule? Um, th that's somewhat of a difficult question because uh, adults, of course, uh, have the ability to make their own uh, decisions. Um, uh, tetanus is, you know, is a vaccine that, uh, how shall I put it? Uh, I guess it's, it's a choice whether, whether you're willing to be susceptible to a tetanus or not. Um, uh, for pertussis, I think there's increasing reason uh, that um, uh, to say that, that all adults should be vaccinated against pertussis. So uh, it's, uh, let's say, open to discussion at this point for DTAP anyway. You'd support a law that would require adults to get the DTAP? At this point, uh, 2017, I 
wouldn't insist on that for all adults. I would insist on it for children uh, and adolescents. Um, but the the data, the, the reason I say that is because the, the data showing protection against pertussis in older adults is really not that uh, solid, not that available. Did you ever experience an adverse vaccine reaction? Personally? Yes. No. Have you ever witnessed someone experience an adverse vaccine reaction? I've witnessed people fainting after vaccination. Anything uh, else? Um, uh, certainly I've seen people complain of pain uh, at the injection site. Um, uh, and uh, in the rubella days, um, women complaining of uh, joint pains after vaccination. Um, I think that's it. When you say fainting, after what vaccine was that? Oh, actually, that was um, that was tetanus, as I recall. Um, uh, it was a high school athlete. <laughs> Do you know anyone that's experienced a serious adverse reaction? And, and Personally, no. Yeah. Uh, did your grandchildren receive the hepatitis B vaccine on the first day of life as recommended oh, of by the CDC? I'm sorry, say the question again. Yeah. Mm. I asked if his grandchildren have received the, have your grandchildren received the hepatitis B vaccine on the first day of life as recommended by the CDC? And he answered yes. Um, uh, do you think there's a safe threshold of how many vaccines can be administered at one time? My answer to that is uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't think there's any evidence that the six that are currently um, generally given together uh, is a problem. Uh, so I, I, I don't know if uh, eventually there's some uh, theoretical threshold, but I am not aware of any evidence for that yet. Okay. But before you would say, for example, getting 30 vaccines on one day was safe, you'd probably want to get the data to support it? Yes. Okay. That data doesn't yet exist, obviously, right? No. Okay. Um, do you intend to appear at trial in this matter to testify? No, I do not. Do you intend to appear uh, via video conference to testify in this trial? Well, this I haven't case? been asked. I suppose I might consider a, a video conference, uh, but uh, no one has asked me, and uh, I'm not, I would say, very inclined to, to do that. And you know, uh, while we're on the tape, so to speak, I want to stipulate, since you were so interested in my income, that I'm doing this pro bono. Mm -hmm. But as you sit here today, you're still receiving remuneration from all four major vaccine makers, correct? Yes. Okay. And from... Okay. Um, um, so, we're getting close to the end. Um, okay. Uh, um, I don't have much left. A few more. Um, there was a controversy s s revolving around the origin of AIDS and the OPV vaccine, correct? Yes. Okay. You disputed any connection between OPV vaccine and AIDS in two papers submitted to the Royal Society in which you stated, quote, there was no gun, uh, the chimpanzees, no bullet, the virus, no shooter, a manufacturer of the vaccine chimpanzee cells, and no motive to use chimp cells or to hide the fact. Correct? Yeah, I also said that the only smoke was created by Mr. Hooper. Right. Um, who is that? He's a British journalist, which puts him at the lower end of journalism. Uh, 
I'm going to mark this. I'm Dr. Pollock, and I'm going to hand you what's been marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 44. And um, mm -hmm. I'm also going to hand you what's been marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 45. Um, <clears throat> yep. Okay. Are these the two papers that you submitted to the Royal Society? Um, yes. Disputing, one second, please. Disputing any connection between the OPV vaccine and AIDS. Yes. Right? Okay. Um, is everything that you wrote in these two articles, strike that, is everything written in the two articles, Royal Society articles that you submitted, um, which are marked as exhibits? 40, 44 and 45 true? <laughs> well, I certainly hope so. Is um, that, I'm sorry, Dr. Plotkin, is that, is that yes? Yes, yes, and I should also add that my conclusions have been verified by other scientists uh, who now have shown that HIV originated in the 1920s in Cameroon. Um, at the end of um, which one? Can, which one was forty-four and forty-five? Uh, sorry. Okay. Um, Doctor Doctor Plotkin, at the end of Exhibit Forty-Four, the article entitled "Untruths and Consequences." Mm -hmm. um, um, you state that, strike that, uh, uh, I apologize, I sorry Dr. Plotkin, can you look at exhibit 45, I, I'm sorry. I, 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 the end of Exhibit 45, um, it states that letters cited in this paper will be deposited in the library of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia or the University of Leuven. Leuven, correct? Yes. That's L-E-U-V-E-N. Um, have you deposited those letters and papers? Uh, I have, yes. Okay, when did you deposit all of those letters and papers? Oh gosh, it's probably at least five years ago now. Okay. So all of the letters cited in this document are, have been deposited in uh, The where? College of Physicians of Philadelphia. And they're in possession of all of the letters cited in this document? Well, I believe so. I, you know, I have to go over the list, but um, that certainly was my intention, and I uh, believe I have done so. Okay, um, and um, is that publicly available at the University of Philadelphia? Uh, that's a good question. I imagine so. Um, uh, I deposited them there basically so that they could be examined after I'm dead. <laughs> but um, yeah. uh, I, I don't know. I've never, I've never been asked. Okay. If if they're not publicly available, would you provide copies? Well, I have to ask the College of Physicians to, to do that. Would you authorize them to release copies? I'd authorize them, sure. Okay. Um, if you could please take a look at uh, the... I, I'm not sure why you're asking the question. Are you I'm asking accusing the question, me of, of, of launching AIDS, or, or what, what is the point? Absolutely not, Dr. Plock, and I'm at, you, you made a promise in here to deposit papers, and I'm purely asking you if you made that, fulfill that promise. And yes, I did. That's it. That's all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not accusing you of anything. Um, and in the other paper entitled Untruths and Consequences, mm -hmm. um, in the second paragraph, it says, 
The evidence I present is based on papers and documents of the time for my personal files. Mm -hmm. um, have those also been deposited in the Library of Philadelphia? No, certainly not all of them. I have uh, extensive uh, files. I don't throw anything out. So you still have all of those? Yes. I assume you don't have an issue sharing copies of those? <laughs> no, my wife would love to get rid of all of them, but um, okay. um, I don't. So you, you said that the, the AIDS uh, OPV hypothesis has been, as, I'm sorry, hypothesis has been disproven, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, few quick questions, just uh, uh, approximately how many human samples that predate 1959 have been tested for HIV? That predate 1959? Uh, I don't know that there are uh, any such uh, samples available. The, the first samples that I recall uh, being available were from 1960, um, and they um, they had already uh, some HIV seropositive individuals, but that was in uh, Leopoldville, and they were individuals who had not received the the, the, the oral polio vaccine. Mm -hmm. So, um, but in terms of samples that predate 1959. Have there been any such samples tested for HIV? I oh, have to think about that. I, um, oh, well, there have been samples from elsewhere in the world, but from the Belgian Congo, yeah. I don't think th that any such samples have been available. Um, are you aware of whether there currently exist any samples of polio vaccine that was in the Belgian Congo? Oh. At any time between 1959 and 1960? Uh, whether the Wistar has kept them or not, I don't know. Fortunately, uh, uh, at the time of, of the Royal Society, I was able to go to Wistar and find specimens that had been used in the Congo, uh, or from the lame, same lot that had been used right. in the Congo. But whether that still exists or not, I have no idea. Well, I'm curious, is, just, is there any samples that were actually in the Belgian Congo that have been, that you're aware of? Um, that were tested? That were tested. Um, I don't, I don't, really don't know the answer to that question. Um, the, um, the vaccine that was used, the oral polio vaccine that was used uh, I believe was entirely used up uh, in the vaccination campaign. So I don't think it's likely that material used in the vaccination campaign was re repatriated. But fortunately, we had material from the same lots that were used in mm -hmm. the Congo uh, and that had been retained at the Wistar. But as far as you're aware, in terms of actual samples, a sample that was actually in the Belgian Congo. You're not. Are you saying you're not I, aware of any such sample? I, no, I am not aware of any such sample. Do you wear, Do you know if any such sample ever? Are you aware of any such sample that existed after 1960? I don't. I'm not aware that anything existed. Okay. okay. Um, um, I, I just have. Another question on this. Just curious. Uh, so, are you familiar with an article entitled uh, vac "Vaccination with the Chat Strain of Type One Attenuated Poliomyelitis Virus in Leopoldville, yes. Belgian Congo"? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, in the article. Um, you're one of the authors of the article? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, 
Oh, so <clears throat> on page two of this article, um, um, it states the the titer of the vaccine after a day's use was checked periodically by sending frozen aliqu aliquos. Yes. Thank you, aliquos to the A L I Q U O T S to the Weiss Star Institute, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. USA. Yes. What does that mean? Well, it means that uh, in order to be sure that the vaccine used still contained enough virus, they sent back samples uh, to be titered uh, for the quantity of, of, of uh, virus. So they sent back samples of the oral yes. polio being used yes. in the Belgian Congo. Yes. And they did that um, periodically. Uh, yes. But to your knowledge, none of those survived after 1960? No, I think they were tested and then discarded. Okay. Um. I mean, they, aside from legal value, they would have had no, no value because they were used, they could not ever be used again. So they would have been discarded. It'd be helpful for you if, if some of those were saved, right? It would have been, yes, but at the time, nobody thought about that. If, I mean, if such a sample were to have survived someplace yeah. on the planet, where would you think that would be? Difficult to say. Um, uh, I mean, the laboratory in Stanleyville no longer exists. Um, I have no idea where it, where it could be. Uh, uh, yeah. Do you think such a sample will ever be located? I doubt it. Um, last question on this topic, and we'll move on. Um, did you or any of your Y-Star colleagues ever carry any human cells such as WISH or WI1 or polio vaccines grown in such human cells to the Belgian Congo? No. Well, at least I certainly have not. Okay. Are you aware of any such no, uh, vaccines? I am not aware of being... any. No, I am not aware of, of, um, uh, of those cells being carried to the Congo. If they had been, it would have been for experimental purposes certainly not for vaccination purposes. So you're not aware they're being carried or used there, right? Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay. Um, um, uh, isn't it true that in 2014 the FDA announced, quote, although individuals immunized with an acellular pertussis vaccine may be protected from disease, they may still become infected with the bacteria without always getting sick and are able to spread infection to others, end quote. Yes, that's on the basis of the studies in baboons. Okay, that's the Warfel study? Yes. All right, and we discussed earlier that um, the baboons are the, would probably be the best surrogates for humans, right? Yes. Because you couldn't ethically expose humans to pertussis, correct? Right. So that would, the Warfel studies would be the best evidence what as W-A-R-F-E-L. Would the Warfel studies, the one in 2014 and 2016, which were conducted by the FDA, correct? Yes. Those would be the best evidence as to the ability of to whether or not a cellular pertussis vaccine prevents infection and transmission of pertussis, correct? correct. Yes. Um, and I think we, we talked about this earlier. Um, in your estimation, what percent of adults would you say are actually immune to uh, pertussis? It's a very good question, and I don't know the answer to that because um, immunity to pertussis is complex. And so just measuring serum wouldn't necessarily give you a firm idea as to uh, 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 what percentage of adults are immune. But judging from the frequency of pertussis in, in adults, 
uh, I don't think the immunity level is very high because clearly uh, adults are getting pertussis. Could you estimate what percentage of the adult population in the United States you think is immune to pertussis? Uh, immune? Uh, well, I think probably 50, 60 percent could be immune, but it, it's, it's difficult because immunity wanes. Right. And so they may, people become susceptible again. And as I've said now twice, mm -hmm. uh, there is a lot of pertussis in, in adults that's been shown. So quite a, a significant proportion of adults are susceptible and Fif are not, not immune. 50 to 60 percent is your, is your highest estimation, yes. it sounded like, right? Yes. No more than that. I don't think so. Okay. Um, the diphtheria vaccine creates antibodies only to a toxin released by the diphtheria bacteria, correct? Correct. It doesn't create any antibodies to the actual uh, dip diphtheria bacteria itself. Uh, yes, that's true, but it is also true, uh, it, it, it certainly appears to be true, that if the organism can't produce a toxin, it has a great difficulty in surviving. And so uh, the observation is that where the vaccine is used, uh, the organism disappears. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's very difficult to find it in the U.S., for example, but in Russia, where vaccination has not been always complete, there are still cases of diphtheria. Can you do, how do you define anti-vaccinationists or anti-vaxxers as you've used them here today? How do I define them? Yeah, what does that mean to you? You use those terms and I'm just, I'm actually not exactly sure people, what you mean by that. Uh, people opposed to vaccination uh, for a variety of reasons uh, some of which are based on uh, false inferences from scientific data. If somebody were opposed to vaccines because they believed there was insufficient data um, for them to make a decision about the actual risks, not the benefits, but the risks, would you consider that person an anti-vaxxer? If they refuse to be vaccinated themselves or refuse to have their children vaccinated, I would call them an anti-vaccination person, yes. Is there anybody who could, who could refuse a vaccine who you would not label anti-vaxxer? Yes, if there are individuals who are immunosuppressed, for example, and therefore have a contraindication to certain vaccines, uh, that to me would be a reasonable um, decision on their part. Okay. But otherwise, you believe that anybody else who refuses a vaccine is doing so based on misinformation? Generally speaking, yes. Now, as I said before, I can imagine an adult deciding that they don't want the advantages of vaccination out of, for whatever reason. Uh, I think the situation for children is quite different because one is making a decision for somebody else and also making a decision that has important implications for public health. So in the case of an adult, you think it's okay for the adult to make a decision for themselves to take on a, a risk, even though it could implicate public health, but not yeah. the case for a child? You know, it, it depends. For example, if you're a healthcare worker and you refuse uh, to be vaccinated against diseases that you could potentially transmit to patients, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think you should have the option of making that decision. Um, earlier we discussed um, that uh, there hasn't been a wild case of polio in the United States since 1979, correct? Right. Okay. Uh, the United States currently only uses inactivated polio vaccine, right? Yes. It does not... Sorry, say it again. The United States only... Only uses inactivated polio vaccine, correct? Just... Yes. The United States does not use oral polio vaccine, correct? Correct. Okay. If there were an outbreak of polio in the United States... Yes. Is, isn't it true... Uh, that we would have to, that 
that we would have to return to using oral polio vaccine to stop the spread of polio in the United States? It might well be the case. Um, uh, however, individuals who have received the inactivated vaccines will, will not themselves get polio. They may get infected and transmit to others, which is one of the reasons why one might resort to OPV, but the individual himself would not be susceptible. Is that because the IPV creates IgG antibodies in the blood yes. towards, but it doesn't create IgA immunity in the intestinal tract? Correct. And it is in the intestinal tract where the polio virus yes. multiplies, correct? Yes. So, so a person vaccinated with IPV can still become infected and transmit O polio virus, correct? Uh, yes, although in point of fact, IPV does protect the nasopharynx. So in this country where, where hygiene and sewage, etc., are good, the possibility of transmitting from an IPV vaccine, vaccine is much less than it is, let's say, in, in Africa where um, uh, sewage contamination is, is great. What, when you say nasopharynx, what is that? The throat. So you're saying that IPV does create immunity within the throat? Yes. Okay. There are studies that show that? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And how do those studies make that determination? Well, by culturing people who are exposed to polio who have had IPV, and also by showing that um, antibody diffuses into the, into the throat uh, much better than it does into the gut. Uh, in the Warfell study, I'm sorry, strike that. Um, do you know the names of those studies by any chance? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Again, they're, they're, they're Is, in the book. Are they in your book? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, and in terms of efficacy, does IPV vaccination as a childhood last a lifetime? Um, you know, that's an interesting question, and I think the answer is yes. Um, uh, studies that have been done have shown quite good persistence of antibody after uh, IPV. Now, does it last forever? I can't say that, but it certainly lasts a long time. How about 30 years after vaccination? What do you think the efficacy is, approximately? <laughs> I would just be totally speculating, but I think most people would still be protected because you don't need much antibody against polio to be protected. Uh, levels of, okay. of uh, dilutions of 1 to 4 or 1 to 8 are probably protective. But you're not sure? I'm not sure about 30 years. I'm sure about the levels that are protective. Right, but 30 years, you're not sure about what percent of the people vaccinated are still immune to polio? No, but I do know that that persistence is, is good and that the likelihood is that most people, even 30 years, will still be protected. 40 years? <laughs> I, 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 I can't really guess any more than that. Okay. The data doesn't exist? No. I okay. don't believe they exist. Well, what do you estimate is the current efficacy of the mumps vaccine shortly after vaccination? Oh, shortly after vaccination, there's no doubt that the efficacy is high. It's 80, 90 percent. And after two doses, immediately after two doses, the efficacy is very high. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the efficacy d diminishes uh, with time, and uh, that has uh, caused the problem in uh, universities that mm. have uh, outbreaks of mumps because uh, the college kids are no longer intimately immune. associated. Uh, yes, uh, associated? intimately associated, although the efficacy even then is probably on the order of 70, 80%. 70, 80%. What about, uh, what about 30 years after vaccination, what's the efficacy? Uh, I have no idea. 20 years? Uh, I don't think studies have been done more than 10 years after vaccine. Uh, what do you estimate is the current efficacy of the rubella vaccine 10 years after vaccination? 
Based on the data that are available, it is very high. If, um, the um, so-called B-cell memory after rubella vaccine, I'm happy to say, is very good. How about 20 years? Uh, I think it'll still be present. 30 years? I think so. High efficacy still, you think? I think so. But no studies been done? Um, actually, there are studies at least 20 years studies, I'm not sure about 30, but um, immunity is, is very long lasting. And, okay, and, and the studies would be in your book? Yes. Okay. Uh, what would you estimate is the current efficacy of the measles vaccine 20 years after vaccination? Well, again, it appears to be uh, uh, quite good. Um, 20 years, I'm, again, I'm, I don't have in my head a, a study done 20 years later, but certainly studies done um, some time after vaccination have shown a good persistence of antibodies. And once again, you don't need a, a whole lot of antibody uh, to prevent you from getting measles. Do you know a percentage of... of, of of people that are still immune 20 years out from the measles vaccine? Uh, not off the top of my head, but I, I, I feel relatively sure that it's quite high. Is it important to get a tetanus vaccine? <laughs> well, it's important if you don't want to get tetanus, yes. Okay. Uh, the tetanus vaccine was introduced into routine childhood schedule in the late 1940s. Correct? Yes. Okay. When the tetanus vaccine was introduced, there were only about four cases of tetanus per million people, correct? If you say so. Okay. I don't remember. You familiar with what the CDC pink book? Yes. If the CDC poop book said that it was four cases of tetanus per million, would you dispute okay. that? Okay. Well, I'll, I'll accept that. You do accept that. Um, and that's just the number of cases, not deaths, yes. right? Yes. And you think it's a public health imperative for people to be vaccinated against tetanus, correct? Uh, I think it's the wise thing to do if you don't want to be under risk of getting tetanus if you have an injury. Okay. To prevent something that was a few cases in a million, correct? Yes, but a deadly disease. Do we know whether the tetanus vaccine causes more or less than a few cases of serious adverse reactions after vaccination? Um, I don't believe it causes a whole lot of serious reactions, no. I'm going to show you what's... Do you know how much longer we have to go, just so I have an idea? Yeah, sure. I think that we've only got about 15 more minutes. That's exactly how much we have left. Perfect. Okay. So, we should be, we're almost done. Can I get a sticker? Okay. 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 Um, the CDC and FDA maintain something called the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, correct? Yes. And that's where anybody, including doctors, mm -hmm. can go and report what they believe to be an adverse reaction from a vaccine. Right, right, correct. There's no, anybody can submit a report, right? That's correct. Okay. And um, the FDA and CDC compile that data and make it available online, correct? Yes. Okay, I'm going to hand you a, uh, what's been marked as plaintiff's exhibit 46. Okay. And um, this is a printout of the VAERS data for all uh, adverse reactions reported to tetanus-containing vaccines in the last 10 years. Um, if you take a look, do you see that in the last 10 years there have been 985 deaths reported yes. to have followed a, any tetanus-containing vaccine? Yes. That would average to about 98.5 reports of death per year. Yes. Over the last 10 years. Okay. And there's also um, uh, 
23,981 emergency room or office visits after tetanus containing vaccine in the last 10 years. Yes. And it also lists the last one, uh, 1,256 permanent disabilities reported after tetanus containing vaccine in the last 10 years, correct? Yes. That would be about an average of 125 yes. per year, right? Um, so, uh, but we don't, because these are just reports and not done in some kind of randomized controlled study, we don't actually know whether or not the tetanus vaccine is causing these deaths and permanent disabilities, correct? Correct. Okay. But it's possible it could be, correct? It's anything's possible, uh, yes. Anything's possible. Okay. Um, don't you think a study should be done to determine? Strike that. Strike that. Um, isn't it true that VAERS only receives a tiny fraction of the reportable adverse events after vaccination? Well, I can't give you a percentage, uh, but all physicians are asked to report uh, putative reactions to the VAERS system. So um, I, I don't think the VAERS system uh, covers a tiny portion of uh, alleged reactions. I think rather uh, probably most uh, are reported, but I, uh, I cannot confirm that. Um. <clears throat> Dr. Pollock, and I'm going to show you what's been marked as plaintiff's exhibit. Forty-seven. This is a report entitled Electronic Support for Public Health Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting mm -hmm. System, correct? Say it again. Electronic Support for Public Health Dash Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, correct? Let me know when you're ready, Dr. Plotkin. Well, I'm ready. Okay. Um, the title of this report, Dr. Plotkin, is Electronic Support for Public Health mm -hmm. Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, correct? Yes. Okay. And this was a study conducted by Harvard Medical School and the Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, correct? Yes. Okay. And it was done via a grant from an agency within HHS, correct? Yes. Okay. And the purpose of this study was to attempt to automate VAERS reporting. Yes. Okay. Um, the reason that Harvard did this study and the reason that HHS paid for it, um, if you look at page six, Yes. Do you see where it says fewer than one, per it's right in the middle paragraph, fewer than 1% of vaccine adverse events are reported? Uh, well, yes, I see the statement. I, I don't see the reference, but... Okay. Um, well, let's take a look at yeah. the results of that study then. If you go to the first sentence on the page that you're on right now, yeah. where it says results, mm -hmm. um, isn't it true that it says preliminary data were collected from June 2006 through October 2009 on 715,000 yes. patients? Yes. And 1.4 million doses of 45 different vaccines were given to 376,000 
452 individuals. Yes. So 300 and about 376,000 individuals received a vaccine, correct? Yes. Okay. Out of these doses, 35,570 possible reactions were identified, correct? Yes. So out of 376,000 people that received vaccines, they identified 35,570 possible reactions, right? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> and, and now... Um, well, it's out of 1.4 million, which is 2.6%. Doses, correct? Yes. Okay. Meaning maybe some individuals had... More than one vaccine. And had reactions at different times to different vaccines, right? Yes. Maybe some people were more susceptible to a vaccine reaction, and so they got had a reaction every time they had a vaccine, right? Well, we don't know that. We don't know. I mean, assuming that each individual only had one vaccine reaction, then 10% of the individuals would have had a, a, a vaccine reaction. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. All right. So... Um, Now, at the beginning uh, of this study, the CDC was cooperating with these grant partic correct grant recipients, correct? Yes. Okay, and they helped define what is an adverse reaction, right? Yes. And they helped define the algorithms to use. They, right? Yes. And they also helped to um, define what reports should be excluded, correct? Um, I guess so. Okay. What, what events, I'm sorry, should be excluded uh, from being considered, you know, reportable, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. After, however, they collected this data and they generated these 35,000 reports, they then wanted to submit those reports to theirs and automated so that those reports could continue to be submitted, correct? Yes. But the CDC wouldn't cooperate with them, correct? Well, that, I, I, I have no idea whether that's true or not. Okay. On page five, Dr. Plotkin, at the end of the second paragraph, it says, real does it say real data transmission of non-physician approved reports to the CDC were unable to commence by the end of this pro as by the end of this project the CDC had yet to respond to multiple requests to partner for this activity is that what it says that's what it says okay <clears throat> so and this study says that less than 1% of adverse events are, are reported to VAERS Right. Um, uh, well, I have to check that, but I think that's correct. Okay. Uh, and are you aware that there are other uh, other uh, governmental reports that make similar estimates for VARES? Uh I'm aware that not everything is reported to VARES, Yes. Okay. But are you aware that governmental reports show? That, uh, that governmental reports like this one show that the rate of reporting to VAERS is extremely low. And in this instance, they'd say Harvard said less than 1%. Uh, yes, apparently, yes. Okay. However, uh, it has to be reminded that reporting to VAERS is supposed to occur whether or not you think there's been a reaction. So uh, whether or not the reactions are, are true or not um, is not something that VAERS decides. Right. Where's the, where's the data? The, the VAERS data one. Okay. But let's just assume for a second here. So if, if let's go back to what's been marked as Exhibit 46, okay? Let's let's assume that that a full one percent of 
associated adverse events are reported, wouldn't that take the number of deaths to 98,000 then that, that, <laughs> that were associated with the vaccine? Uh, I think it's likely that deaths are reported more often than, uh, than trivial reactions, so I, I wouldn't be able to extrapolate from that number. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, obviously death is more dramatic. Mm -hmm. Let me show you one, I think one final exhibit. Six minutes left in this. Okay. Um. I'm going to hand you what's been marked. as Plaintiff's Exhibit 48. This is the VAERS report for all adverse events, for all vaccines, just since January of 2016. Do you see that? Uh, yes. Okay. If this... <laughs> My wife is getting upset. Um, um, well, you, uh, don't tell her you offered her up for a deposition. Uh, if, if this represents uh, even 3% or 5% of reported events, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't this concern you in that maybe it really indicates, strike that, it, it reports 400, 751 life-threatening uh, reactions, correct? Yes. Okay. If, and that's only since January of 2016, correct? Yes. Okay. If that's, only, if that's a full 1%, then that would be 70, uh, 75,000 life-threatening reactions that, that would have been reported, correct? And that's the arithmetic, yes. That's the kind of event that would happen pretty soon after vaccination, correct? Uh, well, uh, the events that happen after vaccination, yes. Okay. But not necessarily because of vaccination. So, if, but, in still, yeah. but until a, until uh, a properly controlled saline placebo study is actually done, or strike that, until we compare the total health outcomes, strike that, would you support a study that compared total health outcomes between vaccinated and unvaccinated children, Dr. Plotkin? Will I support such a study? Yes, if, if the protocol was scientifically valid, uh, yes, I would support such a study. Uh, I don't uh, really uh, put much faith in, into the VAERS system for a number of reasons, some of which you cited. I take much more uh, uh, I put much more confidence in the vaccine safety data, um, uh, data which are better controlled and uh, which come from institutions that see large numbers of patients. Mm -hmm. Would you work to support such a study? Again, if such a study were uh, scientifically feasible, I would support it, yes. Would, don't you want to know what the results of that study show? If the study is done, yes, of course. Mm -hmm. okay. 
In terms of the vaccine safety data link, which you just mentioned, that's not available to the public, correct? Well, I think they uh, publicly report in the scientific literature uh, if what independent they researchers want to get access to the VSD. Well, I, I, I don't know what the circumstances are regarding okay. access to data. I well, simply I won't, don't I won't, know. I won't ask you questions about that if you don't know it. Um, okay. Um, I'd, 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 Okay. Well, um, I am. I'm done with my questioning, and um, I will. Uh, if opposing counsel intends to ask any question, then I reserve to ask some uh, rebuttal questions as well. But otherwise, I am done with my questioning for today. You know what? If Dr. Plotkin's going to testify, I'm going to have him here in Michigan, so I'm not too concerned about it. Let's just call it a day. Plotkin, I'll give you a call tomorrow if you're available for a quick phone call. Actually, no. I'll be um, 